Part 1 Chapter 9b of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard Part 1 The Man in the Case Chapter 9b Two Crooks and a Knave Continued It was twelve minutes after nine when he drew up at the curb in front of the side entrance of the hotel. His watch, set by guesswork, had been a little slow and he had corrected it at the club. He was replacing the watch in his pocket as he sauntered around the corner and passed in through the main entrance to the big lobby. Jimmy Dale avoided the elevators. It was only one flight up, and elevator boys on occasions had been known to be observant. At the top of the first landing, a long, wide, heavily carpeted corridor was before him. Number 148, the corner room on the right, the toxin had said. Jimmy Dale walked nonchalantly along, past number 148. At the lower end of the hall, a group of people were gathered around the elevator doors. Halfway down the corridor, a bellboy came out of a room and went ahead of Jimmy Dale. And then Jimmy Dale stopped suddenly and began to retrace his steps. The group had entered the elevator. The bellboy had disappeared around the farther end of the hall into the wing of the hotel. The corridor was empty. In a moment, he was standing before the door of number 148. In another, under the persuasion of a little steel instrument, deftly manipulated by Jimmy Dale's slim, tapering fingers. The lock clicked back, the door opened, and he stepped inside, closing and locking the door again behind him. It was already a quarter past nine, but no one was as yet in the connecting room. The fan light next door had been dark as he passed. His flashlight swept about him, located the connecting door, and went out. He moved to the door, tried it, and found it locked. Again, the little steel instrument came into play, released the lock, and Jimmy Dale opened the door. Again, the flashlight winked. The door opened into a bathroom that, obviously, at will, was either common to the two rooms or cooled by the simple expedient of locking one door or the other, be used by one of the rooms alone. In the present instance, the occupant of the adjoining apartment had taken a room with a bath. Jimmy Dale passed through the bathroom to the opposite door. This was already three quarters open and swung outward into the bedroom near the lower end of the room by the window. Through the crack of the door by the hinges, Jimmy Dale flashed his light, testing the radius of vision, pushed the door a few inches wider open, tested it again with a flashlight, and retreated back into number 148, closing the door on his side until it was just ajar. He stood there, then, silently waiting. It was Hamvert's room next door, and Hamvert and the weasel were already late. A step sounded outside in the corridor. Jimmy Dale strengthened, straightened intently. The step passed on down the hallway and died away. A false alarm, Jimmy Dale smiled, whimsically. 
It was a strange adventure, this, that comforted him. Quite the strangest in a way that the toxin had ever planned. And the night lay before him full of peril in its extraordinary complications. To win the hand, he must block Hamvert and the weasel without allowing them an inkling that his interference was anything more than, say, the lock of a hotel snake thief at most. The weasel was a dangerous man, one of the sleekest second-story walkers in the country, with safe cracking as one of his favorite pursuits, a man most earnestly desired by the police, provided the latter could catch him with the goods. As for Hamvert, he did not know Hamvert, who was a stranger in New York, except that Hamvert had fleeced a man named Michael Breen out of his share in a claim they had had together when Breen had first gone to Alaska to try his luck. And now, having discovered that Breen, when prospecting alone, somewhere in the interior a month or so ago, had found a rich vein and had made a map or diagram of its location. He, Hamvert, had followed the other to New York for the purpose of getting it by hook or crook. Breen's find had been too late. Taken sick, he had never walked his claim, had barely got back home before he died and only in time to hand his wife the strange legacy of a roughly scrawled little piece of paper. And Jimmy Dale strengthened up alertly once more. Steps again, and this time coming from the direction of the elevator. Then voices. Then the opening of the door of the next room. Then a voice distinctly audible. Pull up a chair and we'll get down to business. You are late as it is. We haven't any time to waste if we're going to wash pay debt tonight. Oh, that's all right, responded another voice, quite evidently the whistles. Don't use worry. The game singed to a fade way. There was a sound of chairs being moved across the floor. Jimmy Dale slipped the black silk mask over his face, opened the door on his side of the bathroom cautiously, and without a sound stepped into the bathroom that was lighted now, of course, by the light streaming in through the partially opened door of Hamvert's room. The two were talking earnestly now in lower tones. Jimmy Dale only caught a word here and there. His faculties for the moment were concentrated on traversing the bathroom silently. He reached the further door, crouched there, peered through the crack, and the old whimsical smile flickered across his lips again. The Palais Metropole was high class and exclusive, and the weasel for once looked quite the gentleman, and for all his sharp ferret face, not entirely out of keeping with his surroundings, else he would never have got further than the lobby. The other was a short, thick-set, heavy-jowled man, with a great shock of sandy hair, and small black eyes that looked furtively out from overhanging bushy eyebrows. Well, Hamvert was saying, the details are your concern. What I want is results. We won't waste time. You are to be back here by daylight. Only see that there is no comeback. Leave it to me, returned the weasel, with assurance. How is there going to be any combat? Mittel keeps it in his safe, don't he? Well... Gentlemen's houses has been robbed before, and this job will be a good one. The geography stunt used once gets paged with the rest, that's all. 
it disappears. See? Who's to know yours gets your claws on it? It's just lost in the shuffle. Right, agreed Hamvard briskly, and from his inside pocket produced a package of crisp new bills, yellow backs, and evidently of large denominations. Half down and half on delivery, that's a deal. That's what, assented the whistle curtly. Hamvard began to count the bills. Jimmy Dale's hand stole into his pocket and came out with his handkerchief and the thin metal insignia case. From the latter, with its little pair of tweezers, he took out one of the adhesive gray seals. His eyes were really on the two men. He dropped the seal on his handkerchief, restored the thin metal case to his pocket, and in its stead, the blue-black ugly muzzle of his automatic peeped from between his fingers. Five thousand down, said Hamvat, pushing a pile of notes across the table and tucking the remainder back into his pocket. And the other fives here for you when you get back with the map. Ordinarily, I wouldn't pay a penny in advance. But since you want it that way and the map's no good to you while the rest of the long green is... I... He swallowed his words with a startled gulp, clutched hastily at the money on the table, and began to struggle up from his chair to his feet. With a swift, noiseless sidestep through the open door, Jimmy Dale was standing in the room. Jimmy Dale's tones were conversational. Don't get up, said Jimmy Dale coolly, and take your hand off that money. The weasel, whose back had been to the door, squirmed around in his chair, and in his turn stared into the muzzle of Jimmy Dale's revolver, while his jaw dropped and sagged. Good evening, weasel, observed Jimmy Dale casually. I seem to be in luck tonight. I got into that room next door, but an empty room is slim picking. And then it seemed to me I had someone in here mention five thousand dollars twice, which makes ten thousand, and which happens to be just exactly the sum I need at the present moment. If I can't get any more, I haven't the honor of your wealthy friend's acquaintance, but I am really charmed to meet him. You uh, understand, both of you that the slightest sound might prove extremely embarrassing. Hamvar's face was white, and he stared uneasily in his chair. But into the weasel's face, the first shock of surprise dismay passed, came a dull, angry red, and into the eyes a vicious gleam, and suddenly he laughed shortly. Why, you damned fool, jeered the weasel. Do you think yours can just get away with that? Say, take it from me. Yours are a picker. Say, yours make me tired. What do you think yours are? Do you think this is a theater? And that yours are a cheapskate actor strolling across the stage? I'll beat it. Yours make me sick. Why, say, you pinch that money, and you have got the same chance of getting out of this hotel as a guy has of breaking out a sing sink. By the time you get five feet from the door of this room, we has the whole wax on your neck. Do you think so, Weasel? inquired Jimmy Dale politely. He carried his handkerchief to his mouth to cloak a cough and his tongue touched the adhesive side of the little diamond-shaped gray seal. Hand and handkerchief came back to the table, and Jimmy Dale leaned his weight carelessly upon it, while the automatic in his right hand still covered the two men. Do you think so, weasel? he repeated softly. Well, perhaps you are right. And yet... 
somehow I am inclined to disagree with you. Let me see, Wazel. It was Tuesday night, two nights ago, wasn't it? That a trifling break in Maiden Lane at Orald and Sons disturbed the police. It was a three-year job for even a first offender. Ten for one already on nodding terms with the police. And fifteen to twenty-four. Well, say, for a man like you. Weasel, if he were caught. Am I making myself quite plain? The color in the weasel's cheeks faded a little. His eyes were holding in sudden fascination upon Jimmy Dale. I see that I am, observed Jimmy Dale pleasantly. I said, if he were caught, you will remember. I am going to leave this room in a moment, Weasel, and leave it entirely to your discretion as to whether you will think it wise or not to stare from that chair for ten minutes after I shut the door. And now, Jimmy Dale nonchalantly replaced his handkerchief in his pocket nonchalantly followed it with the banknotes which he picked up from the table and smiled. With a gasp, both men had straightened forward and were staring wild-eyed at the grey seal stuck between them on the tabletop. The grey seal whispered the weasel and his tongue circled his lips. Jimmy Dale shrugged his shoulders that was a bit theatrical whistle, he said apologetically, and yet not wholly unnecessary. You will recall Stangeist, the Mope, Australian Ike, and Clary Dean, and can draw your own inference as to what might happen in the Torald affair, if you should be so ill-advised as to force my hand. Permit me, the slim, deft fingers, like a streak of lightning, were inside Hambert's coat pocket and out again with the remainder of the banknotes. And Jimmy Dale was backing for the door, not the door of the bathroom by which he had entered, but the door of the room itself that opened on the corridor. There he stopped, and his hand swept around behind his back and turned the key in the locked door. He nodded at the two men, whose faces were walking with incongruously mingled expressions of impotent rage, bewilderment, fear and fury, and opened the door a little. Ten minutes, Weasel, he said gently. I trust you will not have to use heroic measures to restrain your friend for that length of time though, if it is necessary, I should advise you for your own sake to resort almost to murder. I wish you good evening, gentlemen. The door opened further. Jimmy Dale, still facing inward, slipped between it and the jamb, whipped the mask from his face, closed the door softly, stepped briskly but without any appearance of haste along the corridor to the stairs, descended the stairs, mingled with a crowd in the lobby for an instant, walked, seemingly a part of it, with a group of ladies and gentlemen down the hall to the side entrance, passed out, and a moment later, after drawing on a linen dust coat which he took from under the seat and exchanging his hat for a tweed cap, the car glided from the curb and was lost in a press of traffic around the corner. Jimmy Dale laughed a little harshly to himself. So far, so good. But the game was not ended yet, for all the crackle of the crisp notes in his pocket. There was still the map, still the robbery at Mitchell's house. The $10,000 theft would not in any way change that and it was a question of time now to forestall any move the whistle might make. Through the city, Jimmy Dale alternately dodged, spotted, and dragged his way, fuming with impatience. But once out on the country roads and headed toward New Rochelle, 
the big machine, speed limits thrown to the winds, roared through the night, a grey streak of road jumping under the powerful lamps. A village, a town, a cluster of lights flashing by him, the steady pour of his sixty horsepower engines, the grey tread of open road again. It was just eleven o'clock when Jimmy Dale, the road to himself for the moment, at a spot a little beyond New Rochelle, extinguished his lights and very carefully ran his car off the road, backing it in behind a small clump of trees. He tossed the linen dust coat back into the car and set off toward where, a little distance away, the slap of waves from the stiff breeze that was blowing indicated the shoreline of the sound. There was no moon, and while it was not particularly dark, objects and surroundings at best were blurred and indistinct. But that, after all, was a matter of little concern to Jimmy Dale. The first house beyond was Mittel's. He reached the water's edge and kept along the shore. There should be a little wharf, she had said. Yes, there it was, and there too was a gleam of light from the house itself. Jimmy Dale began to make an accurate mental note of his surroundings. From the little wharf on which he now stood, a path led straight to the house, bisecting what appeared to be a lawn. Trees to the right, the house to the left. At the wharf beside him, two motorboats were moored, one on each side. Jimmy Dale glanced at them, and suddenly, attracted by the familiar appearance of one, inspected it a little more closely. His momentarily awakened interest passed as he nodded his head. It had caught his attention, that was all. It was the same type and design, quite a popular make, of which there were hundreds around New York, as the one he had bought that year as a tender for his yacht. He moved forward now toward the house, the rear of which faced him. The light that flooded the lawn came from a side window. Jimmy Dale was figuring the time and distance from New York as he crept cautiously along. How quickly could the weasel make the journey? The weasel would undoubtedly come, and if there was a convenient train, it might prove a close race. But in his own favor was the fact that it would probably take the weasel quite some little time to recover his equilibrium from his encounter with the Grey Seal in the Palais Metropole. Also, the further fact that, from the weasel's point of view, there was no desperate need of haste. Jimmy Dale crossed the lawn and edged along in the shadows of the house to where the light streamed out from what now proved to be open French windows. It was a fair presumption that he would have an hour to the good on the weasel. The seal was little more than a couple of feet from the ground, and from a crouched position on his knees below the window, Jimmy Dale raised himself slowly and peered guardedly inside. The room was empty. He listened a moment. The black silk mask was on his face again, and with a quick, agile, silent spring, he was in the room. And then, in the center of the room, Jimmy Dale stood motionless, staring around him, an expression, ironical, sardonic, creeping into his face. The robbery had already been committed. At the lower end of the room, everything was in confusion. The door of a safe swung wide. The drawers of a desk had been wrenched out. Even a liquor stand, 
on which were well-filled decanters, had been broken open, and the contents of safe and desk, the thief's discards, as it were, littered the floor in all directions. For an instant, Jimmy Dale, his eyes narrowed ominously, surveyed the scene. Then, with a sort of professional instinct aroused, he stepped forward to examine the safe, and suddenly darted behind the desk instead. Steps sounded in the hall. The door opened. A voice reached him. The master said I was to shut the windows, and I haven't that to go in, and he'll be back with the police in a minute now. Come on in with me, Minnie. Lord! exclaimed another voice. Ain't it a good thing the missus is away? She'd have high hysterics. Steps came somewhat hesitantly across the floor. From behind the desk, Jimmy Dale could see that it was a maid, accompanied by a big, raw-boned woman. Sleeves rolled to the elbows over brawny arms, presumably the Mittel's cook. The maid closed the French doors. There were no others in the room, and bolted them, and having gained a little confidence, gazed about her. My, but wasn't he cute, she ejaculated, caught the telephone wires he did and ain't he made an awful mess. But the master said we wasn't to touch nothing till the police saw it. And to think of it happening in our house, observed the cook heavily, her hands on her hips, her arms akimbo. It will all be in the papers, and maybe they'll put her pictures in it too. I won't get over it as long as I live, declared the maid. The yell Mr. Mittel gave when he came downstairs and put his head in here, and then him shouting and using the most terrible language into the telephone, and then finding the wires caught, and me following him downstairs, half dead with fright, and he shouts at me. Bella, he shouts, shut those windows, but don't you touch a thing in that room. I'm going for the police and then he rushes out of the house. I was going to bed, said the cook, picking up her cue for what was probably the twentieth rehearsal of the scene, when I heard Mr. Mittel yell, and Lord Bella, there he is now. Jimmy Dale's hands clenched. He too had caught the scuffle of footsteps, those of three or four men at least, on the front porch. There was one way, only one of escape, through the French windows. It was a matter of seconds only before Mittel, with the police at his heels, would be in the room, and Jimmy Dale sprang to his feet. There was a wild scream of terror from the maid, echoed by another from the cook, and still screaming, both women fled for the door. Mr. Mittel, Mr. Mittel! shrieked the maid. She had flung herself out into the hall. He is back again. Jimmy Dale was at the French windows, tearing at the bolts. They stuck. Shouts came from the front entryway. He wrenched viciously at the fastenings. They gave now. The windows flew open. He glanced over his shoulder. A man Mitchell, presumably, since he was the only one not in uniform, was springing into the room. There was a blur of forms and brass buttons behind Mitchell, and Jimmy Dale leaped to the lawn, speeding across it like a deer. But quick as he ran, Jimmy Dale's brain was quicker, pointing the single chance that seemed open to him. The motorboat. It seemed like a God-given piece of luck that he had noticed it, it was like his own. There would be no blind, and that meant fatal blunders in the dark 
over its mechanism, and he could start it up in a moment, just the time to cast her off. That was all he needed. End of Part 1, Chapter 9b Part 1, Chapter 9c of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard Part 1. The Man in the Case Chapter 9c Two Crooks and a Knave Concluded The shouts swelled behind him. Jimmy Dale was running for his life. He flung a glance backward. One form, Mittel, he was certain, was perhaps a hundred yards in the rear. The others were just emerging from the French windows. Grotesque, leaping things they looked, in the light that streamed out behind them from the room. Jimmy Dale's feet pounded the planking of the wharf. He stooped and snatched at the mooring line. Mittel was almost at the wharf. It seemed an age, a year to Jimmy Dale before the line was clear. Shouts rang still louder across the lawn. The police, racing in a pack, were more than halfway from the house. He flung the line into the boat, sprang in after it, and Mittel, looming over him, grasped at the boat's gunwale. Both men were panting from their exertions. Let go, snarled Jimmy Dale between clenched teeth. Mittel's answer was a hoarse, gasping shout to the police to hurry, and then Mittel reeled back, measuring his length upon the wharf from a blow with a boat hook full across the face. Driven with a sudden, untamed savagery that seemed for the moment to have mastered Jimmy Dale. There was no time, not a second, not the fraction of a second. Desperately, frantically, he shoved the boat clear of the wharf. Once, twice, three times, he turned the engine over without success, and then the boat leaped forward. Jimmy Dale snatched the mask from his face and jumped for the steering wheel. The police were rushing out along the wharf. He could just faintly discern Mittel now. The man was staggering about, his hands clapped to his face. A peremptory order to halt, coupled with a threat to fire, rang out sharply, and Jimmy Dale flung himself flat in the bottom of the boat. The wharf edge seemed to open in little crackling jets of flame. Came the roar of reports like a miniature battery in action. Then the flop, flop, flop as the lead tore up the water around him. The dollar thawed as a bullet buried its nose in the boat's side and the curious rip and squeak as a splinter flew. Then Mitchell's voice, high-pitched, as though in pain, can't any of you run a motorboat? He's got me bad, I'm afraid. That other one there is twice as fast. Sure, another voice responded promptly. And if that's right, he's run his head into a trap. Cast loose there, McVeigh, and pile in all of you. You go back to the house, Mr. Mittel, and fix yourself up. We'll get him. Jimmy Dale's lips thinned. It was true. If the other boat had any speed at all, it was only a question of time before he would be overtaken. The only point at issue was how much time. It was dark, that was in his favor. But it was not so dark, but that a boat could be distinguished on the water for quite a distance. For a longer distance than he could hope to put between them. There was no chance of eluding the police that way. 
the keen, facile brain that had saved the Grey Seal a hundred times before was weaving, planning, discarding, eliminating, skimming a way out with death, ruin, disaster, the prize of failure. His eyes swept the dim, irregular outline of the shore. To his right, in the opposite direction from where he had left his car, and perhaps a mile ahead, as well as he could judge, the land seemed to run out into a point. Jimmy Dale headed for it instantly. If he could reach it with a little lead to the good, there was a chance. It would take, say, six minutes, granting the boat a speed of ten miles an hour, and she could do that. The others could hardly overtake him in that time. They hadn't got started yet. He could hear them still shouting and talking at the wharf, and Mittels, twice as fast, was undoubtedly an exaggeration anyhow. A minute more passed, another, and then, as time, Jimmy Dale caught the racket from the exhaust of a high-powered engine, and a white streak seemed to shoot out upon the surface of the water. From where, obscured now, he placed the wharf. A quarter-mile lead, roughly four hundred yards. Yes, he had as much as that, but that, too, was very little. He bent over his engine, coaxing it, nursing it to its highest efficiency. His eyes strained now upon the point ahead, now upon his pursuers behind. He was running with the wind, thank heaven, or the small boat would have had a further handicap. It was rolling up quite a sea. The steering gear, he found, was corded along the side of the boat, permitting its manipulation from almost any position. And, abruptly now, Jimmy Dale left the engine to remerge through the little locker in the stern of the boat. But as he remerged, his eyes held speculatively on the boat astern. She was gaining unquestionably, steadily, but not as fast as he had feared. He would still have a hundred yards lead, at least, abreast the point. And he was smiling grimly now. A hundred yards there meant life to the grey seal. The locker was full of a heterogeneous collection of odds and ends. A suit of oil skills, tools, tins and cans of various sizes and descriptions. Jimmy Dale emptied the contents, some sort of powder, of a small round tin box overboard, and from his pocket took out the banknotes, crammed them into the box, crammed his watch in on top of them, and screwed the cover on tightly. His fingers were flying now, a long strip torn from the trousers leg of the oilskins was wrapped again and again around the box, and the box was stuffed into his pocket. The flash of a revolver shot caught the blackness behind him, then another and another. They were firing in a continuous stream again. It was fairly long range, but there was always the chance of a stray bullet finding its mark. Jimmy Dale, crouching low, made his way to the bow of the boat again. The point was looming almost abreast now. He edged in nearer, to hug it as closely as he dared risk the depth of the water. Behind, remorselessly, the other boat was steadily closing the gap, and the shots were not all wild. One struck with a curious singing sound, on some piece of metal a foot from his elbow. Closer to the shore, running now parallel with the head of the point, Jimmy Dale again edged in the boat, his jaws clamped, walking in little twitches. And then suddenly, with a swift 
appraising glance behind him. He swerved the boat from her course and headed for the shore, not directly, but diagonally across the little bay that, on the farther side of the point, had now opened out before him. He was close in with the edge of the point, ten yards from it, sweeping past it. The point itself came between the two boats, hiding them from each other. And Jimmy Dale, with a long spring, dove from the boat's side to the water. The momentum from the boat as he sank rubbed him for an instant of all control over himself and he twisted, doubled up, and rolled over and over beneath the water. But the next moment, his head was above the surface again, and he was striking out swiftly for the shore. It was only a few yards, but in a few seconds, the pursuing boat, too, would have rounded the point. His feet touched bottom. It was haste now, nothing else that counted. The drum of the racing engines, the crackling roar of the exhaust from the oncoming boat was in his ears. He flung himself upon the shore and down behind the rock. Around the point, past him, tore the police boat, dark forms standing clustered in the bow, and then a sudden shout. There she is! See her! She's heading into the bay for the shore. Jimmy Dale's lips relaxed. There was no doubt that they had sighted their quarry again. A perfect fusillade of revolver shots directed at the now empty boat was quite sufficient proof of that. With something that was almost a chuckle, Jimmy Dale straightened up from behind the rock and began to run back along the shore. The little motorboat would have grounded long before they overtook her, and thinking naturally enough that he had leaped ashore from her, they would go thrashing through the woods and fields searching for him. It was a longer way back by the shore, a good deal longer. Now over rough rocky stretches where he stumbled in the darkness, now through marshy southern ground where he sank as in a quagmire time, as in the quagmire, time and again over his ankles. It was even longer than he had counted on, and time with the whistle on one hand and the return of the police on the other was a factor to be reckoned with again. As a half hour later, Jimmy Dale stole across the lawn of Mittel's house for the second time that night, and for the second time crouched beneath the open French windows. Masked again, the water still dripping from what were once immaculate evening cloths, but which now sagged limply about him, his collar a pasty string around his neck, the mud and dirt splashed to his knees. Jimmy Dale was a disreputable and incongruous looking object as he crouched there, shivering uncomfortably from his immersion in spite of his exertions. Inside the room, Metal passed the windows, pacing the floor, one side of his face badly cut and bruised from the blow with the boat hook, and as he passed, his back turned for an instant, Jimmy Dale stepped into the room. Metal whirled at the sound, and with a suppressed cry, instinctively drew back. Jimmy Dale's automatic was dangling carelessly in his right hand. I am afraid I am a trifle melodramatic, observed Jimmy Dale, apologetically, surveying his own bedraggled person. But I assure you, it is neither intentional nor for effect. As it is, I was afraid I would be late. Pardon me if I take the liberty of helping myself. One gets a chill in wet clothes so easily. 
he passed to the liquor stand, poured out a generous portion from one of the decanters, and tossed it off. Mittel neither spoke nor moved. Stupefaction, surprise, and a very obvious regard for Jimmy Dale's revolver mingled themselves in a helpless expression on his face. Jimmy Dale set down his glass and pointed to a chair in front of the desk. Sit down, Mr. Mittel, he invited pleasantly. It will be quite apparent to you that I have not time to prolong our interview unnecessarily, in view of the possible return of the police at any moment. But you might as well be comfortable. You will pardon me again if I take another liberty. He crossed the room, turned the key in the lock of the door leading into the hall, and returned to the desk. Sit down, Mr. Mittel, he repeated, a sudden rasp in his voice. Mittel, none too graciously, now seated himself. Look here, my fine fellow, he burst out. You are carrying things with a pretty high hand, aren't you? You seem to have eluded the police for the moment, somehow. But let me tell you, I... No, interrupted Jimmy Dale softly. Let me tell you all there is to be told. He leaned over the desk and stared rudely at the breeze on Mittel's face. Rather a nasty crack that, he remarked. Mittel's fists clenched, and an angry flush swept his cheeks. I'd have made it a good deal harder, said Jimmy Dale, with sudden insolence. If I hadn't been afraid of putting you out of business, and so precluding the possibility of this little meeting. Now and then, the revolver swung upward and held steadily on a line with Mittel's eyes. I'll trouble you for the diagram of that Alaskan claim that belongs to Mrs. Michael Brin. Mittel, staring fascinated into the little round black muzzle of the automatic, edged back in his chair. So, 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 so that's what you're after, is it? He jacked out. Well, he laughed unnaturally and waved his hand at the disarray of the room. It's been stolen already. I know that, said Jimmy Dale grimly. By you. Me? Mito started up in his chair, a whiteness creeping into his face. Me? I... Sit down! Jimmy Dale's voice rang out ominously cold. I haven't any time to spare. You can appreciate that. But even if the police return before that map is in my possession, they will still be too late as far as you are concerned. Do you understand? Furthermore, if I am caught, you are ruined. Let me make it quite plain that I know the details of your little game. You are a cop broker, Mr. Mittel. Ostensibly. In reality, you run what is nothing better than an exceedingly profitable bucket shop. The weasel has been a customer and also is too for you for years. How Hamvert met the weasel is unimportant. He came east with the intention of getting in touch with a slick crook to help him. The weasel is the coincidence. That is all. I quite understand that you have never met Mr. Hamvert, nor Hamvert you, nor that Hamvert was aware that you and the weasel had anything to do with one another and we are playing in together. But that equally is unimportant. When Hamvert when Hamvert engaged the whistle for $10,000 to get the mark from you for him, the whistle chose the line of least resistance. He knew you, 
and approached you with an offer to split the money in return for the map. It was not a question of your accepting his offer. It was simply a matter of how you could do it and still protect yourself. The weasel was quite qualified to point the way. A fake robbery of your house would answer the purpose admirably. You could not be held either legally or morally responsible for a document that was placed <coughs> unsolicited by you in your possession if it was stolen by you, or stolen from you, rather. Mittel's face was ashen, colorless. His hands were opening and shutting, with nervous twitches on the top of the desk. Jimmy Dale's lips curled. But Jimmy Dale was clipping off his words now viciously. Neither you nor the whistle were willing to trust the other implicitly. Perhaps you know each other too well. You were unwilling to turn over the map until you had received your share of the money, and you were equally unwilling to turn it over until you were safe. That is, until you had engineered your fake robbery, even to the point of notifying the police that it had been committed. The whistle, on the other hand, had some scruples about parting with any of the money without getting the map in one hand before he let go of the banknotes with the other. It was very simply arranged, however, and to your mutual satisfaction. While you robbed your own house this evening, he was to get half the money in advance from Hamvert, giving Hamvert to understand that he had planned to commit the robbery himself tonight. He was to come out here then, receive the map from you in exchange for your share of the money, return to Hamvert with the map, and receive in turn his own share. I might say that Hambert actually paid down the advance, and it was perhaps unfortunate for you that you paid such scrupulous attention to details as to cut your own telephone wires. I had not, of course, an exact knowledge of the hour or minute in which you proposed to stage your little play here. The object of my first visit a little while ago was to forestall your turning the diagram over to the whistle. Circumstances favoured you for the moment. I am back again, however, for the same purpose, the map. Mittel, in a cowed way, was huddled back in his chair. He smiled miserably at Jimmy Dale. Quick! Jimmy Dale flung out the word in a sharp peremptory back. Do you need to be told that the cartridges are dry? Mittel's hand, trembling, went into his pocket and produced an envelope. Open it, commanded Jimmy Dale, and lay it on the desk, so that I can read it. I am too wet to touch it. Mittel obeyed, like a dog that has been whipped. A glance at the paper and Jimmy Dale's eyes lifted again to sweep the floor of the room. He pointed to a pile of books and documents in one corner that had been thrown out of the safe. Go over there and pick up that checkbook, he ordered tersely. What for? Mitchell made feeble protest. Never mind what for, snapped Jimmy Dale. Go and get it. And hurry. Once more, Mittel obeyed and dropped the book hesitantly on the desk. Jimmy Dale stared silently, insolently, contemptuously at the other. Mittel stared uneasily, sat down, shifted his feet, and his fingers fumbled aimlessly over the top of the desk. Compared with you, said Jimmy Dale in a low voice, the weasel, eh, and Hamvert too, 
crooks though they are, are gentlemen. Michael Breen, as he died, told his wife to take that paper to someone she could trust, who would help her and tell her what to do. And knowing no one to go to, but because she scrubbed your floors and therefore thought you were a fine gentleman, she came timidly to you and trusted you. You call. Jimmy Dale laughed suddenly, not pleasantly. Mito shivered. Hamvert and Breen were partners out there in Alaska. When Breen first went out, said Jimmy Dale slowly, pulling the tin can wrapped in oilskin from his pocket. Hamvert swindled Breen out of the one strike he made, and Mrs. Breen and her little girl back here were reduced to poverty. The amount of that swindle was, I understand, $15,000. I have ten of it here, contributed by the Weasel and Hamvert, and you will... I think, recognize therein a certain element of poetic justice, but I am still short five thousand dollars. Jimmy Dale removed the cover from the tin can. Mitchell gazed at the contents numbly. You perhaps did not hear me, prompted Jimmy Dale coldly. I am still short five thousand dollars. Mitchell circled his lips with the tip of his tongue. What do you want? he whispered hoarsely. The balance of the amount. There was an ominous quiet in Jimmy Dale's voice. A check payable to Mrs. Michael Breen for five thousand dollars. I haven't got that much in the bank, Mitchell fenced, stammering. No? Then I should advise you to see that you have by ten o'clock tomorrow morning, returned Jimmy Dale curtly. Make out that check. Mito hesitated. The revolver edged insistently, a little further across the desk. And Mito, picking up a pen, wrote feverishly. He tore the check from its top, and with a snarl, pushed it toward Jimmy Dale. Fold it, instructed Jimmy Dale in the same cut tones, and fold that diagram with it. Put them both in this box. Thank you. He wrapped the oilskin around the box again and returned the box to his pocket. And again, with that insolent, contemptuous stare, he surveyed the man at the desk then he backed to the French windows. It might be as well to remind you, Mitchell, he cautioned sternly, that if for any reason this check is not honored, whether through lack of funds or an attempt by you to stop payment, you will be in a cell in the tombs tomorrow for this night's work. That is quite understood, isn't it? Mitchell was on his feet. Sweat glistened on his forehead. My God, he cried out shrilly, who are you? And Jimmy Dale smiled and stepped out on the lawn. Ask the weasel, said Jimmy Dale, and the next instant, lost in the shadows of the house, he was running for his car. End of Part 1, Chapter 9C Part 1, Chapter 10a of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard. Part 1, The Man in the Case. Chapter 10a, The Alibi. Vets to the grey sail, through the underworld, in thence and dives that sheltered from the law, the vultures that preyed upon society, prompted by self-fear, by secret dread, 
by reason of their very inability to carry out their purpose, the whispered sentence grew daily more venomous, more insistent. The grey seal, dead or alive, but the grey seal. It was the standing orders of the police, railed at by a populace who angrily demanded at its hands this criminal of criminals, mocked at and threatened by a virulent press, stung to madness by the knowledge of its own impotence, flaunted impudently to its face by this mysterious grey seal, to whose door the law laid a hundred crimes, for whom the bars of a death cell in Sing Sing was a certain goal, could he but be caught. The police, to a man, was like an uncaged beast that, flicked to the raw by some unseen assailant, and murderous in its fury, was crouched to strike. Grim paradox, a common bond that linked the hands of the law with those that outraged it. Death to the grey seal. Was it at last the beginning of the end? Jimmy Dale, as Larry the Bat, unkempt, disreputable in appearance, supposed dope fiend, a figure familiar to every denizen below the dead line skulked along the narrow, ill-lighted street of the east side that, on the corner ahead, boasted the notorious resort to which Bristol Bob had paid the doubtful, if appropriate, compliment of giving his name. From under the rim of his battered hat, Jimmy Dale's eyes, veiled by half-closed, well-simulated, drug-laden lids, missed no detail either of his surroundings or pertaining to the passers-by. Though already late in the evening, half-naked children played in the gutters. Hawkers of multitudinous commodities cried their wares under gasoline banjo touches affixed to their pushcarts. Shawled women of half a dozen races and men equally cosmopolitan loitered at the curb or blocked the pavement, or brushed by him. Now a man passed him, flinging a greeting from the corner of his mouth. Now another, always without movement of the lips, and Jimmy Dale answered them from the corner of his mouth. But while his eyes were alert, his mind was only subconsciously attuned to his surroundings. Was it indeed the beginning of the end? Some day, he had told himself often enough, the end must come. Was it coming now? Surely, with a sort of grim implacability, when it was too late to escape. Slowly but inexorably, even his personal freedom of action was narrowing, being limited and ironically enough, through the very conditions he had himself created as an avenue of escape. It was not only the police now. It was, far more to be feared, the underworld as well. In the old days, the role of Larry the Bat had been assumed at intervals, at his own discretion. When, in a corner, he had no other way of escape. Now it was forced upon him almost daily. The character of Larry the Bat could no longer be discarded at will. He had flung down the gauntlet to the underworld, when, as the Grey Seal, he had closed the prison doors behind Stangeist. The Mope, Australian Ike, and Claridine and the underworld had picked the gauntlet up. Betrayed, as they believed, by the one who, though unknown to them, they had counted the greatest among themselves, and each one fearful that his own betrayer might come next, every crook, every thug in the badlands, now eyed his oldest power with suspicion and distrust and each was a self-constituted slut, 
with the prod of self-preservation behind him, sworn to the accomplishment of that unhallowed slogan, death to the grey seal. Almost daily now, he must show himself as Larry the Bat in some gathering of the underworld. A prolonged absence from his haunts was not merely to invite certain suspicion. We are all we are suspicious of each other. It was to invite certain disaster. He had now either to carry the role like a little old man of the sea upon his back, or renounce it forever, and the latter course he dared not even consider. The sanctuary was still the sanctuary, and the role of Larry the Bat was still a refuge, the trump card in the lone hand he played. He reached the corner, pushed open the door of Bristol Bob's, and shuffled in. The place was a glare of light, a hideous riot of noise. On a polished section of the floor in the center, a turkey trot was in full swing. Laughter and shouting vied raucously with an impossible orchestra. Jimmy Dale slowly made the circuit of the room, past the tables that ranged around the sides, were packed with occupants who thumped their glasses in tempo with the music, and clamored at the Russian waiters for replenishment. A dozen, two dozen, men and women greeted him. Jimmy Dale indifferently returned their salutes. What a galaxy of crooks, the cream of the underworld. His eyes, under half-closed lids, swept the faces. Lags, dips, gatmen, yeggs, mobstormers, murderers, petty sneak thieves, stalls, hangers-on, they were all there. He knew them all, he was known to all. He shuffled on to the far end of the room, his leer a little arrogant, a certain arrogance, too, in the tilt of his battered heart. He also was quite a celebrity in that gathering. Larry the Bat was of the aristocracy and the elite of gangland. Well, the show was over. He had stalked across the stage, performed for his audience and in another hour now, free until he must repeat the same performance the next day in some other equally notorious dive, he would be sitting in for a rubber of bridge at that most exclusive of all clubs, the St. James, where none might enter, save only those whose names we have vouched for in the highest and most select circles, and where for partners, he would possibly have a justice of the Supreme Court, or mayhap, an eminent divine. He looked suddenly around him, as though startled. It always startled him, that comparison. There was something too stupendous to be simply ironical in the incongruity of it. If he were ever run to earth, his eyes met those of a heavy-built, coarse-featured man, the chewed end of a cigar in his mouth, who stepped from behind the bar, carrying a tin tray with two full glasses upon it. It was Bristol Bob, ex-pugilist, the proprietor. How are you, Larry? grunted the man, with what he meant to be a smile. Jimmy Dale was standing in the doorway of a passage that prefaced a rear exit to the lane. He moved aside to allow the other to pass. Hello, Bristol, he returned dispassionately. Bristol Bob went on along down the passage, and Jimmy Dale shuffled slowly after him. He had intended to leave the place by the rear door. It obviated the possibility 
of an undesirable acquaintance joining company with him if he went out by the main entrance. But now his eyes were fixed on the proprietor's back with a sort of speculative curiosity. There was a private room off the passage with a window on the lane, but they must be favored customers indeed that Bristol Bob would condescend to serve personally. Anyone who knew Bristol Bob knew that. Jimmy Dale slowed his shuffling gait, then quickened it again. Bristol Bob opened the door and passed into the private room. The door was just closing as Jimmy Dale shuffled by. He had had only a glance inside, but it was enough. They were favored customers indeed. It was no wonder that Bristol Bob himself was on the job. Two men were in the room. Lanigan of headquarters, rated the smartest plain clothes man in the country, and across the table from Lanigan, Whitey Mac, as clever, finished and daring a crook as was to be found in the Badlands, whose particular line was diamonds, or in the vernacular of his ilk, white stones, that had earned him the sobriquet of Whitey. Lanigan of headquarters, Whitey Mac of the underworld, sworn enemies those two, in secret session. Bristol Bob might well play the part of outer guard, if a choice few of those outside in the dance hall could get a glimpse into their private room, it would be good night to White Mac. Jimmy Dale's eyes were narrowed a little as he shuffled on down the passage. Lanigan and Whitey Mac with their heads together. What was the game? There was nothing in common between the two men. Lanigan, it was well known, could not be reached. Whitey Mac, with his ingenious cleverness, coupled with a cold-blooded fearlessness that had made him an object of unholy awe and respect in the eyes of the underworld, was a thorn that was sore beyond measure in the side of the police. Certainly, it was no ordinary thing that had brought these two together, especially since with the unrest and suspicion that was bubbling and sitting below the deadline, and with which there was none more intimate than Whitey Mac. Whitey Mac was inviting a risk in making up with the police that could only be accounted for by some urgent and vital incentive. Jimmy Dale pushed open the door that gave on the lane. Behind him, Bristol Bob closed the door of the private room and retreated back along the passage. Jimmy Dale stepped out into the lane and instinctively his eyes sought the window of the private room. The shade was drawn. Only a yellow muck filtered out into the black, unlighted lane. But suddenly, he started noiselessly toward it. The window was open a bare inch or so at the bottom. The seal was just shoulder high, and placing his ear to the opening, he flattened himself against the wall. He could not see inside, for the shade was drawn well to the bottom but he could hear as distinctly as though he were at the table beside the two men. And at the first words, the loose, disjointed frame of Larry the Bat seemed to totten curiously and strain forward, light and tense. This grey sealed dope listens good, whitey. What's coming from you, I'm Larry. You've got to show me. Don't you want him? 
there was a nasty laugh from Whitey Mac. You bet I want him, returned the headquarters man, with a suppressed savagery that left no doubt as to his earnestness. I want him fast enough, but then blast him, so do I. Whitey Mac rapped out with a vicious snarl. So does every guy in the fleet down here. We got it in for him. You get that, don't you? His got engaged and his gang steered for the electric chair now. He put a crimp in the weasel the other night. Get that? He's like a blasted wizard with what he knows. And who will he deal the icy meat to next? Me? Damn him. Me, for all I know. That's all right, observed Lanigan coolly. I'm not questioning your sincerity for a minute. I know all about that. But that doesn't land the gray seal. I'll work with you if you've anything to offer. But we've had enough tips and information handed us at headquarters in the last few years to make us a trifle skeptical. Show me what you've got, Whitey. Show you, echoed Whitey Mark passionately. Sure, I'll show you. That's what I'm going to do. Show you. I'll show you the gray seal. I ain't handing you any tips. I've found out who the gray seal is. There was a tense silence. It seemed to Jimmy Dale as though cold fingers were clutching at his heart, stifling its beat. Then the blood came bursting to his forehead. He could not see into the room, but that silence was eloquent. It seemed as though he could picture the two men, Lanningham leaning suddenly forward, Lanningham and Whitey Mac staring tensely into each other's eyes. You what? It came low and grim from Lanningham. That's what, asserted Whitey Mac bluntly. You heard me. That's what I said. I know who the Grey Seal is, and I'm the only guy that's wise to him. Am I letting you in, right? You are sure? demanded Lanigan hoarsely. You are sure? Who is he then? There was a half laugh and half snarl from Whitey Mac. Oh no, you don't, he growled. Nix on that. What do you take me for? A fool? You beat it out of here and round him up, eh? While I suck my thumbs? Forget it. Do you think I'm doing this because I love you? Why, blame you. You've been aching for a year to put the bracelets on me yourself. Wake up. I'm in on this myself. Again, that silence. Then Lanigan spoke slowly, in a puzzled way. I don't get you, Whitey, he said. What do you mean? Then a little sharply. You're quite right. You've got some reputation yourself, and you're badly wanted. If we could get the goods on you. If you're trying to plan something, look out for yourself, or... Can that, snapped Whitey Mac threateningly. Can that sort of spear right now, or quit? I ain't telling you his name, yet. But I'll take you to him tonight. And you and me naps him together. Is that straight enough goods for you? Don't get sore, said Lanigan, more pacifically. Yes, if you do that, it's good enough for any man. But lay your cards on the table, face up, whitey. I want to see what you opened the pot on.
You've seen him, Whitey Mac answered ungraciously. I've told you already. The gray seal goes out for keeps. Curse him for a snitch. If I bumped him off or wised up any of the guys to eat and we was caught, we'd get the juice for it, even if it was the gray seal, wouldn't we? Well, what's the use? If one of you dicks gets him, he gets bumped off just the same. Only regular, up in the wire parlor at Sing Sing. I ain't looking for that kind of trouble when I can duck it. See? Sure, said Lanigan. Besides, and moreover, continued Whitey Mac, there's some reward hung out for him that I'm figuring to burn in on. I'd swipe it all myself, and you'd never get a look in. Only saw as the mob is on the gray seal. It ain't healthy for any guy around this parts to get the reputation of being a snitch, no matter who he snitches on. Bump him off, sure. Snitching. Well, you get the idea, eh? I'm ducking that too. Get me? I get you, said Lanigan, with a short, pleased laugh. Well then, announced Whitey Mac. Here's my proposition. And it's my turn to hand out the lookout for yourself dope. I'm busting the game wide open for you to play. But you throw me down, and... His voice sank into a sullen snarl again. You can take it from me. I'll get you for it. All right, responded Lanigan soberly. Let's hear it. If I agree to it, I'll stick to it. I believe you, said Whitey Mac curtly. That's why I picked you out for the medal they'll pin on you for this. And here's getting down to tax. I'll lead you to the Grey Seal tonight and help you nab him and stay with you to the finish. But there's to be nobody but you and me on the job. When it's done, I fade away, and nobody's to know I snitched, and no questions asked as to how I found out about the Grey Seal. I ain't looking for any of the glory. You can fix that up to suit yourself. The cash is different. You come across with half the reward the day they pay it. You'll get it. There was savage elation in Lanigan's voice. The emphatic smash of a fist on the table. You're on whitey. And if we get the gray seal tonight, I'll do better by you than that. We'll get him said Whitey Mac with a vicious oath. And Jimmy Dale crouched suddenly low down, close against the wall. The crunch of a footstep sounded from the end of the lane. Someone had turned in from the cross street some fifty yards away and was heading evidently for the back entrance to Bristol Bob's. Jimmy Dale edged noiselessly cautiously back past the doorway, kept on, pressed close against the wall, and finally paused. He had not been seen. The back door of Bristol Bob's opened and closed. The man had gone in. For a moment, Jimmy Dale stood hesitant. There was a wild surging in his brain. Something like a myriad batteries of trip hammers seemed to be pounding at his temples. Then, almost blindly, he kept on down the lane in the same direction in which he had started to retreat, as well one cross street as another. He turned into the cross street, went along it, and presently emerged into the full tide of the Bowery. It was garishly lighted. People swarmed about him. Subconsciously, 
there were crowded sidewalks. Subconsciously, he was on the Bowery. That was all. Ruin, disaster, peril faced him. Faced him and staggered him with the suddenness of the shock. Was it true? No, it could not be true. It was a bluff. Whitey Mac was bluffing. Jimmy Dale's lips grew thin in a matless smile as he shook his head. Neither Whitey Mac nor any other man would dare to bluff like that. It was too straight, too open-handed. Whitey Mac had laid his cards too plainly on the table. Whitey Mac's words rang in his ears. I'll lead you to the Grey Seal tonight and help you nab him and stay with you to the finish. The man meant what he said. Meant what he said, too, about the finish of the Grey Seal. Not a man in the Badlands, but meant death to the Grey Seal. But how? By what means? When, where had Mighty Mac got his information? I'm the only one that's wise, Whitey Mac had said. It seemed impossible. It was impossible. Whitey Mac was sincere enough probably in what he had said. But the man simply could not know. Whitey Mac could only have spotted someone that, for some reason or other, he imagined was the Grey Seal. That was it. Must be it. Whitey Mac had made a mistake. What clue could he have obtained? End of Part 1 Chapter 10a Part 1 Chapter 10b of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard Part 1 The Man in the Case Chapter 10b The Alibi Continued Over the unwashed face of Larry the Bat, a grey pallor spread slowly. His fingers were plucking at the frayed edge of his inside vest pocket. The dark eyes seemed to turn coal black. A laugh, like the laugh of one damned, rose to his lips and was choked back. It was gone. Gone! That thin metal case, like a cigarette case, that between the little sheets of oil paper held those diamond-shaped, grey-coloured adhesive seals. The insignia of the grey seal was gone. Clue. It seemed as though there were an overpowering nausea upon him. Clue. That little case was not a clue. It was a death warrant. His hands clenched fiercely. If he could only think for a moment, the lining of his pocket had given away. The case had dropped out. But there was nothing about the case to identify anyone as the Grey Seal, unless it were found in one's actual possession. Therefore, Whitey Mac, to have solved his identity, must have seen him drop the case. There could be no question about that. It was equally obvious, then, that Whitey Mac would know the Grey Seal as Larry the Bat. Did he also know him as Jimmy Dale? Yes or no? It was a vital question. His life hung on it. That keen, facile brain 
numbed for the moment, was beginning to walk with lightning speed. It was four o'clock that afternoon when he had assumed the character of Larry the Bat. Sometime between four o'clock and the present, it was now well after eleven, the case had dropped from his pocket. There had been ample time then for Whitey Mark to have made that appointment with Lanigan, and ample time to have made a surreptitious visit to the sanctuary. Had Whitey Mark gone there? Had Whitey Mark found that hiding place in the flooring under the oilcloth? Had Whitey Mark discovered that the Gray Seal was not only Larry the Bat, but Jimmy Dale? Jimmy Dale swept his hand across his forehead. It was damp from little clinging bits of moisture. Should he go to the sanctuary and change? become Jimmy Dale again? Was it the safest thing to do, or the most dangerous? Even if Whitey Mac had been there and discovered the dual personality of Larry the Bat, how would he, Jimmy Dale, know it? The man would have been crafty enough to have left no sign behind him. Was it to the sanctuary that Whitey Mac meant to lead Lanigan that evening? Or did Whitey Mac know him as Jimmy Dale, and to make it the more sensational, plan to carry out the coup, say, at the St. James Club? Whitey Mac and Lanigan were still at Bristol Bob's. He had probably time, if he so elected, to reach the sanctuary, change, and get away again. But every minute was priceless now. What should he do? Run from the city as he was for cover? Or take the gambler's chance? Whitey Mac knew him as Larry the Bat. It was not certain that Whitey Mac knew him as Jimmy Dale. He had halted, absorbed in front of a moving picture theater. Great placards at first, but a blur of color suddenly forced themselves in concrete form upon his consciousness. Letters a foot high leaped out at him. The double life. There was a picture of a banker in his private office, hastily secreting a forged paper as the hero in the guise of a clerk entered. The companion picture was the banker in convict stripes, staring out from behind the barred doors of his cell. There seemed a ghastly augury in the coincidence. Why should a thing like that be thrust upon him to shake his nerve, when he needed nerve now more than he had ever needed it in his life before? He raised his hand to jack aimlessly at the brim of his heart, dropped his hand abruptly to his side again, and started quickly, hurriedly, away through the throng around him. A sort of savagery had swept upon him. In a flash, he had made his decision. He would take the gambler's chance, and afterward, Jimmy Dale's lips were like a thin straight line. It was Whitey Mark's life or his own. Whitey Mac had said he was the only one that was wise, and Whitey Mac had not told Lanigan yet. Wouldn't tell Lanigan until the showdown. If he, Jimmy Dale, got to the sanctuary, became Jimmy Dale, and got away again, even if Whitey Mac knew him as Jimmy Dale, there was still a chance. It was his life or Whitey Mac's. Whitey Mac with his lean-jawed, clean-shaven wolf's face. If he could get Whitey Mac before the other was ready to tell Lanigan, surely he had the right of self-preservation. Surely his life was as valuable as Whitey Mac's, as valuable as a man's who, 
as those in the secrets of the underworld knew well enough, had blood upon his hands, who lived by crime, who was a menace to this community, had he not the right to preserve his own life at the expense of one such as that? He had never taken life. The thought was abhorrent. But was there any other way in event of Whitey Mac knowing him as Jimmy Dale? His back was against the wall. He was trapped. Certain death, and worse, dishonor stared him in the face. Lanigan and Whitey Mac would be together. The odds would be two to one against him, and he had no quarrel with Lanigan. Somehow, he must let Lanigan out of it. The other side of the street was less crowded. He crossed over, and still with the shuffling tread that dozens around him knew as the characteristic gait of Larry the Bat, but covering the ground with amazing celerity, he hurried along. It was only at the end of the block, that cross street from the Bowery that led to the sanctuary. How much time had he? He turned the corner into the darker cross street. Whitey Mac would have learned from Bristol Bob that Larry the Bat had just been there. That is, that Larry the Bat was not at the sanctuary. Whitey Mac would probably be in no hurry. He and Lanigan might wait until later, until Whitey Mac should be satisfied that Larry the Bat had gone home. It was the line of least resistance. They would not attempt to scour the city for him. They might even wait in that private room at Bristol Bob's until they decided that it was time to sally out. He might perhaps still find them there when he got back. At any rate, from there he must pick up their trail again. On the other hand, all this was but supposition. They might make at once for the sanctuary, to lie in wait for him. In any case, there was need, desperate need for haste. He glanced sharply around him, and by the side of the tenement house, now that bordered onto the alleyway, with a curious, swift gliding motion, he seemed to blend into the shadow and darkness. It was the sanctuary, that room on the first floor of the tenement, the tenement that had three entrances, three exits, a passageway through to the saloon on the next street that abutted on the rear, the usual front door and the side door in the alleyway. Gone was the shuffling gate. Quick, alert, he ran crouching, bent down along the alleyway, reached the side door, opened it stealthily, closed it behind him with equal caution, and in the dark entry stood motionless, listening intently. There was no sound. He began to mount the rickety, dilapidated stairs and where it seemed that the lightest tread must make them creak out in blatant protest, he strained muscles, delicately compensating his body weight, carried him upward with a silence that was almost uncanny. There was need of silence, as there was need of haste. He was not so sure now of the time at his disposal, that he had even reached the sanctuary first. How long had he loitered in that half-dazed way on the Bowery? He did not know. Perhaps longer than he had imagined. There was the possibility that Whitey Mac and Lanningan were already above, waiting for him. But even if they were not already there, and he got away before they came, it was imperative that no one should know that Larry the Bat 
had come and gone. He reached the landing and paused again. His right hand, with a vicious muzzle of his automatic peeping down from between his fingers, thrown a little forward. It was black, utterly black around him. Again, that stealthy, cat-like tread, and his ear was at the keyhole of the sanctuary door. A full minute, priceless though it was, passed. Then, satisfied that the room was empty, he drew his head back from the keyhole, and those slim tapering fingers, that in their tips seemed to embody all the human senses, felt over the lock. Apparently, it had been undisturbed, but that was no proof that Whitey Mark had not been there after finding the metal case. Whitey Mark was known to be clever with a lock, clever enough for that, anyhow. He slipped in the key, turned it, and on hinges that were always oiled, silently pushed the door open and stepped across the threshold. He closed the door until it was just ajar, that any sound might reach him from without, and whipping off his coat, began to undress swiftly. There was no light. He dared not use the gas. It might be seen from the alleyway. He was moving now quickly, surely, silently, here and there. It was like some weird spectre figure, a little blacker than the surrounding darkness, flitting about the room. The oil cloth in the corner was turned back, the loose flooring lifted, the clothes of Jimmy Dale taken out, the rags of Larry the Bat put in. The minutes flew by. It was not the change of clothing that took long. It was the eradication of Larry the Bat's makeup from his face, throat, neck, wrists, and hands. Occasionally, his head was turned in a tense, listening attitude. But always, the fingers were busy, working with swift deftness. It was done at last. Larry the Bat had vanished, and in his place stood Jimmy Dale, the young millionaire, the social lion of New York, immaculate in well-tailored tweets. He stooped to the hole in the flooring, and his fingers, going unerringly to the hiding place, took out a black silk mask and an electric flashlight. His automatic was already in his possession. His lips parted grimly. Who knew what part a flashlight might not play? And he would need the mask for Lanningan's benefit, even if it did not disguise him from Whitey Mark. Had he left any telltale evidence of his visit? It was almost worth the risk of a light to make sure. He hesitated, then shook his head, and stooping again, carefully replaced the flooring and laid the oilcloth over it. He dared not show a light at any cost. But now, even more caution than before was necessary. At times, the lodgers had naturally enough seen their fellow lodger, Larry the Bat, enter and leave the tenement. None had ever seen Jimmy Dale either leave or enter. He stole across the room to the door, halted to assure himself that the hall was empty, slipped out into the hall and locked the door behind him. Again, that trained, long-practiced, silent tread upon the stairs. 
it seemed as though an hour passed before he reached the bottom and his brain was shrieking at him to hurry 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 the entryway at last the door the alleyway a long breath of relief and he was on the cross street a step two he took in the direction of the bowery and he was bending down as though to tie his shoe his automatic from his side pocket concealed in his hand was that someone there he could have sworn he saw a shadow like form start out from behind the steps of the house on the opposite side of the street as he had emerged from the alleyway in his bent posture without seemingly turning his head his eyes swept sharply up and down the other side of the ill-lighted street nothing there was not even a pedestrian in sight on the block from there to the bowery jimmy dale straightened up nonchalantly and stooped almost instantly again as though the lace were still proving refractory again that sharp searching glance again nothing he went forward now in apparent unconcern but his right hand instead of being buried in his coat pocket swung easily at his side it was strange his ineffective views to the contrary he was certain that he had not been mistaken was it whitey mark was the question answered was the gray seal known to as jimmy dale were they trailing him now with the climax to come at the club at his own palatial home wherever the surroundings would best lend themselves to assuaging that inordinate thirst for the sensational that was so essentially a characteristic of the confirmed criminal what a headline in the morning's papers it would make at the corner he loitered by the curb to light a cigarette still not a soul in sight on either side of the street behind him except a couple of italians who had just passed by strange again the intuition if it were only intuition was still strong he swung abruptly on his heel mingled with the passers-by on the bowery walked a rapid half dozen steps until the building hit the cross street then ran across the road to the opposite side of the bowery and in a crowd now came back to the corner he crossed from curb to curb slowly sheltered by a fringe of people that however in no way obstructed his view down the side street and then jimmy dale shrugged his shoulders he had evidently been mistaken after all he was overexcited his nerves were raw that perhaps was the solution meanwhile every minute was counting if whitey mark and lanningham should still be at the bristol bobs he kept on down the bowery hurrying with growing impatience through the crowds that massed in front of various places of amusement he had not intended to come along the bowery and except for what had occurred would have taken a less frequented street he would turn off at the next block he was in front of that moving picture theater again the double life his eyes were attracted involuntarily to the lurid overdone display it seemed to threaten him it seemed to dangle before him a premonition as it were of what the morning held in store but now too it seems to feed into flame that smouldering fury 
that possessed him, his life or whitey marks. Men, women, and the children who turned night into day in that quarter of the city were clustered thick around the signs, hiving like bees to the bald sensationalism. Almost savagely, he began to force his way through the crowd, and the next instant, like a man stunned, had stopped in his tracks. His fingers had closed in a fierce spasmodic clutch over an envelope that had been thrust suddenly into his hand. Jimmy, from somewhere came a low, quick voice. Jimmy, it is half past eleven now. Hurry. He whirled, scanning wildly this face, then that. It was her voice, her voice, the toxin. The sensitive fingers were telegraphing to his brain, as they always did, that the texture of the envelope too was hers. Her voice, yes, anywhere out of a thousand voices, he would distinguish hers. But her face, he had never seen that. Which out of all the crowd around him was hers? Surely he could tell by her dress. She would be different. Her personality alone must single her out. She... Say, have you got the pipe? Or do you think you owns the yet? A man flung at him, heaving and pushing to get by. With a start, though he scarcely had the man, Jimmy Dale moved on. His brain was afire. All the irony of the world seemed masked in a sudden, overwhelming attack upon him. It was useless. Intuitively, he had known it was useless from the instant he had heard her voice. It was always the same. Always. For years, she had eluded him like that, come upon him without warning, and disappeared but leaving always that tangible proof of her existence. A letter, the call of the grey seal to arms. But tonight it was as it had never been before. It was not alone baffled children now, not alone the longing, the wild desire to see her face, to look into her eyes. It was life and death. She had come at the very moment when she, perhaps alone of all the world, could have pointed the way out. When life, liberty, everything that was common to them both was at stake, in deadly peril, and she had gone, ignorant of it all, leaving him staggered by the very possibility of the succor that was held up before his eyes only to be snatched away without power of his to grasp it. His intuition had not been at fault. He had made no mistake in that shadow across the street from the sanctuary. It had been the toxin. He had been followed, and it was she who had followed him, until in a crowd she had seized the opportunity of a moment ago. Though ultimately perhaps it changed nothing it was a relief in a way to know that it was she not whitey mark who had been lurking there but her persistent incomprehensible determination to preserve the mystery with which she surrounded herself was like now to cost them both a ghastly price if he could only have had one word with her, just one word. The letter in his hand crackled under his clenched fist. He stared at it in a half-blind, half-bitter way. The call of the grey seal to arms. Another coup, with its incident danger and peril, 
that she had planned for him to execute. He could have laughed loud at the inhuman mockery of it. The call of the grey seal to arms. Now, when with every faculty drained to his last resource, cornered, trapped, he was fighting for his very existence. Jimmy Dale, it is half past eleven now. Hurry. The words were jangling discordantly in his brain. And now he laughed outright, mirthlessly. A young girl hanging on her escort's arm, passing, glanced at him and giggled. It was a different Jimmy Dale for the moment. For once, his immobility had forsaken him. He laughed again, a sort of unnatural, desperate indifference to everything falling upon him. What did it matter, the moment or two it would take to read the letter? He looked around him. He was on the corner in front of the palace saloon, and turning abruptly, he stepped in through the swinging doors. As Larry the Bat, he knew the place well. At the rear of the bar room and along the side of the wall were some half-dozen little stalls, partitioned off from each other. Several of these were unoccupied, and he chose the one farthest from the entrance. It was private enough. No one would disturb him. From the apprehend individual, who presented himself, he ordered a drink. The man returned in a moment, and Jimmy Dale tossed a coin on the table, bidding the other to keep the change. He wanted no drink. Transaction was wholly perfunctory. The waiter was gone, pushed the glass away from him, and tore the envelope open. End of part one. Chapter 10b Part 1 Chapter 10c of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard Part 1. The Man in the Case. Chapter 10c. The Alibi Concluded. A single sheet, closely written on both sides of the paper, was in his hand. It was her writing. There was no mistaking that. But every word, every line, bore evidence of frantic haste. Even that customary formula, their philanthropic crook, that had prefaced every line she had ever written him before, had been omitted. His eyes traversed the first few lines with that strange indifference that had settled upon him. What, after all, did it matter what it was? He could do nothing not even save himself, probably. And then, with a little start, he read the lines over again, muttering snatches from them. Max Destrich, Diamonds, The Ross Logan Stones, Wedding, Sliding Panel in Wall of Workshop, End of the Room Near Window, Ten boards to the right from side wall. Press small knot in the wood in the center of the tent board. Tonight. It brought a sudden thrill of excitement to Jimmy Dale that, impossible as he would have believed it an instant ago, for the moment overshadowed the realization of his own peril. A robbery such as that, if it were ever accomplished, would stare the country from end to end. It would set New York by the ears. It would lose the police in full cry like a pack of bloodhounds with their leashes slipped. 
the society columns of the newspapers had been busy for months featuring the coming marriage of the Ross Logan's daughter to one of the country's young merchant princes. The combined fortunes of the two families would make the young couple the richest in America. The prospective groom's wedding gift was to be a diamond necklace of perfectly matched large tones that would eclipse anything of the kind in the country. Europe, the foreign markets, had been literally combed and ransacked to supply the gems. The stones had arrived in New York the day before. The duty on them alone amounting to over $50,000. All these had appeared in the papers. Jimmy Dale's brows drew together in a frown. On just exactly what percentage the duty was figured, he did not know. But it was high enough on the basis of $50,000 to assume safely that the assessed value of the stones was not less than four times that amount. $200,000 laid down a quarter of a million. Well, why not? In more than one quarter diamonds, we are ranked as the soundest kind of an investment. Furthermore, through personal acquaintance with the high contracting parties who were in his own set, he knew it to be true. He shrugged the soldiers. The papers, too, had thrown the limelight on Mark's district who, though for quite a time the fashion in the social world, had up to the present been comparatively unknown to the average New Yorker. His own knowledge of Max Dextrick went deeper than the superficial biography furnished by the newspapers. The old Hollander had done more than one piece of exquisite jewelry work for him. The old fellow was a character that beggared description, eccentric to the point of extravagance and deaf as a post, but in craftsmanship a modern Cellini. He employed no workmen, lived alone over his shop on one of the lower streets between 5th and 6th avenues near Washington Square, and possessed a splendid contempt for such protective contrivances as safes and vaults. If his prospective patrons expostulated on this score before entrusting him with their valuables, they were at liberty to take their work elsewhere. It was Mark Dextrix who honored you by accepting the commission, not you who honored Mark Dextrix by entrusting him with it. Of what use is it to me, a safe, he would exclaim. It hides nothing. It only says, I am inside. Do not look further. Come and get me. Yes, it is to explode with the nitroglycerin. Poof! And I am deaf, and I hear nothing. It is a foolishness that... He had a habit of prodding at one with a leveled forefinger. Every night somewhere they are robbed. And have I been robbed? Eh? Tell me that. Have I been robbed? It was true. In ten years, though at times having stones and precious metal, aggregating large amounts deposited with him by his customers, Max district had never lost so much as the gold filings. There was a queer smile on Jimmy Dale's lips now. The knot in the tent board was significant. Mark's district was scrupulously honest, a genius in originality and conception of design, a master in the perfection and delicacy of his finished work. He had been commissioned to design and set the Ross Logan necklace. 
the brain works quickly. All this and more had flashed almost instantaneously through Jimmy Dale's mind. His eyes fell to the letter again, and he read on. Halfway through, a sudden whiteness blanched his face, and following it, a surging tide of red that mounted to his temples. It dazed him. It seemed to rob him for the moment of the power of coherent thought. He was wrong. He had not read aright. It was incredible. Dare devil beyond belief. And yet in its very audacity lay success. He finished the letter, read it once more, and his fingers mechanically began to tear it into little shreds. His brain was in a well, a vortex of conflicting emotions. Had Whitey Mark and Lanningham left Bristol Bobs yet? Where were they now? Was there time for this? He was staring at the little torn scraps of paper in his hand. He thrust them suddenly into his pocket and jacked out his watch. It was nearly midnight. The broad, muscular shoulders seemed to square back curiously, the jaws to clamp a little, the face to harden and grow cold until it was like stone. With a swift movement, he emptied his glass into the cuspidor, set the glass back on the table, and stepped out from the stall. His destination was Max Districts. The palace saloon was near the upper end of the Bowery, and failing a taxicab, of which none was in sight, his quickest method was to walk, and he started briskly forward. It was not far, and it was barely ten minutes from the time he had left the palace saloon when he swung through Washington Square to Fifth Avenue, and a moment later turned from that thoroughfare, heading west towards Sixth Avenue, along one of those streets which, with the city's northward trend, had quite lost any distinctive identity, and from being once a modestly fashionable residential section, had now become a conglomerate potpourri of small treatment stores, shops, and apartments of the poorer class. He knew Max districts. He could well have done without the aid of the arc lamp, which even if dimly indicated that low, almost tumble-down two-story structure, tucked away between the taller buildings on either side that almost engulfed it. It was late. The street was quiet. The shops and stores had long since been closed. Max Day Streets among them, the old Hollander's name in painted white letters, stood out against the background of a darkened workshop window. In the story above, the lights too were out. Max District was probably fast asleep, and he was stone deaf. A glance up and down the street, and Jimmy Dale was standing, or rather, leaning against Max District's door. There was no one to see, and if there were, what was there to attract attention to a man standing nonchalantly for a moment in a doorway? It was only for a moment. Those master fingers of Jimmy Dale were working surely, swiftly, silently. A little steel instrument that was never out of his possession was in the lock and out again. The door opened, closed. He drew the black silk mask from his pocket and slipped it over his face. Immediately in front of him, the stairs led upward. Immediately to his right was the door into the shop. The modest street entrance was common to both. 
The door into the workshop was not locked. He opened it, stepped inside, and closed it quietly behind him. The place was in blackness. He stood for a moment silent, straining his ears to catch the slightest sound, reconstructing the plan of his surroundings in his mind as he remembered it. It was a narrow oblong room, running the entire depth of the building. A very long room, blank walls on either side, a window in the middle of the rear wall that gave on a backyard, and from the backyard there was access to the lane. Also, as he remembered the place, it was a riot of disorder, with workbenches and odds and ends strewn without system or reason in every direction. One had need of care to negotiate it in the dark. He took his flashlight from his pocket, and preliminary to a more intimate acquaintance with the interior, glanced out through the front window near which he stood, and with a suppressed cry, shrank back instinctively against the wall. Two men were crossing the street, heading directly for the shop door. The arc lamp lighted up their faces. It was Inspector Lanningan of headquarters and Whitey Mac. The quick intake of Jimmy Dale breath was sucked through clenched teeth. They were close on his heels then, far closer than he had imagined. It would take Whitey Mac scarcely any longer to open that front door than it had taken him. Close on his heels. His face was rigid. He could hear them now at the door. The flashlight in his hand winked down the length of the room. It was a dangerous thing to do, but it was still more dangerous to stumble into some object and make a noise. He darted forward, circuiting a workbench, a stool, a small hand forge. Again the flashlight gleamed. Against the side wall near the rear was another workbench. With a sort of coarse canvas cotton hanging partway down in front of it, evidently to protect such things as might be stored away beneath it from dust. And Jimmy Dale sprang for it, whipped back the canvas, and crawled underneath. He was not an instant too soon. As the canvas fell back into place, the shop door opened, closed, and the two men had stepped inside. Whitey Mark's voice, in a low whisper though it was, seemed to echo raucously through the shop. Maybe we'll have a sweet wait. But I got the straight dope on this. He's going to make a try for Dutch's sparklers tonight. We'll let him go the limit. And we don't either of us make a move till he's pinched them. And then we get him with the goods on him. He can't get away. He hasn't a hope. There's only two ways of getting in here or getting out. This door and window here, and a window that's down there at the back. You guard this, and I'll take care of the other end. Savai? Right, Lanigan answered grimly. Go ahead. There was a sound of footsteps moving forward. Then a vicious bump the scraping of some object along the floor, and a muffled curse from Whitey Mac. Use your flashlight, advised the inspector in a guarded voice. I haven't got one, damn it, growled Whitey Mac. It's all right, I'll get along. Again the steps, 
but more warily now, as though the man were cautiously feeling ahead of him for possible obstacles. Jimmy Dale for a moment held his breath. He could have reached out and touched the man as the other passed. Whitey Mac went on until he had taken up a position against the rear wall. Jimmy Dale heard him as he brushed against it. Then silence fell. He was between them now, stretched full length on the floor. Jimmy Dale raised the lower portion of the canvas away from in front of his face. He could see nothing. The place was in Stygian blackness, but it had been close and stifling and at least it gave him more air. The minutes dragged by, each more interminable than the one that had gone before. Not a movement, not a sound, and then, through the stillness, very faint at first, came the regular repressed breathing of Whitey Mac, who was much the nearer of the two men, and once noticeable, almost imperceptible as it was, it seemed to pervade the room and fill it with a strange ominous resonance that rose and fell until the blackness palpitated with it. Slowly, very slowly, Jimmy Dale's hand crept into his pocket and crept out again with his automatic. He lay motionless once more. Time, in any concrete sense, seemed to exist. Fancied shapes began to assume form in the darkness. By the door, Lanigan stared uneasily, shifting his position slightly. Was it hours? Was it only minutes? It seemed to ring through the nerve-wracking stillness like the shriek of a hurtling shell and it was only a whisper. Watch yourself, Lanningan, whispered Whitey Mac. He's coming down through the yard. Don't move till I start something. Let him get his paws on the sparklers. Silence again, and then a low rasping at the window, like the gnawing of a rat. Then Inch by inch, the sash was lifted. There was a sound, as of a body forcing its way over the sill cautiously. Then a step upon the floor inside. Another, and still another. The figure of a man loomed up suddenly against the glow of a flashlight as he threw the round white ray inquisitively here and there over the rear wall and now he appeared to be counting the boards, one, two, three, up to ten. His hand ran up and down the tenth board. Again and again he repeated the operation, and something like the snarl of a baited beast echoed through the room. He half turned to snatch at something in his pocket, and the light for a moment, showed a black-bearded, lowering face, partially hidden by a peaked cap that was pulled far down over his eyes. There was a rip and tear of rending wood, as a steel jimmy, in lieu of the spring the man evidently could not find, beat in between the boards, a muttered oath of satisfaction and a portion of the wall slid back, disclosing what looked like a metal-lined cupboard. He reached in, seized one of a dozen little boxes, and wrenched off the cover. A blue scintillating gleam seemed to leap out to meet the white ray of the flashlight. The man chuckled hoarsely and began to cram the rest of the boxes into his pockets. Jimmy Dale stared. 
on hands and knees he was creeping now from beneath the workbench. Something caught and tore behind him the canvas curtain, and at the sound, with a sharp cry, the man at the wall whirled. The light went out, and he sprang toward the window. Jimmy Dale gained his feet and leaped forward. A revolver shot caught a lane of fire through the blackness, and above the roar of the report, Whitey Mark's voice in a fierce yell. It's all right, Lanigan. I got him. No, hell! There was a terrific crash of breaking glass. He's got away. Not yet he hasn't, greeted Jimmy Dale between his teeth, and his clubbed revolver swung crashing to the head of a dark form in front of him. There was a half sigh, half moan. The form slid limply to the floor. Lanningham was floundering down the shop, leaping obstacles in a mad rush, his flashlight picking out the way. Jimmy Dale stepped swiftly backward, and his hand groped out for the drop light over the end of the bench that he had knocked against in his own rush. His fingers clutched it, and the lower end of the shop was flooded with light. Except for his felt hat that lay a little distance away, there was no sign of Whitey Mark. The huddled form of the man, who but a moment since had chuckled as he pocketed old Mark's district gems, lay sprawled in net upon the floor and Lanigan was staring into the muzzle of Jimmy Dale's automatic. Drop that gun, Lanigan, said Jimmy Dale coolly, and I'll trouble you not to make a noise. It might attract attention from the street. There's been too much already. Drop that gun. The revolver clattered from Lanigan's hand to the floor. A step forward, and Jimmy Dale's toe sent it spinning under a bench. Another step, and his revolver still covering the other, he had whipped a pair of handcuffs from the officer's side pocket. Lanningan, as though the thought had never occurred to him, offered no resistance. He was staring in a dazed sort of way back and forth from Jimmy Dale to the man on the floor. What's this mean? he burst out suddenly. Where's your wrist, please? requested Jimmy Dale pleasantly. No, the left one. Thank you, as the handcuff snapped shut. Now go over there and sit down on the floor beside that fellow. Quick! Jimmy Dale's voice rasped suddenly, imperatively. Still bewildered, but a little sullen now. Lanningan obeyed. Jimmy Dale stooped quickly and snapped the other link of the handcuff over the unconscious man's right wrist. Jimmy Dale smiled. That's the approved way of taking your man, isn't it? Left wrist to the prisoner's right. He's only stunned. He'll be around in a moment. Know him? Lanigan shook his head. Take a good look at him, invited Jimmy Dale. You ought to know most of them in the business. Lanigan bent over a little closer, and then with an amazed cry, his free hand shot forward and tore away the other's beard. It was Whitey Mac. My God, gasped Lanigan. Quite so, said Jimmy Dale evenly. You'll find the diamonds in his pockets. And excuse me, his fingers were running through Whitey Mark's clothes. Ah, here it is. The thin metal case was in his hand. A little article that belongs to me and whose loss I am free to admit cost me considerable concern. 
until I was informed that he had only found it without having the slightest idea as to whom it belonged. It made quite a difference. He had opened the case carelessly before Lanigan's eyes. The Grey Seal, I'll say it for you, said Jimmy Dale whimsically. This is what probably put the idea into his head after first, in some way, having discovered old Max District's hiding place. And if I'd given him time enough, he would probably have stuck one of these seals in clumsy imitation of that little eccentricity of mine on the wall over there to stamp the job as Janine. You begin to get it, don't you, Lanigan? Pretty sure fire as an alibi, eh? And he'd have got away with it, too, as far as you were concerned. He had only to fire that shot, smash the window, tuck his false beard, mustache, and picked cap into his pocket, put on his own hat that you see there on the floor, and yelled that the man had escaped. He would help you chase the thief, too. Rather neat, don't you think, Lanigan? And what the risk, too, considering the howl that would go up at the theft of those stones, and that known as the slickest diamond thief in the country, he would be the first to be suspected, except that the police themselves, in the person of Inspector Lanigan of headquarters, would be prepared to prove a perfectly good alibi for him. Lanigan's head was thrust forward. His eyes, hard, were riveted on Whitey Mac. My God, he said again under his breath. Then, fiercely, he'll get his for this. It was a moment before Jimmy Dale spoke. He was musingly examining the automatic in his hand. I am going on learning gun, he observed quietly. I require, say, fifteen minutes in which to effect my escape. It is, of course, obvious that an alarm raised by you might prove extremely awkward. But a piece of canvas from that bench there, together with a bit of string, would make a most effective gag. I prefer, however, not to submit you to that indignity. Instead, I offer you the alternative of giving me your word to remain quietly where you are for 15 minutes. Lanningan hesitated. Jimmy Dale smiled. I agree, said Lanningan shortly. Jimmy Dale stepped back. The electric light switch clicked. The place was in darkness. There was a moment or two of utter stillness. Then, softly, from the front end of the shop, a whisper. If I were you, Laringan, I'd take that gun from Whitey's pocket before he comes round and beats you to it. And the door closed silently behind Jimmy Dale. End of part one, chapter 10C. Part one, chapter 11A of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard. Reading by Roger Moline. Part 1. The Man in the Case. Chapter 11A. The Stool Pigeon. In the subway, ten minutes before, a freckle-faced messenger boy had squeezed himself into a seat beside Jimmy Dale, yanked a dime novel from a refractory pocket, and, blissfully lost to all the world, had buried his head in its pages. Jimmy Dale's glance at the youngster had equally perforce embraced the lurid title of the thriller, Dicing with Death, 
so imperturbably thrust under his nose. At the time he had smiled indulgently, but now, as he left the subway and headed for his home on Riverside Drive, the words not only refused to be ignored, but had resolved themselves into a curiously persistent refrain in his mind. They were exactly what they purported to be, dime novelish, of the deepest hue of yellow, melodramatic in the extreme, but also, to him now, they were grimly apt and premonitorily appropriate. Dicing with death, there was not an hour, not a moment in his day when he was not literally dicing with death. When, with the underworld and the police allied against him, a single false move would lose him the throw that left death the winner. The risk of the dual life enforced upon him grew daily greater, and in the end there must be the reckoning. He would have been a madman to have shut his eyes in the face of what was obvious, but it was worth it all and in his soul he knew that he would not have had it otherwise, even now. Tonight, tomorrow, the day after, would come another letter from the Tocsin, and there would be another crime of the Gray Seals blazoned in the press. Would that be the last affair, or would there be another? Or tonight, tomorrow, the day after, would he be trapped before even one more letter came? He shrugged his shoulders as he ran up the steps of his house. Those were the stakes that he himself had laid on the table to wager upon the game. He had no quarrel there. But if only, before the end came, or even with the end itself, he could find her. With his latchkey he let himself into the spacious, richly furnished, well-lighted reception hall, and crossing this went up the broad staircase his steps noiseless on the heavy carpet. Below, faintly, he could hear some of the servants. They evidently had not heard him close the door behind him. Discipline was relaxed somewhat, it was quite apparent, with Jason, that peer of butlers, away. Jason, poor chap, was in the hospital. Typhoid, they had thought it at first, though it had turned out to be some milder form of infection. He would be back in a few days now, but meanwhile he missed the old man sorely from the house. He reached the landing, and, turning, went along the hall to the door of his own particular den, opened the door, closed it behind him, and in an instant the keen, agile brain, trained to the littlest things that never escaped it, that daily held his life in the balance, was alert. The room was unusually dark, even for night time. It was as though the window shades had been closely drawn, a thing Jason never did. But then Jason wasn't there. Jimmy Dale, smiling then a little quizzically at himself, reached up for the electric light switch beside the door, pressed it, and his finger still on the button whipped his automatic from his pocket with his other hand. The room was still in darkness. The smile on Jimmy Dale's lips was gone for his lips now had closed together in a tight, drawn line. The lights in the rest of the house, as witnessed the reception hall, were in order. This was no accident. Silent, motionless, he stood there, listening. Was he trapped at last in his own house? By whom? The police? The thugs of the underworld? It made little difference. The end would differ only in the method by which it was attained. What was that? Was there a slight stir, a movement at the lower end of the room? Or was it his imagination? His hand fell from the electric light switch to the doorknob behind his back. Slowly, without a sound, it began to turn under his slim, tapering fingers, whose deft, sensitive touch had made him known and feared as the master cracksman of them all and, as noiselessly, the door began to open. It was like a duel, a duel of silence. What was the intruder, whoever he might be, waiting for? The abortive click of the electric light switch, to say nothing of the opening of the door when he had entered, was evidence enough that he was there. Was the other trying to place him exactly through the darkness to make sure of his attack? The door was open now. And suddenly, Jimmy Dale laughed easily aloud, and on the instant shifted his position. 
Well, inquired Jimmy Dale coolly from the other side of the threshold. It seemed like a long-drawn sigh fluttering through the room, a gasp of relief. And then the blood was pounding madly at his temples, and he was back in the room again, the door closed once more behind him. Oh, Jimmy, why didn't you speak? I had to be sure that it was you. It was her voice. Hers. The toxin. Here. She was here. Here, in his house. You, he cried. You. Here. He was pressing the electric light switch frantically, again and again. Her voice came out of the darkness from across the room. Why are you doing that, Jimmy? You know already that I have turned off the lights. At the sockets, of course, he laughed out the words almost hysterically. Your face, I have never seen your face, you know. He was moving quickly toward the reading lamp on his desk. There was a quick, hurried swish of garments, and she was blocking his way. No, she said in a low voice. You must not light that lamp. He laughed again, shortly, fiercely now. She was close to him. His hands reached out for her, touched her, and thrilling at the touch, swept her toward him. Jimmy, Jimmy, are you mad? she breathed. Mad. Yes, he was mad with the wildest, most passionate exhilaration he had ever known. He found his voice with an effort. These months and years that I have tried until my soul was sick to find you, he cried out. And you are here now. Your face. I must see your face. She had wrenched herself away from him. He could hear her breath coming sharply in little gasps. He groped his way onward toward the desk. Wait! Her tones seemed to ring suddenly vibrant through the room. Wait, before you touch that lamp. I... I put you on your honor not to light it. He stopped abruptly. My honor? he repeated mechanically. Yes, I came here tonight because there was no other way. No other way. Do you understand? I came, trusting to your honor not to take advantage of the conditions that forced me to do this. I had no fear that I was wrong. I have no fear now. You will not light that lamp, and you will not make any attempt to prevent my going away, as I came, unknown. Is there any question about it, Jimmy? I am in your house. You don't know what you're saying, he burst out wildly. I've risked my life for a chance like this again and again. I've gone through hell, living in squalor for a month on end as Larry the Bat, in the hope that I might discover who you are. And do you think I'll let anything stop me now? I tell you, no. A thousand times, no. She made no answer. There was only her low, quick breathing coming from somewhere near him. He made another step toward the lamp and stopped. I tell you no, he said again, and took another step forward and stopped once more. Still she made no answer. A minute passed, another. His hand lifted and swept across his forehead in an agitated way. Still silence. She neither moved nor spoke. His hands dropped slowly to his side. There was a queer, twisted smile upon his lips. You win, he said hoarsely. Thank you, Jimmy, she said simply. And your name, who you are. He was speaking, but he did not seem to recognize his own voice. The hundred other things I've sworn I'd make you explain when I found you are all taboo as well, I suppose. Yes, she said. He laughed bitterly. Don't you know, he cried out, that between the police and the underworld, our house of cards is likely to collapse at any minute, that they are hunting the gray seal day and night. It is to be always like this, that I am never to know until it is too late. She came toward him out of the darkness impulsively. They will never get you, Jimmy, she said in a suppressed voice. And some day, I promise you now, 
you shall have your reward for tonight. You shall know everything. When? The word came from him with fierce eagerness. I do not know, she answered gently. Soon, perhaps, perhaps sooner than either of us imagine. And by that you mean what? he asked, and his hand reached out for her again through the blackness. This time she did not draw away. There was an instant's hesitation. Then she spoke again, hurriedly, a note of anxiety in her voice. You are beginning all over again, aren't you, Jimmy? And I have told you that tonight I can explain nothing. And besides, it is what has brought me here that counts now, and every moment is of... Yes, I know, he interposed. But then at least you will tell me one thing. Why did you come tonight, instead of sending me a letter as you always have before? Because it is different tonight than it ever was before, she replied earnestly. Because there is something in what has happened that I cannot explain myself. Because there is danger, and where I could not see clearly I feared a trap, and so I dared not send what, in a letter, could at best be only vague and incomplete details. Do you see? Yes, said Jimmy Dale, but he was only listening in an abstracted way. If he could only see that face so close to his. He had yearned for that with all his soul for years now. And she was here, standing beside him, and his hand was upon her arm. And here, in his own den, in his own house, he was listening to another call to arms for the gray seal from her own lips. Honor. Was he but a poor, quixotic fool? He had only to step to the desk and switch on the light. Why should... He steadied himself with a jerk and drew away his hand. She was in his house. Go on, he said tersely. Do you know, or did you ever hear of old Luther Doyle? She asked. No, said Jimmy Dale. Do you know a man, then, named Connie Myers? Connie Myers. Who in the Badlands did not know Connie Myers, who boasted of the half-dozen prison sentences already to his credit? Yes, he knew Connie Myers. But strangely enough, it was not in the Badlands, or as Larry the Bat, that he knew the man, or that the other knew him. It was as Jimmy Dale. Connie Myers had introduced himself one night several years ago with a blackjack that had just missed its mark as the man had jumped out from a dark hallway in the east side, and he, Jimmy Dale, had thrashed the other to within an inch of his life. He had reason to know Connie Myers, and Connie Myers had reason to remember him. Yes, he said with a grim smile, I know Connie Myers. And the tenement across the street from where you live as Larry the Bat? That, of course, you know. He leaned toward her wonderingly now. Of course, he ejaculated. Naturally. Listen, then, Jimmy. She was speaking quickly now. It is a strange story. This Luther Doyle was already over fifty when, some eight or nine years ago, his parents died within a few months of each other, and he inherited somewhere in the neighborhood of a hundred thousand dollars. But the man, though harmless enough, was mildly insane, half-witted, queer, and the old couple, on account of their son's mental defects, took care to leave the money securely invested, and so that he could only touch the interest. During these eight or nine years he has lived by himself in the same old family house where he had lived with his parents, in a lonely spot near Pelham. And he has lived in a most frugal, even miserly manner. His income could not have been less than six thousand dollars a year, and his expenditures could not have been more than six hundred. His dementia, ironically enough, from the day that he came into his fortune, took the form of a most pitiable and abject fear that he would die in poverty, misery, and want. And so, year after year, cashing his checks as fast as he got them, never trusting the bank with a penny, 
he kept hiding away somewhere in his house every cent he could scrape and save from his income, which today must amount, at a minimum calculation, to fifty thousand dollars. And, observed Jimmy Dale quietly, Connie Myers robbed him of it, and, no, her voice was quivering with passion as she caught up his words. Twice in the last month, Connie Myers tried to rob him, but the money was too securely hidden. Twice he broke into Doyle's house when the old man was out, but on both occasions was unsuccessful in his search, and was interrupted and forced to make his escape on account of Doyle's return. Tonight, an hour ago, in an empty house on the second floor of that tenement, in the room facing the landing, old Luther Doyle was murdered. There was silence for an instant. Her hand had closed in a tight pressure on his arm. The darkness seemed to add a sort of ghastly significance to her words. "'In God's name, how do you know all this?' he demanded wildly. "'How do you know all these things?' "'Does that matter now?' she answered tensely. "'You will know that when you know the rest. "'Oh, don't you understand, Jimmy? "'There is not a moment to lose now.' It was easy to lure a half-witted creature like that anywhere. It was Connie Myers who lured him to the tenement and murdered him there. But from that point, Jimmy, I am not sure of our ground. I do not know whether Connie Myers is alone in this or not. But I do know that he is going to Doyle's house again tonight to make another search for the money. There is no question but that old Doyle was murdered to give Connie Myers and his accomplices, if there are any, a chance to tear the house inside out to find the money, to give them the whole night to work in without interruption, if necessary. But Doyle, dead in his own house, could have interfered no more with them than Doyle dead in that tenement. Why was he lured to the tenement by Connie Myers when he could much more easily have been put out of the way in his own house? Jimmy, there is something behind this, something more that you must find out. There may be others in this besides Connie Myers. I do not know. But there is something here that I am afraid of. Jimmy, you must get that man. You must get the others, if there are others, and you must stop them from getting the money in that house tonight. Do you understand now why I have come here? I could not explain in a letter. I do not quite seem to be explaining now. It would seem as though there were no need for the gray seal, that simply the police should be notified. But I know, Jimmy, call it intuition, what you will, I know that there is need for us, for you, tonight, that behind all this is a tragedy, deeper, blacker than even the brutal, cold-blooded murder that is already done. Her voice, in its passionate earnestness, died away, and an anger, cold, grim, remorseless, settled upon Jimmy Dale, settled as it always settled upon him at her call to arms. His brain was already at work in its quick, instant way, probing, sifting, planning. She was right. It was strange. It was more than strange that, with the added risk, the danger, the difficulty, the man should have been brought miles to be done away with in that tenement. Why? Connie Myers took form before him, the coarse features, the tawny hair that straggled across the low forehead, the shifty eyes that were an intermediate color between brown and gray, the thin lips that seemed to draw in and give the jaw a protruding, belligerent effect. And Connie Myers knew him as Jimmy Dale. It would have to be, then, as Larry the Bat, that the gray seal must work. That meant time to go to the sanctuary and change. The police, he asked suddenly aloud, they have not yet discovered the body? Not yet, she replied hurriedly. And that is still another reason for haste. There is no telling when they will. See, here, she thrust a paper into his hand, here is a plan of old Doyle's house and directions for finding it. You must get Connie Myers red-handed. You must make him convict himself, for the evidence through which I know him to be guilty can never be used against him. And, Jimmy, be careful. 
I know I am not wrong, that there is still something more behind all this. And now go, Jimmy, go. There is no time to lose. She was pushing him across the room toward the door. Go. The word seemed suddenly to bring dismay. It was she again who was dominant now in his mind. Who knew if tonight, when he was taking his life in his hands again, would not be the last? And she was here now, here beside him, where she might never be again. She seemed to divine his thoughts, for she spoke again, a strange new note of tenderness in her voice that thrilled him. You must never let them get you, Jimmy, for my sake. It will not last much longer. It is near the end, and I shall keep my promise. But go, now, Jimmy, go. Go, he repeated numbly. Go? But, but you? I, she slipped suddenly away from him, retreating back down the room. I will go as I came. Wait, listen, he pleaded. There was no answer. She was there, somewhere back there in the darkness still. He stood hesitant at the door. It seemed that every faculty he possessed urged him back there again, to her. Could he let her escape him now, when she was so utterly in his power, she who meant everything in his life? And then, like a cold shock, came that other thought, she who had trusted to his honor. With a jerk, his hand swept out, felt for the doorknob, and closed upon it. Good night, he said heavily, and stepped out into the hall. End of Part 1 Chapter 11a Reading by Roger Moline Part 1, Chapter 11b of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard. Reading by Roger Moline. Part 1, The Man in the Case. Chapter 11b, The Stool Pigeon. Continued. It seemed for a while, even after he had gained the street and made his way again to the subway, that nothing was concrete around him, that he was living through some fantastical dream. His head whirled, and he could not think rationally, and then slowly, little by little, his grip upon himself came back. She had come and gone. With the roar of the subway in his ears, its raucous note seeming to strike so perfectly in consonance with the turmoil within him, he smiled mirthlessly. After all, it was as it always was. She was gone, and ahead of him lay the chances of the night. Dicing with death! The words, unbidden, came back once more. If they were true before, they were doubly applicable now. It was different tonight from what it had ever been before, as she had said. Usually, to the smallest detail, everything was laid open, clear before him in those astounding letters. Tonight, it was vague at best. A man had been murdered. Connie Myers had committed the murder under circumstances that pointed strongly to some hidden motive behind and beyond the mere chance it afforded him to search his victim's house for the hidden cash. What was it? Jimmy Dale stared out at the black subway walls. The answer would not come. Station after station passed. At 14th Street he changed from the express to a local, got out at Astor Place, and a few minutes later was walking rapidly down the upper end of the Bowery. The answer would not come. Only the fact itself grew more and more deeply significant. The ghastly, callous fiendishness that lured an old, half-witted man to his death had Jimmy Dale in that grip of cold, merciless anger again, and there was a dull flush now upon his cheeks. Whatever it meant, Whatever was behind it, one thing at least was certain. He would get Connie Myers. 
He was close to the sanctuary now. It was down the next cross street. He reached the corner and turned it, heading east. But his brisk walk had changed to a nonchalant saunter. There were some people coming toward him. It was the gray seal now, alert and cautious. The little group passed by. Ahead, the tenement bordering on the black alleyway loomed up. The sanctuary, with its three entrances and exits. The home of Larry the Bat. And across from it was that other tenement that held a new interest for him now, where, in an empty room on the second floor, she had said, old Doyle still lay. Should he go there? He was thinking quickly now, and shook his head. It would take what he did not have to spare, time. It was already ten o'clock, and granted that Connie Myers had committed the crime only a little over an hour ago, the man by this time would certainly be on his way to Doyle's house near Pelham, if, indeed, he were not already there. No, there was no time to spare. The question resolved itself simply into how long, since he had already searched twice and failed on both occasions, it would take Connie Myers to unearth old Doyle's hiding place for the money. Jimmy Dale glanced sharply around him, slipped into the alleyway, and, crouching against the tenement wall, moved noiselessly along to the side entrance. A moment more, and he had negotiated the rickety stairs with practiced, soundless tread was inside the squalid quarters of Larry the Bat, and the door of the sanctuary was locked and bolted behind him. Perhaps five minutes passed, and then, where Jimmy Dale, the millionaire, had entered, there emerged Larry the Bat, of the aristocracy and the elite of the Badlands. But instead of leaving by the side door and the alleyway, as he had entered, he went along the lower hallway to the front entrance. And here, instinctively, he paused a moment at the top of the steps as his eyes rested upon the tenement on the opposite side of the street. It was strange that the crime should have been committed there. Something again seemed to draw him toward that empty room on the second story. He had decided once that he would not go, that there was not time. But, after all, it would not take long and there was at least the possibility of gaining something more valuable even than time from the scene of the crime itself. There might even be the evidence he wanted there that would disclose the whole of Connie Meyer's game. He went down the steps and started across the street, but halfway over he hesitated uncertainly as a child's cry came petulantly from the doorway. It was dark in the street, and likewise it was one of those hot, suffocating evenings, when in the crowded tenements of the poorer class, miserable enough in any case, misery was added to a hundredfold for lack of a single God-given breath of air. These two facts, apparently irrelevant, caused Jimmy Dale to change his mind again. He had not noticed the woman with the baby in her arms sitting on the doorstep, but now, as he reached the curb, he not only saw, but recognized her and he swung on down the street toward the Bowery. He could not very well go in without passing her, without being recognized himself, and that was a needless risk. He smiled a little wanly. Once the crime was discovered, she would not have hesitated long before informing the police that she had seen him enter there. Mrs. Hagen was no friend of his. One could not live as he had lived, as Larry the Bat, and not see something in an intimate way of the pitiful little tragedies of the poor around him. For bad, tough, and dissolute as the quarter was, all were not degraded there. Some were simply poor. Mrs. Hagen was poor. Her husband was a day laborer, often out of a job, and sometimes he drank. That was how he, Jimmy Dale, or rather Larry the Bat, had come to earn Mrs. Hagen's enmity. He had found Mike Hagen drunk one night and in the act of being arrested, and had wheedled the man away from the officer on the promise that he would take Hagen home. And he was Larry the Bat, a dope fiend, a character known to all the neighborhood, and Mrs. Hagen had laid her husband's condition to his influence and companionship. 
he had taken Mike Hagan home, and Mrs. Hagan had driven Larry the Bat from the door of her miserable one-room lodging in that tenement, with the bitter words on her tongue that only a woman can use when shame and grief and anger are breaking her heart. He shrugged his shoulders as, back along the Bowery, he retraced his steps. But now, with the hurried shuffle of Larry the Bat where before had been the brisk, athletic stride of Jimmy Dale. At Astor Place again, he took the subway, this time to the Grand Central Station, and well within an hour from the time he had left the sanctuary, including the train journey to Pelham, he was standing in a clump of trees that fringed a deserted roadway. He had passed but a few houses once he was away from Pelham, and as well as he could judge, there was none now within a quarter of a mile of him, except this one of old Luther Doyle's that showed up black and shadowy just beyond the trees. Jimmy Dale's eyes narrowed as he surveyed the place. It was little wonder that, known to have money, an attempt to rob old Doyle should have been made in a place like this. It was even more grimly significant than ever of some deeper meaning, that in its loneliness, an ideal place for a murder, the man should have been lured from there for that purpose to a crowded tenement in the city instead. What did it mean? Why had it been done? He shook his head. The answer would not come now any more than it had come before in the subway or in the train on the way out when he had set his brain so futilely to solve the problem. From a survey of the house, Jimmy Dale gave attention to the details of his surroundings. The trees on either side, the open space in front, a distance of fifty yards on the road, the absence of any fence. And then, abruptly, he stole forward. There was no light to be seen anywhere about the house. Was it possible that Connie Myers was not yet there? He shook his head again impatiently. Connie Myers would not have wasted any time, as the toxin had said. There was always present the possibility that the crime in that tenement might be discovered at any moment. Connie Myers would have lost no time, for let the discovery be made, let the police identify the body, as they most certainly would, and they would be out here hot-foot. Jimmy Dale stood suddenly still. What did it mean? He had not thought of that before. If old Doyle had been murdered here, there would not have been even the possibility of discovery until the morning at the earliest, and Connie Myers would have had all the time he wanted. What was that sound? A low, muffled tapping, like a succession of hammer blows, came from within the house. Jimmy Dale darted forward, reached the side of the house, and dropped on hands and knees. One question at least was answered. Connie Myers was inside. The plan that she had given him showed an old-fashioned cellarway, closed by folding trap doors, that was located a little toward the rear, and, in a moment, creeping along, he came upon it. His hands felt over it. It was shut, fastened by a padlock on the outside. Jimmy Dale's lips thinned a little as he took a small steel instrument from his pocket. Either through inadvertence or by intention, Connie Myers had passed up an almost childishly simple means of entrance into the house. One side of the trap door was lifted up silently and silently closed. Jimmy Dale was in the cellar. The hammering, much more distinct now, heavy, thudding blows, came from a room in the front. The connection between the cellar and the house, as shown on the toxin's plan, was through another trap door in the floor of the kitchen. Jimmy Dale's flashlight played on a short, ladder-like stairway, and in an instant he was climbing upward. The sounds from the front of the house continued now without interruption. There was little fear that Connie Myers would hear anything else, even the protesting squeak of the hinges, as Jimmy Dale cautiously pushed back the trap door and the flooring above his head. An inch, two inches, he lifted it, and his eyes on a level with the opening now, he peered into the room. The kitchen itself was intensely dark, but through an open doorway, well to one side so that he could not see into the room beyond, there struggled a curiously faint, dim glimmer of light. And then Jimmy Dale's form straightened rigidly on the stairs. The blows stopped, 
and a voice in a low growl, presumably Connie Myers, reached him. Here, take a drive at it from the lower edge. There was no answer, save that the blows were resumed again. Jimmy Dale's face had set hard. Connie Myers was not alone in this, then. Well, the odds were a little heavier. Doubled, that was all. He pushed the trap door wide open, swung himself up through the opening to the floor, and the next instant, back a little from the connecting doorway, his body pressed closely against the kitchen wall. He was staring, bewildered and amazed, into the next room. On the floor, presumably to lessen the chance of any light rays stealing through the tightly drawn window shades, burned a small oil lamp. The place was in utter confusion. The right-hand side of a large fireplace, made of rough, untrimmed stone and cement, and which occupied almost the entire end of the room, was already practically demolished, and the wreckage was littered everywhere. Part of the furniture was piled unceremoniously into one corner, out of the way, and at the fireplace itself, working with sledge and bar, were two men. One was Connie Myers. An ironical glint crept into Jimmy Dale's eyes. The false beard and mustache the man wore could deceive no one who knew Connie Myers, and that he should be wearing them now as he knelt holding the bar while the other struck at it seemed both uncalled for and absurd. The other man, heavily built, roughly dressed, had his back turned, and Jimmy Dale could not see his face. The puzzled frown on Jimmy Dale's forehead deepened. Somewhere in the masonry of the fireplace, of course, was where old Luther Doyle had hidden his money. That was quite plain enough, and that Connie Myers, in some way or other, had made sure of that fact was equally obvious. But how did old Luther Doyle get his money in there from time to time, as he received the interest and dividends, whose accumulation, according to the toxin, comprised his hoard? And how did he get it out again? All right, that'll do, grunted Connie Myers suddenly. We can pry this one out now. Lend a hand on the bar. The other dropped his sledge, turned sideways as he stooped to help Connie Myers. His face came into view, and with an involuntary start, Jimmy Dale crouched farther back against the wall as he stared at the other. It was Hagen, Mrs. Hagen's husband, Mike Hagen. My God, whispered Jimmy Dale under his breath. So that was it. That the murder had been committed in the tenement was not so strange now. A surge of anger swept Jimmy Dale and was engulfed in a wave of pity. Somehow the thin, tired face of Mrs. Hagen had risen before him, and she seemed to be pleading with him to go away, to leave the house, to forget that he had ever been there, to forget what he had seen what he was seeing now. His hands clenched fiercely. How realistically, how importunately, how pitifully she took form before him. She was on her knees, clasping his knees, imploring him, terrified. From Jimmy Dale's pocket came the black silk mask. Slowly, almost hesitantly, he fitted it over his face. Mike Hagen knew Larry the Bat. Why should he have pity for Mike Hagen? Had he any for Connie Myers? What right had he to let pity sway him? The man had gone the limit. He was Connie Myers' accomplice, a murderer. But the man was not a hardened, confirmed criminal like Connie Myers. Mike Hagen, a murderer. It would have been unbelievable but for the evidence before his own eyes now. The man had faults, brawled enough, and drank enough to have brought him several times to the notice of the police. But this! Jimmy Dale's eyes had never left the scene before him. Both men were throwing their weight upon the bar and the stone that they were trying to dislodge. They were into the heart of the masonry now, seemed to move a little. Connie Myers stood up and, leaning forward, examined the stone critically at the top and bottom, prodding it with the bar. He turned from his examination abruptly and thrust the bar into Hagen's hands. "'Hold it,' he said tersely. "'I'll strike for a turn.' 
crouched, on his hands and knees, Hagen inserted the point of the bar into the crevice. Connie Myers picked up the sledge. Lower, bend lower, he snapped, and swung the sledge. It seemed to go black for a moment before Jimmy Dale's eyes, seemed to paralyze all action of mind and body. There was a low cry that was more a moan, the clang of the iron bar clattering on the floor, and Mike Hagen had pitched forward on his face, an inert and huddled heap. A half laugh, half snarl purled from Connie Meyer's lips as he snatched a stout piece of cord from his pocket and swiftly knotted the unconscious man's wrist together. Another instant, and picking up the bar, prying with it again, the loosened stone toppled with a crash into the grate. It had come sudden as the crack of doom, that blow, too quick, too unexpected for Jimmy Dale to have lifted a finger to prevent it. And now that the first numbed shock of mingled horror and amazement was past, he fought back the quick, fierce impulse to spring out on Connie Myers. Whether the man was killed or only stunned, he could do no good to Mike Hagen now, and there was Connie Myers. He was staring in a fascinated way at Connie Myers. Behind the stone that the other had just dislodged was a large hollow space that had been left in the masonry, and from this now Connie Myers was eagerly collecting handfuls of banknotes that were rolled up into the shape of little cylinders, each one grotesquely tied with a string. The man was feverishly excited, muttering to himself, running from the fireplace to where the table had been pushed aside with the rest of the furniture, dropping the curious little rolls of money on the table, and running back for more. And then, having apparently emptied the receptacle, he wriggled his body over the dismantled fireplace, stuck his head into the opening, and peered upward. "'Kinks in his hut! Kinks in his hut!' Connie Myers was muttering. I'll drop the bar through from the top. Maybe there's some got stuck in the pipe. He regained his feet, picked up the bar, and ran with it into what was evidently the front hall. Then his steps sounded running upstairs. Like a flash, Jimmy Dale was across the room and at the fireplace. Like Connie Myers, he, too, put his head into the opening, and then, a queer, unpleasant smile on his lips, he bent quickly over the man on the floor. Hagen was no more than stunned, and was even then beginning to show signs of returning consciousness. There was a rattle, a clang, a thud, and the bar, too long to come all the way through, dropped into the opening and stood upright. Connie Meyer's footsteps sounded again, returning on the run, and Jimmy Dale was back once more on the other side of the kitchen doorway. It was all simple enough, once one understood. The same queer smile was still flickering on Jimmy Dale's lips. There was no way to get the money out except the way Connie Myers had got it out, by digging it out. With the irrational cunning of his mad brain that had put the money even beyond his own reach, Old Doyle had built his fireplace with a hollow some eighteen inches square in a great wall of solid stonework, and from it had run a two-inch pipe up somewhere to the story above and down this pipe he had dropped his little stirring-tied cylinders of banknotes, satisfied that his hoard was safe. There seemed something pitifully ironic in the elaborate, insane craftiness of the old man's fear-twisted, demented mind. And now Connie Myers was back in the room again, and again a puzzled expression settled upon Jimmy Dale's face as he watched the other. For perhaps a minute, the man stood by the table, sifting the little rolls of money through his fingers gloatingly. Then, impulsively, he pushed these to one side, produced a revolver, laid it on the table, and from another pocket took out a little case which, as he opened it, Jimmy Dale could see contained a hypodermic syringe. One more article followed the other two, a letter which Connie Myers took out of an unsealed envelope. He dropped this suddenly on the table as Mike Hagen, three feet away on the floor, groaned and sat up. End of Part 1, Chapter 11b Recording by Roger Moline
Part One, Chapter Eleven C of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard. Reading by Roger Moline. Part One The Man in the Case. Chapter Eleven C. The Stool Pigeon, concluded. Hagen's eyes swept, bewildered, confused, around him, questioningly at Connie Myers, and then, resting suddenly on his bound wrists, they narrowed menacingly. "'Damn you! You smashed me with that sledge on purpose!' he burst out, and began to struggle to his feet. With a brutal chuckle, Connie Myers pushed Hagen back and shoved his revolver under the other's nose. Sure, he admitted evenly, and you keep quiet or I'll finish you now instead of letting the police do it. He laughed out jarringly. You're under arrest, you know, for the murder of Luther Doyle and for robbing the poor old nut of his savings in his house here. Hagen wrenched himself up on his elbow. What, what do you mean? he stammered. Oh, don't worry, said Connie Myers maliciously. I'm not making the arrest. I'd rather the police did that. I'm not mixing up in it. And by and by, he lifted up the hypodermic for Hagen to see, I'm going to shoot a little dope into you that'll keep you quiet while I get away myself. Hagen's face had gone a grayish white. He had caught sight of the money on the table, and his eyes kept shifting back and forth from it to Meyer's face. Murder, he said huskily. There is no murder. I don't know who Doyle is. You said this house was yours. You hired me to come here. You said you were going to tear down the fireplace and build another. You said I could work evenings and earn some extra money. Sure I did. There was a vicious leer now on Connie Meyer's lips. But you don't think I picked you out by accident, do you? Your reputation, my bucko, was just shady enough to satisfy anybody that it wouldn't be beyond you to go the limit. Sure, you murdered Doyle. Listen to this. He took up the letter. To the police. Luther Doyle was murdered this evening in the tenement at 67 Blank Street. You'll find his body in a room on the second floor. If you want to know who did it, look in Mike Hagen's room on the floor above. There's a paper stuck under the edge of Hagen's table with a piece of chewing gum where he hid it. You'll know what it is when you go out and take a look at Doyle's house in Pelham. Yours truly, a friend. Mike Hagen did not speak. His lips were twitching, and there was horror creeping into his eyes. Do you get me? sneered Connie Myers. Tell your story. Who'd believe it? I got you cinched. Twice I tried to get this old dub's coin out here and couldn't find it. But the second time I found something else, a piece of paper with a drawing of the fireplace on it and a place in the drawing marked with an X. That was good enough, wasn't it? That's the paper I stuck under your table this afternoon when your wife was out, see? Somebody's got to stand for the job, and if it's somebody else, it won't be me. Get me? When I had a look at that fireplace, I knew I couldn't do the job alone in a week and I didn't dare blast it with soup for fear of spoiling what was inside. And since I had to have somebody help me, I thought I might as well let him help me all the way through and stand for it. I picked you, Mike. That's why I croaked old Doyle in your tenement tonight. I wrote this letter while I was waiting for you to show up at the station to come out here with me, and I'm going to see that the police get it in the next hour. When they find Doyle in the room below yours, and that paper in your room, and the busted fireplace here, I guess they won't look any farther for who did it. And say, he leaned forward with an ugly grin, maybe you think I'm soft to be telling you all this, but don't you fool yourself. You don't know me. You don't know who I am. So tell them the truth. They won't believe you anyway with evidence like that against you. And the neater the story, the more they'll think it shows brains enough on your part to have pulled a job like this. My God! Hagen was rocking on his knees. Beads of sweat were starting out on his forehead. 
"'You wouldn't plant a man like that,' he cried brokenly. "'You wouldn't do it, would you? "'My God, you wouldn't do that!' Jimmy Dale's face under his mask was white and rigid. There was something primal, elemental in the savagery that was sweeping upon him. He had it all now, all. She had been right. There was need tonight for the gray seal. So that was the game, inhuman, hellish, the whole of it, to the last filthy dregs. Connie Myers, to protect himself, was railroading an innocent man to death for the crime that he himself had committed. There was a cold smile on Jimmy Dale's lips now as he took his automatic from his pocket. No, it wasn't quite all the game. There was still his hand to play. He edged forward a little nearer to the door and halted abruptly, listening. An automobile had stopped outside on the road. Hagen was still pleading in a frenzied way. Connie Myers was callously folding his letter while he watched the other warily. Neither of the men had heard the sound. And then, quick, almost on the instant, came a rush of feet, a crash upon the front door, an imperative command to open in the name of the law. The police! Jimmy Dale's brain was working now with lightning speed. Somehow the police had stumbled upon the crime in that tenement, and as he had foreseen in such an event, had identified Doyle but they could not be sure that anyone was present here in the house now. They could not see a light any more than he had. He must get Mike Hagen away, must see that Connie Myers did not get away. Myers was on his feet now, fear struck in his turn. The letter clutched in a tight-closed fist, his revolver swung out, poised, in the other hand. Hagen, too, was on his feet, and, unheeded now by Connie Myers, was wrenching his wrists apart. Another crash upon the door, another, another demand in a harsh voice to open it. Then someone running around to the window at the side of the house, and Jimmy Dale sprang forward. There was the roar of a report, a blinding flash almost in Jimmy Dale's eyes, as Connie Myers, whirling instantly at his entrance, fired and missed. It happened quick then, in the space of the ticking of a watch, before Jimmy Dale, flinging himself forward, had reached the man. Like a defiant challenge to their demand, it must have seemed to the officers outside that shot of Connie Myers at Jimmy Dale, for it was answered on the instant by another through the side window. And the shot, fired at random, the interior of the room hidden from the officers outside by the drawn shades, found its mark, and Connie Myers, a bullet in his brain, pitched forward, dead, upon the floor. Quick! Jimmy Dale flung at Hagen. Get that letter out of his hand. He jumped for the lamp on the floor, extinguished it, and turned again toward Hagen. Have you got it? He whispered tensely. Yes, said Hagen in a numbed way. This way, then. Jimmy Dale caught Hagen's arm and pulled the other across the room and into the kitchen to the trap door. Quick, he breathed again. Get down there, quick, and no noise. They don't know how many are in the house. When they find him, they'll probably be satisfied. Hagen, stupefied, dazed, obeyed mechanically, and in an instant the trap door closed behind them. Jimmy Dale was standing beside the other in the cellar. Not a sound now, he cautioned once more. His flashlight winked, went out, winked again, then held steadily in curious fascination, it seemed, as in its circuit the ray fell upon Hagen, fell upon the torn, ragged edge of a paper in Hagen's hand. With a suppressed cry, Jimmy Dale snatched it away from the other. It was but a torn half of the letter. The other half! The other half! Hagen, where is it? he demanded hoarsely. Hagen, almost in a state of collapse, muttered inaudibly. The crash of a toppling door sounded from above. Jimmy Dale shook the man desperately. Where is it? he repeated fiercely. He... he was holding it tight. It... It tore in his hand, Hagen stammered. Does it make any difference? Oh, let's get out of here, whoever you are. For God's sake, let's get out of here. Any difference? Jimmy Dale's jaws were clamped like a steel vice. Any difference? 
the difference between life and death for the man beside him, that was all. He was reading the portion in his hand. It was the last part of the letter, beginning with, There's a paper stuck under the edge of Hagen's table. From above, from the floor of the front room now, came the rush and trample of feet. He could not go back for the other half, and any attempt to conceal the fact that Connie Myers had been alone in the house was futile now. They would find the torn letter in the dead man's hand, proof enough that someone else had been there. What was in that part of the letter that was still clutched in that death grip upstairs? A sentence from it that he had heard Connie Myers read seemed to burn itself into his brain. If you want to know who did it, look in Mike Hagen's room on the floor above. And then, suddenly, like light through the darkness, came a ray of hope. He pulled Hagen to the cellarway and stealthily lifted one side of the double trap door. There was a chance, desperate enough, one in a thousand, but still a chance. Voices from the house came plainly now, but there was no one in sight. The police, to a man, were evidently all inside. From the road in front showed the lamp glare of their automobile. Run for the car! Jimmy Dale jerked out from between the set teeth, and with Hagen beside him, steadying the man by the arm, dashed across the intervening fifty yards. They had not been seen. A minute more, and the car, evidently belonging to the local police, for it was headed in the direction of New York, and as though it had come from Pelham, swept down the road, swept around a turn, and Jimmy Dale, with a gasp of relief, straightened up a little from the wheel. How much time had he? The police must have heard the car, but equally occupied as they were, they might well give it no thought other than that it was but another car passing by. There was no telephone in the house. The nearest house was a quarter of a mile away, and that might or might not have a telephone. Could he count on half an hour? He glanced anxiously at the crouched figure beside him. He would have to. It was the only chance. They would telephone the contents of the dead man's half of the letter to the New York police. Could he get to Hagen's room first? Look in Hagen's room, their part of the letter read, but it did not say for what or exactly where. If they found nothing, Hagen was safe. Connie Meyer's reputation, the fact that he was found in disguise at Doyle's house, was, barring any incriminating evidence, quite enough to let Hagen out. There would only remain in the minds of the police the question of who, beside Connie Myers, had been in old Doyle's house that night. And now Jimmy Dale smiled a little whimsically. Well, perhaps he could answer that, and if not quite to the satisfaction of the police, at least to the complete vindication of Mike Hagen. But he could not drive through towns and villages with a mask on his face, and there, ahead now, lights were beginning to show. And more than ever now, with what was before him, it was imperative that Mike Hagen should not recognize Larry the Bat. Jimmy Dale glanced again at Hagen and slowed down the car. They were on the outskirts of a town, and off to the right he caught the twinkling lights of a street car. Hagen, he said sharply, pull yourself together and listen to me. If you keep your mouth shut, you've nothing to fear. If you let out a word of what's happened tonight, you'll probably go to the chair for a crime you know nothing about. Do you understand? Keep your mouth shut. The car had stopped. Hagen nodded his head. All right, then. You get out here and take a street car into New York, continued Jimmy Dale crisply. But when you get there, keep away from your home for the next two or three hours. Hang around with some of the boys you know. And if you're asked anything afterwards, say you were batting around town all evening. Don't worry, you'll find you're out of this when you read the morning papers. Now get out. Hurry! He pushed Hagen from the car. I've got to make my own getaway. Hagen, standing in the road, brushed his hand bewilderingly across his eyes. Yes, but you. I... Never mind about that. Jimmy Dale leaned out and gripped Hagen's arm impressively. There's only one thing you've got to think of, or remember. Keep your mouth shut. No matter what happens, keep your mouth shut, if you want to save your neck. Good night, Hagen. 
The car was racing forward again. It shot streaking through the streets of the town ahead, and, dully over its own inferno, echoed shouts, cries, and execrations of an outraged populace, then out into the night again, roaring its way toward New York. He had half an hour, perhaps. It was a good thing Hagen did not know, or had not grasped the significance of that torn letter. The man would have been unmanageable with fear and excitement. It would puzzle Hagen to find no paper stuck under his table when he came to look for it, but that was a minor consideration. That mattered not at all. Half an hour. On roared the car. Towns, black roads, villages, wooded lands were kaleidoscopic in their passing. Half an hour. Had he done it? Had he come anywhere near doing it? He did not know. He was in the city at last, and now he had to moderate his speed. But by keeping to the less frequented streets, he could still drive at a fast pace. One piece of good fortune had been his. The long motor coat he had found in the car with which to cover the rags of Larry the Bat, and without which he would have been obliged to leave the car somewhere on the outskirts of the city, and to trust, like Mike Hagen, to other and slower means of transportation. Blocks away from Hagen's tenement, he ran the car into a lane, slipped off the motor coat, and from his own pocket whipped out the little metal insignia case, and in another moment a diamond-shaped gray seal was neatly affixed to the black ebony rim of the steering wheel. He smiled ironically. It was necessary, quite necessary, that the police should have no doubt as to who had been in Doyle's house with Connie Myers that night, or to whom they had so considerably loaned their automobile. He was running now, through lanes, dodging down side streets, taking every shortcut he knew. Had he beaten the police to Mike Hagen's room? It would be easy then. If they were ahead of him then, by some means or other, he must still get that paper first. He was at the tenement now, shuffling leisurely up the steps. The front door was open. He entered and went up the first flight of stairs, then along the hall, and up the next flight. He had half expected the place to be bustling with excitement over the crime, but the police evidently had kept the affair quiet, for he had seen no one since he had entered. But now, as he began to mount the third flight, he went more slowly. Someone was ahead of him. It was very dark. He could not see. The steps above died away. He reached the landing, started along for Hagen's room, and a light blazed suddenly in his face and a hard, quick grip on his shoulder forced him back against the wall. Then the flashlight wavered, glistened on brass buttons went out, and a voice laughed roughly. "'It's only Larry the Bat!' "'Larry the Bat, eh?' It was another voice, harsh and curt. "'What are you doing here?' He was not first, after all. The telephone message from Pelham, it was almost certainly that, had beaten him. They were ahead of him, just ahead of him. They had only been a few steps ahead of him going up the stairs, just a second ahead of him on their way to Hagen's room. Jimmy Dale was thinking fast now. He must go, too, to Hagen's room with them, somehow. There was no other way. There was Hagen's life at stake. Ah, uh, I ain't done nothing, he whined. I was just going to borrow the price of a feed from Mike Hagen. Let me go. Hagen, eh? snapped the questioner. Are you a friend of his? Sure I am. The officers whispered for a moment together. We'll try it, decided the one who appeared to be in command. We're in the dark anyhow, and the thing may be only a steer. Maybe it'll work. Anyway, it won't do any harm. His hand fell heavily on Jimmy Dale's shoulder. Mrs. Hagen know you? brusquely. Sure she does sniffled Larry the Bat. Good, rasped the officer. Well, we'll make the visit with you. And you do what you're told, or we'll put the screws on, you see? We're after something here, and you've blown the whole game, savvy? You've spilled the gravy, understand? In the darkness, Jimmy Dale smiled grimly. It was far more than he had dared to hope for. They were playing into his hands. "'But I don't know about any game,' 
growled Larry the Bat piteously. "'Who in hell said you did?' growled the officer. "'You're supposed to have snitched the lay to us, that's all. And mind you, play your part. Come on.' It was two doors down the hall to Mike Hagan's room, and there one of the officers, putting his shoulder to the door, burst it open and sprang in. The other shoved Jimmy Dale forward. It was quickly done. The three were in the room. The door was closed again. Came a cry of terror out of the darkness, a movement as of someone rising up hurriedly in bed, and then Mrs. Hagan's voice. "'What is it? Who is it? Mike!' The table. It was against the right-hand wall, Jimmy Dale remembered. He sidled quickly toward it. Strike a light, ordered the officer in charge. Jimmy Dale's fingers were feeling under the edge of the table. A quick sweep along it. Nothing. He stooped, reaching farther in. Another sweep of his arm, and his fingers closed on a sheet of paper and a piece of hard gum. In an instant they were in his pocket. A match crackled and flared up. A lamp was lighted. Larry the Bat sulked sullenly against the wall. Terror-stricken, wide-eyed, Mrs. Hagan had clutched the child lying beside her to her arms and was sitting bolt upright in bed. "'Now then, no fuss about it,' said the officer in charge, with brutal directness. "'You might as well make a clean breast of Mike's share in that murder downstairs.' Larry the Bat here has already told us the whole story. Come on, now, out with it. Murder? Her face went white. My Mike? Murder? She seemed for an instant stunned, and then down the worn, thin, haggard face gushed the tears. I don't believe it, she cried. I don't believe it. Come on, now, cut that out, prodded the officer roughly. I tell you, Larry the Bat here has opened everything up wide. You're only making it worse for yourself. Him? She was staring now at Jimmy Dale. Oh, God, she cried. So that's what you are. Are you a stool pigeon for the cops? Well, whatever you told them, you lie. You're the curse of this neighborhood, you are. And if my Mike is bad at all, it's you that helped to make him bad. But murder... You lie! She had risen slowly from the bed, a gaunt, pitiful figure, pitifully clothed, the black hair, gray-streaked, streaming thinly over her shoulders, still clutching the baby that, too, was crying now. The officers looked at one another and nodded. Guess she's handling it straight. We'll have a look on our own hook, the leader muttered. She paid no attention to them. She was walking straight to Jimmy Dale. "'It's you, is it?' she whispered fiercely through her sobs. "'That would bring more shame and ruin here. "'You that's selling my man's life away with your filthy lies for what they're paying you. "'It's you, is it, that—' her voice broke. "'There was a frightened, uneasy look in Larry the Bat's eyes. "'His lips were twitching weakly. "'He drew far back against the wall, "'and then, glancing miserably at the officers, "'as though entreating their permission,' began to edge toward the door. For a moment she watched him, her face white with outrage. Her hand clenched at her side, and then she found her voice again. "'Get out of here!' she said in a choked, strained way, pointing to the door. "'Get out of here, you dirty skate!' "'Sure,' mumbled Larry the Bat, his eyes on the floor. "'Sure,' he mumbled, and the door closed behind him. End of Part 1, Chapter 11C Recording by Roger Moline Part 2, Chapter 1 of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard Recording by Roger Moline Part Two, 
The Woman in the Case Chapter One Below the Deadline Whisperings, always whisperings, low, sibilant, floating errantly from all sides until they seemed a component part of the drug-laden atmosphere itself, and occasionally another sound, the soft slap-slap of loose-slippered feet, the faint rustle of equally loose-fitting garments, and everywhere the sweet, sickish smell of opium. It was Chang Fu's, simply a cellar or two deeper in Chang Fu's than that in which Dago Jim had quarreled once, and died. Larry the Bat, vicious-faced, unkempt, disreputable, lay sprawled out on one of the dive's bunks, an opium pipe beside him. But Larry the Bat was not smoking. Instead, his ear was pressed closely against the boarding that formed the rather flimsy partition at the side of the bunk. One heard many things in Chang Fu's if one cared to listen, if one could first win one's way through the carefully guarded gateway that to the uninitiated offered nothing more interesting than the entrance to a Chinese tea shop, and an uninviting one at that. Had he been followed in here? He had been shadowed for the last hour, of that at least he was certain. Why? By whom? For an hour he had dodged in and out through the dens of the underworld, as only one who was at home there and known to all could do, and at last he had taken refuge in Chang Fu's like a fox burrowing deep into its hole. Few could find their way into the most infamous opium den in all New York, where not only the poppy ruled as master, but where crime was hatched, aye, and carried to its ghastly consummation sometimes as well. And of those few, not one but was of the underworld itself, and it was that fact which held his muscles strained and rigid now under the miserable rags that covered them, and it was that which kept the keen, quick brain alert and active, every faculty keyed up and tense. If it were the police, he had little to fear, for they could not force their way in without warning. But if it were the underworld, he was in imminent peril, and had done little better than run himself into a trap from which there was no escape. Death to the Gray Seal! He had heard that whispered more than once in this very place. Who knew at what moment the role of Larry the Bat would be uncovered, and the underworld, where now he held so high a place, would be at his throat like a pack of snarling wolves? Who had been shadowing him during the last hour? Whisperings. Nothing tangible. He could catch no words, only the never-ending whisperings of gathered groups here and there, and sometimes the clink of coin where some game was in progress. The curtain before his bunk was drawn suddenly aside, and Larry the Bat's fingers, where his hand was carelessly hidden by his body, tightened upon his automatic. Smokey some more? The fingers relaxed. It was only Sam Waugh, one of the attendants. Nix, said Larry the Bat, in a slightly muddled tone. Got enough. The curtain fell into place again. Larry the Bat's lips said in a thin smile. Ultimately, it made little difference whether it was the police or the underworld. The smile grew thinner. It was the flip of a coin, that was all. With one, there was the death house at Sing Sing for the Gray Seal. With the other, well, there were many ways from a shot or a knife thrust in the open street, to his murder in some hidden dive like this of Chang Fu's, for instance, where he now was. The Gray Seal was responsible for the occupancy of too many penitentiary cells by those of the underworld to look for any other fate. He raised himself up sharply on his elbow. A shrill, high note like the scream of a parakeet rang out a second time. He tore the curtain aside and jumped to his feet, all around him, in the twinkling of an eye, Chinamen in fluttering blouses, chattering like magpies, mingled with snarling, cursing whites, were running madly. A voice, prefaced with an oath, bawled out behind him as he sprang forward and joined the rush. Beat it! The cops! Beat it! The police! A raid! Was it for him? From rooms, an amazing number of them, more forms rushed out, joined, divided, 
separated and dashed some this way, some that, along branching passageways. There had been raids before. The police had begun to change their minds about Chang Fu's, but Chang Fu's was not an easy place to raid. House after house in that quarter of Chinese laundries, of tea shops, of chop suey joints, opened one into the other through secret passages in the cellars. Larry the Bat plunged down a staircase and halted in the darkness of a cellar, drawing back against the wall while the flying feet of his fellow fugitives scurried by him. Was it for him, this raid? If not, the police had not a hope of getting him if he kept his head, for back in Chang Fu's proper, which would be quite closed off now, Chang Fu would be blandly submitting to arrest, offering himself as a sort of glorified sacrifice while the police confiscated opium and fantan layouts. If the police had no other purpose than that in mind, Chang Fu would simply pay a fine. The next night the place would be in full blast again, and Chang Fu, higher than ever in the confidence of the underworld's aristocracy, would reap his reward, and that would be all there was to it. But was that all? The raid had followed significantly close upon the heels of his entry into Chang Fu's. Larry the Bat began to move forward again. He dared not follow the others, and later on, when quiet was restored, issue out into the street from any one of the various houses in which he might temporarily have taken refuge. There was a chance in that a chance that the police might be more zealous than usual, even if he particularly was not their game, and he could take no chance. Arrest for Larry the Bat, even on suspicion, could have but one conclusion, not a pleasant one, the disclosure that Larry the Bat was not Larry the Bat at all, but Jimmy Dale, the millionaire club man, and to complete a fatal triplication that Larry the Bat and Jimmy Dale was the gray seal upon whose head was fixed a price. All was silence around him now, except that from overhead came occasionally the muffled tread of feet. He felt his way along into a black narrow passage, emerged into a second cellar, swept the place with a single circling gleam from a pocket flashlight, passed a stairway that led upward, reached the opposite wall, and dropping on hands and knees, crawled into what innocently enough appeared to be the opening of a coal bin. He knew Chang Fu's well, as he knew the ins and outs of every den and place he frequented, knew them as a man knows such things when his life at any moment might hang upon his knowledge. He was in another passage now, and this, in a few steps, brought him to a door. Here he halted and stood for a full five minutes, absolutely motionless, absolutely still, listening. There was nothing, not a sound. He tried the door cautiously. It was locked. The slim, sensitive, tapering fingers of Jimmy Dale, unrecognizable now in the grimy digits of Larry the Bat, felt tentatively over the lock. To fingers that seemed in their tips to possess all the human senses, that time and again in their delicate touch upon the dial of a safe had mocked at human ingenuity and driven the police into impotent frenzy, this was a pitiful thing. From his pocket came a small steel instrument that was quickly and deftly inserted in the keyhole. There was a click. The door swung open, and Jimmy Dale, alias Larry the Bat, stepped outside into a backyard half a block away from the entrance to Chang Fu's. Again he listened. There did not appear to be any unusual excitement in the neighborhood. From open windows above him and from adjoining houses came the ordinary, commonplace sounds of voices talking and laughing, even the queer, weird notes of a Chinese chant. He stole noiselessly across the yard, out into the lane, and made his way rapidly along to the cross street. In a measure now he was safe, but one thing, a very vital thing, remained to be done. It was absolutely necessary that he should know whether he was the quarry that the police had been after in the raid, if it was the police who had been shadowing him all evening. If it was the police, there was but one meaning to it. Larry the Bat was known to be the Gray Seal and a problem perilous enough in any aspect confronted him. 
Dare he risk the sanctuary for the clothes of Jimmy Dale? Or was it safer to burglarize, as he had once done before, his own mansion on Riverside Drive? His thoughts were running riot, and he frowned, angry with himself. There was time enough to think of that when he knew that it was the police against whom he had to match his wits. Well in the shadow of the buildings, he moved swiftly along the side street until he came to the corner of the street on which, halfway down the block, fronted Chang Fu's tea shop. A glance in that direction, and Jimmy Dale drew a breath of relief. A patrol wagon was backed up to the curb, and a half-dozen officers were busy loading it with what was evidently Chang Fu's far from meager stock of gambling appurtenances, while Chang Fu himself, together with Sam Waugh and another attendant, were in the grip of two other officers, waiting possibly for another patrol wagon. There was a crowd, too, but the crowd was at a respectful distance, on the opposite side of the street. Jimmy Dale still hugged the corner. A man swaggered out from a doorway, quite close to Chang Fu's, and came on along the street. As the other reached the corner, Jimmy Dale sidled forward. Hello, chick, he said out of the corner of his mouth. What's the lay? Hello, Larry, returned the caller. Ah, oh, nothing. The nutcracker on Chang, that's all. I thought maybe they was looking for some guy that was in there, observed Jimmy Dale. Nothing doing, the other answered. I was in there myself. The whole mob beat it clean, and the bulls never batted an eye. Didn't you's pipe make me get away outside Shanghai's a minute ago? De bulls never went nowhere except into Chang's. There's a new lieutenant in the precinct inaugurating himself, that's all. So long, Larry, I got a date. So long, chick, responded Jimmy Dale, and started slowly back along the cross street. It was not the police, then, who were interested in his movements. Then who? He shook his head with a little savage, impotent gesture. One thing was clear. It was too early to risk a return to the sanctuary and attempt the rehabilitation of Jimmy Dale. If anyone was on the hunt for Larry the Bat, the sanctuary would be the last place to be overlooked. He turned the next corner, hesitated a moment in front of a garishly lighted dance hall, and finally shuffled in through the door made his way across the floor, nodding here and there to the elite of gangland, and with a somewhat arrogant air of proprietorship, sat down at a table in the corner. Little better than a tramp in appearance, certainly the most disreputable-looking object in the place, even the waiter who approached him accorded him a certain curious deference. Was not Larry the Bat the most celebrated dope fiend below the deadline? Give me a mug of suds ordered Jimmy Dale, and sprawled royally back in his chair. Under the rim of his slouch hat, pulled now far over his eyes, he searched the faces around him. If he had been asked to pick the actors for a revel from the scum of the underworld, he could not have improved upon the gathering. There were perhaps a hundred men and women in the room, the majority dancing and, with the exception of a few sightseeing slummers, they were men and women whose acquaintance with the police was intimate, but not cordial, far from cordial. Jimmy Dale shrugged his shoulders and sipped at the glass that had been set before him. It was grimly ironic that he should be not only there, but actually a factor and a part of the underworld's intimate life. He, Jimmy Dale, a wealthy man, a member of New York's exclusive clubs, a member of New York's most exclusive society. It was inconceivable. He smiled sardonically. Was it? Well, then it was nonetheless true. His life unquestionably was one unique, apart from any other man's, but it was, for all that, actual and real. There had been three years of it now since she had come into his life. Jimmy Dale slouched down a little in his chair. The ice was thin, perilously thin, that he was skating on now. Each letter, with its demand upon him to match his wits against police or underworld, or against both combined, perhaps, 
made that peril a little greater, a little more imminent, if that were possible, when already his life was almost literally carried daily, hourly, in his hand. Not that he rebelled against it. It was worth the price that some day he expected he must pay, the price of honor, wealth, a name disgraced, ruin, death. Was he quixotic, immoderately so? He smiled gravely. Perhaps. But he would do it all over again if the choice were his. There were those who blessed the name of the gray seal as well as those who cursed it. And there was the toxin. Who was she? He did not know, but he knew that he had come to love her, come to care for her, and that she had come to mean everything in life to him. He had never seen her, to know her face. He had never seen her face, but he knew her voice. Aye, he had even held her for a moment, the moment of wildest happiness he had ever known, in his arms. That night when he had entered his library, his own particular den in his own house, and in the darkness had found her there, found her finally through no effort of his own, when he had searched so fruitlessly for years to find her, using every resource at his command to find her. And she, because she had come of her own volition, relying upon him, had held him in honor to let her go as she had come, without looking upon her face. Exquisite irony. But she had made him a promise then, that the work of the gray seal was nearly over, that soon there would be an end to the mystery that surrounded her, that he should know all, that he should know her. He smiled again, but it was a twisted smile on the mechanically misshapen lips of Larry the Bat. Nearly over. Who knew? That nearly might be too late. Even tonight he had been shadowed, was skulking even now in this place as a refuge. Who knew? Another hour, and the newsboys might be shrieking their, Extra! Extra! De Gray Seal caught! De millionaire Jimmy Dale! De Jekyll and Hyde of real life! Jimmy Dale straightened up suddenly in his seat. There was a shout, an oath bawled out high above the riot of noise, a chorus of feminine shrieks from across the room. What was the matter with the underworld tonight? He seemed fated to find nothing but centers of disturbance, first a raid at Chang Fu's, and now this. What was the matter here? They were stampeding toward him from the other side of the room. There was the roar of a revolver shot, another. Black Ike! He caught an instant's glimpse of the gunman's distorted face through the crowd. That was it, probably, a row over some mall. And then, as Jimmy Dale lunged up from his chair to his feet to escape the rush, pandemonium itself seemed to break loose. Yells, shots, screams, and oaths filled the air. The crowd surged this way and that. Tables were overturned and sent crashing to the floor. And then came sudden darkness, as some one of the attendants, in misguided excitability, switched off the lights. The darkness but served to increase the panic, not allay it. With a savage snap of his jaws, Jimmy Dale swung from his table in the corner with the intention of making his way out by a side door behind him. It was a case of the police again, and the patrolman outside would probably be pulling a riot call by now. And the police... He stopped suddenly, as though he had been struck. An envelope thrust there out of the darkness was in his hand, and her voice, hers, the toxins, was sounding in his ears. Jimmy, Jimmy, I've been trying all evening to catch you. Quick, get to the sanctuary and change your clothes. There's not an instant to lose. It's for my sake tonight. And then a surging mob was around him on every side, and pushing, jostling, half lifting him at times from his feet, carried him forward with its rush, and with him in its midst burst through the door and out into the street. End of Part 2, Chapter 1 Recording by Roger Moline Part Two, Chapter Two of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard Reading by Roger Moline Part 2 the woman in the case. Chapter 2. The Call to Arms. Not a sound as the key turned in the lock. Not a sound as the door swung back on its carefully oiled hinges. Not a sound as Larry the Bat slipped like a shadow into the blackness of the room, closing the door behind him again. With a tread as noiseless as a cat's, he was across the room to satisfy himself that the shutters were tightly closed. And then the single gas jet flared up, murky, yellow, illuminating the miserable squalid room, the sanctuary, the home of Larry the Bat. There was need for silence, need for caution. In five minutes, ten at the outside, he must emerge again as Jimmy Dale, with a smile on his lips that mingled curiously chagrin and self-commiseration, he took the letter from his pocket and tore it open. It was she, then, who had been following him all evening, and like a blundering idiot he had wasted precious, perhaps irreparable, hours. What had she meant by, It's for my own sake tonight? The words had been ringing in his ears since the moment she had whispered them in that panic-stricken crowd. Was it not always for her sake that he answered these calls to arms? Was it not always for her sake that he, as the gray seal, was? The mental soliloquy came to an abrupt end. He had subconsciously read the first sentence of the letter, and now, with sudden feverish eagerness and excitement, he was reading it to the last word. Dear Philanthropic Crook, In an hour after you receive this, if all goes well, you shall know everything, everything. Who I am? Yes, and my name. It has been more than three years now, hasn't it? It has been incomprehensible to you, but there has been no other way. I dared not take the chance of discovery by anyone. I dared not expose you to the risk of being known by me. Your life would not have been worth a moment's purchase. Oh, Jimmy, am I only making the mystery more mystifying? But tonight, I think, I hope, I pray that it is all at an end. Though against me and against you tonight when you go to help me is the most powerful and pitiless organization of criminals that the world has ever known, and the stake we are playing for is a fortune of millions and my life, and yet somehow I am afraid now, just because the end is so near and the victory seems so surely won. And so, Jimmy, be careful. Use all that wonderful cleverness of yours as you have never used it before, and... But there should be no need for that. It is so simple a thing that I am going to ask you to do. Why am I writing so illogically? Nothing, surely, can possibly happen. This is not like one of my usual letters, is it? I am beside myself tonight with hope, anxiety, fear, and excitement. Listen, then, Jimmy. Be at the northeast corner of Sixth Avenue and Waverly Place at exactly half-past ten. A taxi cab will drive up as though you had signaled it in passing, and the chauffeur will say, I've another fare in half an hour, sir, but I can get you most anywhere in that time. You will be smoking a cigarette. Toss it out into the street, make any reply you like, and get into the cab. Give the chauffeur that little ring of mine, with the crest of the bell and belfry, and the motto, Sonnez le Toxin, that you found the night old Isaac Polina was murdered, and the chauffeur will give you, in exchange, a sealed packet of papers. He will drive you to your home, and I will telephone to you there. I need not tell you to destroy this. Keep the appointment in your proper person, as Jimmy Dale. Carry nothing that might identify you as the Gray Seal if any accident should happen. 
And lastly, trust the pseudo-chauffeur absolutely. There was no signature. Her letters were never signed. He stood for a moment staring at the closely written sheets in his hand, a heightened color in his cheeks. His lips pressed tightly together, and then his fingers automatically began to tear the letter into pieces, and the pieces again into little shreds. Tonight. It was to be tonight, the end of all this mystery. Tonight was to see the end of this dual life of his, with its constant peril. Tonight, the gray seal was to exit from the stage forever. Tonight, a wonderful climax of the years, he was to see her. His blood was quickened now, his heart pounding in a faster beat. A mad elation, a fierce uplift was upon him. He thrust the torn bits of paper into his pocket hurriedly, stepped across the room to the corner, rolled back the oilcloth, and lifted up the loose plank in the flooring, so innocently dust-laden as, more than once, to have eluded the eyes of inquisitive visitors in the shape of police and plainclothes men from headquarters. From the space beneath, he removed a neatly folded pile of clothes, laid these on the bed, and began to undress. He was working rapidly now. Tiny pieces of wax were removed from his nostrils, from under his lips, from behind his ears. Water from a cracked pitcher poured into a battered tin basin, and mixed with a few drops of some liquid from a bottle which he procured from its hiding place under the flooring, banished the makeup stain from his face, his neck, his wrists, and hands as if by magic. It was a strange metamorphosis that had taken place. The coarse, brutal-featured, blear-eyed, leering countenance of Larry the Bat was gone, and in its place, clean-cut, square-jawed, clear-eyed was the face of Jimmy Dale. And where before had slouched a slope-shouldered, misshapen, flabby creature, a broad-shouldered form well over six feet in height now stood erect, and under the clean white skin the muscles of an athlete like knobs of steel played back and forth with every movement of his body. In the streaked and broken mirror, Jimmy Dale surveyed himself critically, methodically, and, with a nod of satisfaction, hastily donned the fashionably cut suit of tweeds upon the bed. He rummaged then through the ragged garments he had just discarded, transferred to his pockets a roll of bills and his automatic, and paused hesitantly, staring at the thin metal case like a cigarette case that he held in the palm of his hand. He shrugged his shoulders a little whimsically. It seemed strange, indeed, that he was through with that. He snapped it open. Within, between sheets of oil paper, lay the scores of little diamond-shaped, gray-colored adhesive paper seals, the insignia of the gray seal. Yes, it seemed strange that he was never to use another. He closed the case, gathered up the clothes of Larry the Bat, tucked the case in among them, and shoved the bundle into the hole under the flooring. All these things would have to be destroyed, but there was not time tonight. Tomorrow, or the next day, would do for that. What would it be like to live a normal life again, without the menace of danger lurking on every hand? without that grim slogan of the underworld, Death to the Gray Seal, or that savage fiat of the police, The Gray Seal, dead or alive, but the Gray Seal, forever ringing in his ears. What would it be like, this new life, with her? The thought was thrilling him again, bringing again that eager, exultant uplift. In an hour, one hour, and the barriers of years would be swept away, and she would be in his arms. It's for my sake tonight. His face grew suddenly tense as the words came back to him. That hour wasn't over yet. It was no hysterical exaggeration that had prompted her to call her enemies the most powerful and pitiless organization of criminals that the world had ever known. It was not the toxin's way to exaggerate. The words would be literally true. 
the very life that she had led for the three years that had gone stood out now as a grim proof of her assertion. Jimmy Dale replaced the flooring, carefully brushed the dust back into the cracks, spread the oilcloth into place, and stood up. Who and what was this organization? What was between it and the toxin? What was this immense fortune that was at stake? And what was this priceless packet that was so crucial, that meant victory now, I and her life too, she had said. The question swept upon him in a sort of breathless succession. Why had she not let him play a part in this? True, she had told him why, that she dared not expose him to the risk. Risk! Was there any risk that the Gray Seal had not taken, and at her instance? He did not understand. He smiled a little uncertainly as he reached up to turn out the gas. There were a good many things that he did not understand about the toxin. The room was in darkness, and with the darkness Jimmy Dale's mind centered on the work immediately before him. To enter the tenement where he was known and had an acknowledged right as Larry the Bat was one thing. For Jimmy Dale to be discovered there was quite another. He crossed the room, opened the door silently, stood for a moment listening, then stepped out into the black, musty, ill-smelling hallway, closing the door behind him. He stooped and locked it. The querulous cry of a child reached him from somewhere above, a murmur of voices muffled by closed doors from everywhere. How many families were housed beneath that sordid roof he had never known? only that there was miserable poverty there as well as vice and crime, only that Larry the Bat, who possessed a room all to himself, was as some lordly and super-being to these fellow-tenants who shared theirs with so many that there was not air enough for all to breathe. He had no doors to pass. His was next to the staircase. He began to descend. They could scream and shriek, those stairs like aged humans, twisted and rheumatic, at the least ungentle touch. But there was no sound from them now. There seemed something almost uncanny in the silent tread. Stair after stair he descended, his entire weight thrown gradually upon one foot before the other was lifted. The strain upon the muscles, trained and hardened as they were, told. As he moved from the bottom step, he wiped little beads of perspiration from his forehead. The door now that gave on the alleyway. He opened it, slipped outside, darted across the narrow lane, stole along where the shadows of the fence were blackest, paused, listening, as he reached the end of the alleyway to assure himself that there was no nearby pedestrian and stepped out into the street. He kept on along the block turned onto the Bowery, and, under the first lamp, consulted his watch. It was a quarter past ten. He could make it easily in a leisurely walk. He continued on up the Bowery, finally crossed to Broadway, and shortly afterward turned into Waverly Place. At the corner of Fifth Avenue he consulted his watch again, and now he lighted a cigarette. Sixth Avenue was only a block away. At precisely half-past ten, to the second, he halted on the designated corner, smoking nonchalantly. A taxicab, coincidentally coming from an uptown direction, swung into the curb. "'Taxi, sir? Yes, sir?' Then, with an admirable mingling of eagerness to secure the fare and a fear that his confession might cause him the loss of it, I've another fare in half an hour, sir, but I can get you most anywhere in that time. Jimmy Dale's cigarette was tossed carelessly into the street. St. James Club, he said curtly, and stepped into the cab. The cab started forward, turned the corner, and headed along Waverly Place toward Broadway. The chauffeur twisted around in his seat in a matter-of-fact way, as though to ask further directions. "'Have you anything for me?' he inquired casually. It lay where it always lay, that ring, between the folds of that little white glove in his pocketbook. 
Jimmy Dale took it out now and handed it silently to the chauffeur. The other's face changed instantly. Composure was gone, and a quick, strained look was in its place. "'I'm afraid I've been watched,' he said tersely. "'Look behind you, will you, and tell me if you see anything?' Jimmy Dale glanced backward through the little window in the hood. "'There's another taxi just turned in from Sixth Avenue,' he reported the next instant. "'Keep your eye on it,' instructed the chauffeur shortly. The speed of the cab increased sensibly. With a curious tightening of his lips, Jimmy Dale settled himself in his seat so that he could watch the cab behind. There was trouble coming. Intuitively he sensed that and, he reflected bitterly, he might have known. It was too marvelous, too wonderful ever to come to pass that this one hour, the thought of which had fired his blood and made him glad beyond any gladness life had ever held for him before, should bring its promised happiness. "'Where's the cab now?' the chauffeur flung back over his shoulder. They had passed Fifth Avenue and were nearing Broadway. "'About the same distance behind,' Jimmy Dale answered. "'That looks bad,' the chauffeur gritted between his teeth. "'We'll have to make sure. I'll run down Lower Broadway.' "'If you think we're followed,' suggested Jimmy Dale quietly, "'why not run uptown and give them the slip somewhere where the traffic is thick? Lower Broadway at this time of night is as empty and deserted as our country road.' The chauffeur's sudden laugh was mirthless. "'My God, you don't know what you're talking about,' he burst out. "'If they're following, all hell couldn't throw them off the track. "'And I've got to know, I've got to be sure before I dare make a move tonight. "'I couldn't tell up in the crowded districts if I was followed, could I? "'They won't come out into the open until their hands are forced.' "'The car swerved sharply, rounded the corner, and speeding up faster and faster, began to tear down Lower Broadway. "'Watch! Watch!' cried the chauffeur. There was no word between them for a moment. Then Jimmy Dale spoke crisply. "'It's turned the corner. It's coming this way!' The taxicab was rocking violently with the speed. Silent, empty, Lower Broadway stretched away ahead. Apart from an occasional streetcar, probably there would be nothing between them and the battery. Jimmy Dale glanced at his companion's face as a light, flashing by, threw it into relief. It was set and stern, even a little haggard. But, too, there was something else there, something that appealed instantly to Jimmy Dale, a sort of bulldog grit that dominated it. "'If he holds our speed, we'll know,' the chauffeur was shouting now to make himself heard over the roar of the car. "'Look again. Where is it now?' Once more, Jimmy Dale looked through the little rear window. The cab had been a block behind them when it had turned the corner, and he watched it now in a sort of grim fascination. There was no possible doubt of it. The two bobbing, bouncing headlights were creeping steadily nearer. And then a sort of unnatural calm settled upon Jimmy Dale, and his hand went mechanically to his pocket to feel his automatic there as he turned again to the chauffeur. "'If you've got any more speed, you'd better use it,' he said significantly. The man shot a quick look at him. "'They are following us? You are sure?' "'Yes,' said Jimmy Dale. The chauffeur laughed again in that mirthless, savage way. "'Lean over here where I can talk to you,' he rasped out. "'The game's up, as far as I'm concerned, I guess. But there's a chance for you. They don't know you in this.' "'Give her more speed, or dodge into a cross street,' suggested Jimmy Dale coolly. "'They haven't got us yet by a long way.' The other shook his head. "'It's not only that cab behind,' he answered through set lips. "'You don't know what we're up against. "'If they're really after us, there's a trap laid in every section of this city, the devils. "'It's the package they want.' Thank God for the presentiment that made me leave it behind. I was going back for it, you understand, if I was satisfied that we weren't followed. Listen. There's a chance for you. There's none for me. That package. 
Remember this. No one else knows where it is, and it's life and death to the one who sent you here. It's in box 428 at... My God, look! Look there! he yelled, and with a wrench at the wheel, sent the taxi lurching and staggering for the car tracks in the center of the street. The scene, fast as thought itself, was photographing itself in every detail upon Jimmy Dale's brain. From the cross street ahead, one from each corner, two motor cars had nosed out into Broadway, blocking the road on both sides. And now the car on the left-hand side was moving forward across the tracks to counteract the chauffeur's move, deliberately ensuring a collision. There was no chance, no further room to turn, no time to stop. The man driving the other car jumped for safety. They would be into it in an instant. Box 428, Jimmy pleaded fiercely. Go on, man. Go on. Finish. Yes, cried the chauffeur. John Johansson at... But Jimmy Dale heard no more. There was the crash of impact as the taxicab plowed into the car that had been so craftily maneuvered in front of it, and Jimmy Dale lifted from his feet, was hurled violently forward with the shock, and all went black before his eyes. End of Part 2, Chapter 2 Recording by Roger Moline Part 2, Chapter 3 of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard Reading by Roger Moline Part 2. The Woman in the Case Chapter 3. The Crime Club For what length of time he had remained unconscious, Jimmy Dale had not the slightest idea. He regained his senses to find himself lying on a couch in a strange room that had a most exquisitely brass-wrought dome light in the ceiling. That was what attracted his attention, because the light hurt his eyes, and his head was already throbbing as though a thousand devils were beating a diabolical tattoo upon it. He closed his eyes against the light. Where was he? What had happened? Oh, yes, he remembered now. That smash on Lower Broadway. He had been hurt. He moved first one limb and then another tentatively, and was relieved to find that, though his body ached as if it had been severely shaken, and his head was bad, he had apparently escaped without serious injury. Where was he? In a hospital? His fingers, resting at his side upon the couch, supplied him with the information that it was a very expensive couch, upholstered in finest leather. If he were in a hospital, he would be in a cot. He opened his eyes again to glance curiously around him. The room was quite in keeping with the artistic lighting fixture and the refined, if expensive, taste that was responsible for the couch. A heavy, velvet rug of rich, dark green was bordered by a polished hardwood floor. Panelings of dark green frieze and beautifully grained woodwork made the lower walls, while above, on a background of some soft-toned paper, hung a few and evidently choice oil paintings. There was a big, inviting lounging chair, a massive writing table, or, more properly, a desk of walnut, and behind the desk, his back half-turned, apparently intent upon a book, sat a man in immaculate evening dress. Jimmy Dale closed his eyes again. There was something reassuring about it all, comfortably reassuring. Though why there should be any occasion for a feeling of reassurance at all, he could not for the moment make out. And then, in a sudden flash, the details of the night came back to him. The toxin's letter, the package he was to get, the taxi cab, the chauffeur who was not a chauffeur, the chase, the trap. He lay perfectly still. It was the professional Jimmy Dale now whose brain, in spite of the throbbing, brutally aching head, was at work, keen, 
alert. The chauffeur! What had happened to him? Had the man been killed in the auto smash? Or, less fortunate than himself, fallen into the hands of those whose power he seemed both to fear and rate so highly? And that package! Box! What was the number? Yes, 428. What did that mean? What box? Where was it? Who was John Johansson? He hadn't heard any more than that. The smash had come then. And lastly, he was back again to the same question he had begun with. Where was he now himself? It looked as though some good Samaritan had picked him up. Who was this gentleman so quietly reading there at the desk? Jimmy Dale opened his eyes for the third time. How still! how absolutely silent the room was. He studied the man's back speculatively for a moment, then his gaze traveled on past the man to the wall, riveted there, and his fingers, without movement of his arm, pressed against the outside of his coat pocket. He thought as much. His automatic was gone. Not a muscle of Jimmy Dale's face moved. His eyes shifted to a picture on the wall. The man was watching him, not reading. Just above the level of the desk, a small mirror held the couch in focus, but equally it held the man in focus, and Jimmy Dale had seen the other's eyes through a black mask that covered the face to the top of the upper lip, fixed intently upon him. There was a chill now where before there had been reassurance, something ominous in the very quiet and refinement of the room and Jimmy Dale smiled inwardly in bitter irony. His good Samaritan wore a mask. His self-congratulations had come too soon. Whatever had happened to the chauffeur, it was evident enough that he himself was caught. What was it the chauffeur had said? Something about a chance through being unknown? Was it to be a battle of wits, then? God, if his head did not ache so frightfully! It was hard to think with the brain half sick with pain. Those two eyes shining in that mirror. There seemed something horribly specter-like about it. He did not look again, but he knew they were there. It was like a cat watching a mouse. Why did not the man speak, or move, or do something? And he turned his head slowly. The man was laughing in a low, amused way. "'You appear to be taken with that picture,' observed a pleasant voice. "'Perhaps you recognize it from there. It is a Corot. Jimmy Dale, with a well-simulated start, sat up, and, with another quite as well-simulated, stared at the masked man. The other had laid down his book, and swung around in his chair to face the couch. Jimmy Dale stood up a little shakily. Look here, he said awkwardly. I, I don't quite understand. I remember that my taxi got into a smash-up, and I suppose I have to thank you for the assistance you must have rendered me. Only, as I say, he looked in a puzzled way around the room, and in an even more perplexed way at the mask on the other's face. I must confess I am at a loss to understand quite the meaning of this. Suppose that instead of trying to understand, you simply accept things as you find them. The voice was soft, but there was a finality in it, that its blandness only served to make the more suggestive. Jimmy Dale drew himself up and bowed coldly. I beg your pardon, he said. I did not mean to intrude. I have only to thank you again, then, and bid you a good night. The lips behind the mask parted slightly in a politely deprecating smile. "'There is no hurry,' said the man, a sudden sharpness creeping into his tones. "'I am sorry that the rule I apply to you does not work both ways. For instance, I might be quite at a loss to account for your presence in that taxicab.' Jimmy Dale's smile was equally polite, equally deprecating. 
I fail to see how it could be of the slightest possible interest to you, he replied. However, I have no objection to telling you. I hailed the taxi at the corner of Sixth Avenue and Waverly Place, told the chauffeur to drive me to the St. James Club, and— The St. James Club, broke in the other coldly, is, I believe, north, not south of Waverly Place, and on Broadway not at all. Jimmy Dale stared at the other for an instant in patient annoyance. "'I am quite well aware of that,' he said stiffly. "'Nevertheless, I told the man to drive me to the St. James Club. "'We came across Waverly Place, but on reaching Broadway, "'instead of turning uptown, he suddenly whirled in the other direction "'and sent the car flying at full speed down lower Broadway. "'I shouted at the man. "'I don't know yet whether he was drunk or crazy or... "'Jimmy Dale's eyes fixed disdainfully on the other's mask whether there might not, after all, have been method in his madness. I can only say that before we had gone more than two or three blocks, a wild effort on his part to avoid a collision with an auto swinging out from a side street resulted in an even more disastrous smash with another on the other side, and I was knocked senseless. Victim, I presume, is the idea you desire to convey, observed the other evenly. You were quite the victim of circumstance, as it were. Jimmy Dale's eyebrows lifted slightly. It would appear to be fairly obvious, I should say. Very clever, commented the man. But now, suppose we remove the buttons from the foils. His voice rasped suddenly. You are quite as well aware as I am that what has happened tonight was not an accident nor, in case the possibility may have occurred to you, are the police any the wiser, save for the existence of two wrecked cars on Lower Broadway, and another which escaped, and for which doubtless they are still searching assiduously. The ownership of the taxicab you so inadvertently entered they will have no difficulty in establishing. You, perhaps, however, are in a better position than I am to appreciate the fact that the establishment of its ownership will lead them nowhere. As I understand it, the man who drove you tonight obtained the loan of the cab from one of the company's chauffeurs in return for a hundred-dollar bill. Am I right? In view of what has happened, admitted Jimmy Dale simply, I should not be surprised. There was a sort of sardonic admiration in the other's laugh. As for the other car, he went on, I can assure you that its ownership will never be known. When the nearest patrolman rushed up, there were no survivors of the disaster, save those in the third car, which he was powerless to stop, which accounts for your presence here. You will admit that I have been quite frank. Oh, quite, said Jimmy Dale, a little wearily. But would you mind telling me what all this is leading to? The man had been leaning forward in his chair, one hand, palm downward, resting lightly on the desk. He shifted his hand now suddenly to the arm of his chair. This, he said, and on the desk where his hand had been lay the toxin's gold signet ring. Jimmy Dale's face expressed mild curiosity. He could feel the other's eyes boring into him. We were speaking of ownership, said the man, in a low, menacing tone. I want to know where the woman who owns this ring can be found tonight. There was no play, no trifling here. The man was in deadly earnest. But it seemed to Jimmy Dale, even with the sense of peril more imminent with every instant, that he could have laughed outright in savage mockery at the irony of the question. Where was she? Even who was she? And this was the hour in which he was to have known. May I look at it? he requested calmly. The other nodded, but his eyes never left Jimmy Dale. It will give you an extra moment or so to frame your answer, he said sarcastically. Jimmy Dale ignored the thrust, picked up the ring, examined it deliberately, and set it back again on the table. Since I do not know who owns it, he said, I cannot answer your question. 
No? Well, then, there is still another matter, a little package that was in the taxicab with you. Where is that? See here, said Jimmy Dale irritably. This has gone far enough. I have seen no package, large or small, or of any description whatever. You are evidently mistaking me for someone else. You have only to telephone the St. James Club. He reached toward his pocket for his card case. My name is... Dale, supplied the other curtly. Don't bother about the card, Mr. Dale. We have already taken the liberty of searching you. He rose abruptly from his chair. I am afraid you do not quite realize your position, Mr. Dale, he said with an ominous smile. Let me make it clear. I do not wish to be theatrical about this, but we do not temporize here. You will either answer both of those questions to my satisfaction, or you will never leave this place alive. Jimmy Dale's face hardened. His eyes met the other's steadily. Ah, uh, I think I begin to see, he said caustically. When I have been thoroughly frightened, I shall be offered my freedom at a price. A sort of up-to-date game of hold-up. The penalty of being a wealthy man. If you had named your figure to begin with, we would have saved a lot of idle talk, and you would have had my answer the sooner. Nothing. Do you know, said the other, in a grimly musing way, there has always been one man, but only one until now, that I have wished I might add to my present associates. I refer to the so-called Gray Seal. Tonight there are two. I pay you the compliment of being the other, but, he was smiling ominously again, we are wasting time, Mr. Dale. I am willing to expose my hand to the extent of admitting that the information you are withholding is infinitely more valuable to me than the mere reeking of reprisal upon you for refusal to talk. Therefore, if you will answer, I pledge you my word you will be free to leave here within five minutes. If you refuse, you are already aware of the alternative. Well, Mr. Dale? Who was this man? Jimmy Dale was studying the other's chin, the lips, the white, even teeth, the jet-black hair. Some day the tables might be turned. Could he recognize again this cool, imperturbable ruffian who so callously threatened him with murder? Well, Mr. Dale, I am waiting. I am not a magician said Jimmy Dale contemptuously. I could not answer your questions if I wanted to. The other's hand slid instantly to a row of electric buttons on the desk. Very well, Mr. Dale, he said quietly. You do not believe, I see, that I would dare to carry my threat into execution. You perhaps even doubt my power. I shall take the trouble to convince you. I imagine it will stimulate your memory. The door opened. Two men were standing on the threshold, both in evening dress, both masked. The man behind the desk came forward, took Jimmy Dale's arm almost courteously, and led him from the room out into a corridor, where he halted abruptly. I want to call your attention first, Mr. Dale, to the fact that as far as you are concerned, you neither have now, nor ever will have, any idea whether you are in the heart of New York or fifty miles away from it. Now, listen. Do you hear anything? There was nothing. Only the strange silence of that other room was intensified now. There was not a sound. Stillness, such as it seemed to Jimmy Dale he had never experienced before, was around him. You may possibly infer from the silence that you are not in the city suggested the other after a moment's pause i leave you to your own conclusions in that respect the cause however of the silence is internal not external we had soundproof principles in mind to a perhaps exaggerated degree when this building was constructed if you care to do so 
You have my permission to shout, say, for help, to your heart's content. We shall make no effort to stop you. Jimmy Dale shrugged his shoulders. He was staring down a brilliantly lighted, richly carpeted corridor. There were doors on one side, windows on the other, the windows all hung with heavy, closely drawn portieres. The corridor was certainly not on the ground floor, but whether it was on the second or third or even above that again, he had no means of knowing. From appearances, though, the place seemed more like a large, private mansion than anything else. "'Just one word before we proceed,' continued the other. "'I do not wish you to labor under any illusion. "'Here we are frankly criminals. "'This is our home. "'It should have some effect in impressing you "'with the power and resource at our command, "'and also with the class of men with whom you are dealing. "'There is not one among us "'whose education is not fully equal to your own. "'Not one. "'Indeed, but who is chosen, granting first his criminal tendencies, because he is a specialist in his own particular field, in commerce, in the government diplomatic service, in the professions of law and medicine, in the ranks of pure science. We are bordering on the fantastical, are we not? Dreaming, you will probably say, of the utopian in crime organization. Quite so, Mr. Dale. I only ask you to consider the possibilities, if what I say is true. Now, let us proceed. I am going to take you into three rooms, the three whose doors you see ahead of you. You will notice that, including the one you have just left, there are four on this corridor. I do not wish to strain your credulity or play tricks upon you, so I am going to ask you to fix an approximate idea of the length of the corridor in your mind as it will perhaps enable you to account more readily for what may appear to be a discrepancy in the corresponding size of the rooms. One of the men opened the door ahead. Jimmy Dale, at a sign from his conductor, moved forward and entered. Just what he had expected to find he could not have told. His brain was whirling, partly from his aching head, partly from his desperate effort to conceive some way of escape from the peril which, for all his nonchalance, he knew only too well was the gravest he had ever faced. But what he saw was simply a cozily furnished bedroom. There was nothing peculiar about it, nothing out of the way, except perhaps that it was rather narrow, and then, suddenly, rubbing his eyes involuntarily, he was staring in a dazed way before him. The whole right-hand side of the wall was sinking without a sound into the floor, increasing the width of the room by some five or six feet, and in this space was disclosed what appeared to be a sort of chemical laboratory, elaborately equipped, extending the entire length of the room. The wall is purely a matter of mechanical construction, operated hydraulically, the man was speaking softly at Jimmy Dale's side. The room beneath is built to correspond. The base, ceiling, and wall moldings here do not have to be very ingenious to effect a disguise. I might say, however, that few visitors, other than yourself, have ever seen anything here but a bedroom. He waved his hand toward the retorts, the racks of test tubes, the hundred and one articles that strewed the laboratory bench. As for this, its purpose is twofold. We, as well as the police, have often need of analysis. We make it. If we require a drug, a poison, say, we compound it from its various ingredients, or, as the case may be, distill it, perhaps. It is, you will agree, somewhat more difficult to trace to its source if procured that way. And, speaking of poisons, he stepped forward and lifted a glass-stoppered bottle containing a colorless liquid from its shelf. In a modest way, we have even done some original research work here. This, for instance, is as utopian from our standpoint as the formation and personnel of the organization I have briefly outlined to you. It possesses very essential qualities. It is almost instantaneous in its action. 
requires a very small quantity and defies detection even by autopsy. He uncorked the bottle and dipped in a long glass rod. Will you watch the experiment? he invited with a sort of ghastly pleasantry. I do not want you to accept anything on trust. With a start, Jimmy Dale swung around. He had heard no sound, but another man was at his elbow now, and struggling in the man's hand was a little white rabbit. It was over in an instant. A single drop in the rabbit's mouth, and the animal had stiffened out, a lifeless thing. It is quite as effective on the human organism, continued the other. Only, instead of one drop, three are required. If I make it ten, he was carefully measuring the liquid into two wine glasses, it is only that even you may be satisfied that the quantity is fatal. He filled up the glasses with what was apparently wine of some description, which he poured from a decanter, and held out the glasses in front of him. And again Jimmy Dale started. Again he had heard no one enter, and yet two men had stepped forward from behind him and had taken the glasses from their leader's hands. He glanced around him, counting quickly. They were surely the two who had entered with him from the corridor. No! Including the leader, there were now six men, all in evening dress, all masked in the room with him. A wave of the leader's hand, and the two men holding the glasses left the room. The man turned to Jimmy Dale again. "'Shall we proceed to the second room, Mr. Dale?' he asked politely. "'I think it is now prepared for us. I do not wish to bore you with the repetition of magical sliding walls.' There was something now that numbed the ache in Jimmy Dale's brain, a sense of some deadly, remorseless thing that seemed to be constantly creeping closer to him, clutching at him, to smother him, to choke him. There was something absolutely fiendish, terrifying in the veneer of culture around him. They had entered the second room. This, like the other, was a pseudo-bedroom, but here the movable wall was already down. Ranged along the right-hand side were a great number of cabinets that slid in and out, much after the style and fashion used by clothing dealers to stock and display their wares. These cabinets were now all opened, displaying hundreds of costumes of all kinds and descriptions, and evidently complete to the minutest detail. The cabinets were flanked by full-length mirrors at each end of the room, and on little tables before the mirrors was an assortment that none better than Jimmy Dale himself could appreciate of make-up accessories. The man smiled apologetically. I am afraid this is rather uninteresting, he said. I have shown it to you simply that you may understand that we are alive to the importance of detail. Disguise that is daily vital to us is an art that depends essentially on detail. I venture to say we could impersonate any character or type or nationality or class in the United States at a moment's notice. But, he took Jimmy Dale's arm again and conducted him out into the corridor, while the two men, who were evidently acting the role of guards, followed closely behind. There is still the third room, here. He halted Jimmy Dale before the door. I have asked you to answer two questions, Mr. Dale, he said softly. I ask you now to remember the alternative. They still stood before the door. There was that uncanny silence again. It seemed to Jimmy Dale to last interminably. Neither of the three men surrounding him moved nor spoke. Then the door before him was opened on an unlighted room, and he was led across the threshold. He heard the door close behind him. The lights came on, and then it seemed as though he could not move, as though he were rooted to the spot, and the color ebbed from his face. Three figures were before him, the two men who had carried the glasses from the first room, and the chauffeur who had driven him in the taxicab. The two men still held the glasses, 
the chauffeur was bound hand and foot in a chair. One of the glasses was empty. The other was still significantly full. Jimmy Dale, with a violent effort at self-control, leaned forward. The man in the chair was dead. End of Part 2, Chapter 3 Recording by Roger Moline Part 2, Chapter 4 of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard Reading by Jacob Cherry Part 2, The Women in the Case Chapter 4, The Innocent Bystander There was not a sound. That stillness, weird, unnerving, that permeated, as it were, everywhere through that mysterious house was, if that were possible, accentuated now. The four masked men in evening dress, five including their leader, for the man who had appeared in that other room with the rabbit was not here, were as silent as motionless as the dead man who was lashed there in the chair. And to Jimmy Dale it seemed at first, as though his brain, stunned and stupefied at the shock, refused its functions and left him groping blindly, vaguely, with only sort of a dull subconscious realization of menace and deadly peril imminent hanging over him. He tried to rouse himself mentally, to prod his brain to action, to pit it in a fight for life against these self-confessed criminals and murderers with their mask of culture who surrounded him now. Was there a way out? What was it the toxin had said, the most powerful and pitiless organization of criminals the world has ever known? The stake a fortune of millions, her life? There had indeed been no overemphasis in the words she had used. They had taken pains themselves to make that ominously clear, these men. Every detail of the strange house, with its luxurious furnishings, its cleverly contrived appointments, breathed a horribly suggestive degree of power. A deadly purpose and an organization swayed by a mastermind and grim evidence of the merciless, inexorable link to which they would go was the ghastly white face of the dead chauffeur bound hand and foot in the chair before him. That empty glass in the hand of one of the men, he could not take his eyes from it, except as his eyes were drawn magnetically to that full glass in the hand of one of the others. What height of sardonic irony. He was to drink that other glass to die because he refused to answer questions that for years, with every resource at his command, risking his liberty, his wealth, his name, his life, with everything that he cared for thrown into the scales, he had struggled to solve and failed. And then the leader spoke. Mr. Dale, he said with cold significance, I regret to admit that your pseudo-taxicab driver was so ill-advised as to refuse to answer the same questions that I have put to you. Five to one, that was the only way out, and it was hopeless. It was the only way out because, convinced that he could answer those questions if he wanted to, these men were in deadly earnest. It was hopeless because they were five to one and probably there was many more, twice or three times as many more, within call. But what did it matter? How many more there were? He could fight until he was overpowered. That was all he could do, and the five could accomplish that. Still, if he could knock the full glass out of the man's hand and gain the door, then perhaps he turned quickly as the door opened. It was as though they had read his thoughts, a number of men were grouped outside in the corridor. Then the door closed again, with a cordon ranged against it inside the room, and at the same instant his arms and wrists were caught in a powerful grasp by the two men immediately behind him, who all along had enacted the role of guards. 
Again the leader spoke. I will repeat the questions, he said sharply. Where is the woman whose ring was found on that man there in the chair? And where is the package that you two men had with you in the taxicab tonight? Jimmy Dale glanced from the tall, straight, immaculately clothed figure of the speaker, from the threatening smile on the set lips that just showed under the edge of the mask, to the dead man in the chair. He had faced the prospect of death before many times, but it had come in the heat of passions accompanying it. It had come quickly, abruptly, with every faculty called into action to combat it, without time to dwell upon it, to sift, weigh, or measure its meaning, and if there had been fear, it had been subordinate to other emotions. But it was different now. He could not, of course, answer those questions, nor, he was doggedly conscious, would he have answered them if he could. And there was no middle course. Death, within the next few moments, stared him in the face, and it seemed curiously irrelevant that, in a sort of unnatural calmness, he should be attempting to analyze his feeling and emotions concerning it. All his life it had seemed to him that the acme of human mental torture was the cell of a condemned criminal, with the horror of its hopelessness, with the time to dwell upon it, and that the acme of that torture itself must be that awful moment immediately preceding execution, when anticipation at last was to merge into soul-sickening reality. Strange that thought should come. Strange that he should be framing a brain picture of such a scene. Vivid, minute in detail. No, not strange. He was picturing himself. The analogy was not perfect. It was true. He had not had the months, weeks, days, and hours of suspense. But it was perfect enough to bring home to him with appalling force the realization of his position. He was standing as a condemned man might stand in those last, final moments, those moments which he had imagined must be the most terrible that could exist in life, but that dismay of soul, the horror, the terror were not his. There was instead a smoldering fury, a passionate amazement that was his own life that was threatened. It seemed impossible that it could be his voice that was speaking now in such quiet, measured tones. Is it worthwhile? Will it convince you now, any more than before, to repeat that there is some mistake here? I am no more able to answer your questions than you are yourselves. I never saw that man in the chair there in my life until the moment that I hailed him in this cab tonight. I do not know who the woman is to whom that ring belongs, much less do I know where she is. And if there was a package of any sort in the taxi cab, as you state, I never saw it. The lips under the mask curved into a lapine smile. Think well, Mr. Dale. The man's voice was low menacing. Ethically, if you so choose to consider it, your refusal may be the act of a brave man. Practically, it's the act of a fool. Now your answer. I have answered you, said Jimmy Dale, and relaxing the muscles in his arms, let them hang limply for an instant in the grip of the two men behind him. I have no other answer. It was only a sign, a motion of the leader's hand, but with it, quick as a lightning flash, Jimmy Dale was in action. The limp arms tautened into steel as he wrenched them loose and whirling around, he whipped his fist into the chin of one of the two guards. In an instant, with a blow as the man staggered backwards, the room was in pandemonium. There was a rush from the door, and two, three, four leaping forms hurled themselves upon Jimmy Dale. He shook them off, and they came again. There was no chance, ultimately. He knew that. It was only the elemental within him that rose in fierce revolt at the thought of tame submission that bade him sell his life as dearly as he could. Panting, gasping for breath, dragging them by sheer strength as they clung to him, he got his back to the wall, fighting with the savage fury and abandon of a wild cat, but it could not last. Where one man went down before him, two remorselessly appeared. The room seemed filled with men. They poured in through the door. He laughed at them in a half-demented way. More and more of them came. There was no play for his arms, no room to fight. They seemed so close around him, so many of them upon him. 
that he could not breathe, and he was bending, being crushed down by as an intolerable weight. And then his feet were jerked from beneath him. He crashed to the floor, and in another moment, bound hand and foot, he was tied into a chair beside that other chair, whose grim occupant sat in such a ghastly apathy of the scene. The room cleared instantly of all but the original five. His head was drawn suddenly, violently backward, and clamped in that position, and a metal instrument forced into his mouth while his lips bled at, in their resistance, pried jaws apart and held them open. One drop, the leader ordered curtly. The man with the full glass bent over him and dipped a glass rod into the liquid. The drop glistened a ruby red at the end of the rod, and fell with a sharp, acrid, burning sensation upon Jimmy Dale's tongue. For a moment, Jimmy Dale's animation, mental and physical, seemed swept away from him as, it were, a hiatus of hideous suspense. What was it to be like this passing? Why did it not act at once as it acted on the rabbit they had showed him in the other room? Yes, he remembered. It took more than one drop for a man, and besides... This was diluted. One drop had no effect on a man that required, Good God, one drop even of this was enough? He strained forward in the chair until the sweat in great beads sprang from his forehead, strained and fought and tore at his bonds in a paroxysm of madness to free himself while there still remained a little strength. There was something filming before his eyes, a numbed feeling that was creeping through his limbs, robbing them, zapping them of their vitality and power. He felt himself slipping away into a state of utter weakness, and his brain began to grow confused. A voice seemed to float in the air near him. For the last time, will you answer? With a supreme effort, Jimmy Dale strove to rally his tottering senses. Did they not understand the stupendous mockery of their questions? Did they not understand that he did not know? He had told them so, perhaps. He had better tell them so again. I... He tried to speak and found the words thick upon his tongue. I do not know. The glass itself was thrust abruptly between his lips. Some of the contents spilled and trickled upon his chin, and then a flood of it, burning fury, poured down his throat. A flood of it, and it needed but three drops, and there had been ten in the glass. So this was death, a hazy, nebulous thing. There was no pain. It was like, like nothingness. And out of nothingness, she came. Strange that she should come. Alone she had fought these fiends and outwitted them for how long was it? Three years? She would be more than ever alone now. Pray God she did not finally fall under their clutches. How it burned now, that fatal draw they had forced down his throat, and how it gripped at him and seemed to eat and bore its way into the very tissues. It was the end, and no, it was stimulating him. Strength seemed to be returning to his limbs. It seemed as though he was being carried, as though the bonds about him were being loosened. And now his brain seemed to be growing clearer. He roused up with a startled exclamation. He was back in the same room in which he had first returned to consciousness after the accident. He was on the same couch. The same masked figure was at the same desk. Had he been dreaming? Was this only some horrible, ghastly nightmare through which he had passed? No, it had been real enough. His clothes, rent and torn, and the blood upon his hands, where the skin had been scraped from his knuckles in the fight, bore evidence to that. He must have lost consciousness for a while, though it seemed to him that at no moment... Hazy, irrational though his brain might have been, had he become entirely oblivious to what was taking place around him. And yet it must have been so. The eyes from behind the mask were fixed steadily upon him, and below the mask there was the hard, unpleasant set to the lips that Jimmy Dale had grown accustomed to expect. The man spoke abruptly. That you find yourself alive, Mr. Dale, he said grimly, is no confession of weakness upon the part of those with whom you have had to deal here. To bear witness to that, there is one who is not alive, as you have seen. That man we knew. 
With you, it was somewhat different. Your presence in the taxi cab was only suspicious. There was always the possibility that you might be one of those ambiguous, innocent bystanders. Your name, your position, the improbability that you could have anything in common with, shall we say, the matter that so deeply interests us, was all in your favor. However, presumption and probability are the tools of fools. We do not depend upon them, we apply the test. And having applied the test, we are convinced that you have told the truth, that is all. He rose from his chair briskly. I shall not apologize to you for what has happened. I doubt very much that you are in a frame of mind to accept anything of the sort. I imagine, rather, that you are promising yourself that we shall pay and pay dearly for this, and that, amongst other things, we shall answer for the murder of the man in the other room. All this will be quite within your province, Mr. Dale, and quite fruitless. Tomorrow morning, the story that you are preparing to tell now would sound incredible, even in your own ears. Furthermore, as we shall take pains to see that you leave this place with as little knowledge of its location as you obtained when you arrived, your story, even if believed, would do little service to you and less harm to us. I think of nothing more, Mr. Dale, except... There was a whimsical smile on the lips now. Ah, yes, the matter of your clothes. We can and shall be glad to make reparation to you to the slight extent of offering you a new suit before you go. Jimmy Dale scowled. Sick, shaken, and weak as he was, the cool, imperturbable impotence of the man was fast growing unbearable. The man laughed. I am sure you will not refuse, Mr. Dale, since we insist. The condition of the clothes you have on at present might, I say might, in a measure, support your story to, with some degree of tangible evidence. It is not at all likely, of course, but we prefer to discount even so remote a possibility. When you have changed, you will be motored back to your home. I bid you good night, Mr. Dale. Jimmy Dale rubbed his eyes. The man was gone through a door at the rear of the desk, a door that he had not noticed before, that was not even in evidence now, that was simply a movable section of the wall paneling. And for an instant, Jimmy Dale experienced a sense of sickening impotence. It was as though he stood defenseless, unarmed, and utterly at the mercy of some venomous power that could crush what would be remorselessly and at will in his might. The place was a veritable maze, a lair of hellish cleverness. He had no illusions now. He labored under no false estimate of either the ingenuity or the resources of this inhuman nest of vultures to whom murder was no more than a matter of detail. And it was against these men that henceforth he was to match his wits. There could be no truce, no armistice. It was their lives or hers or his. Well, he was alive now. The first round was over, and so far he had won. His brow furrowed suddenly. Had he? He was not so sure after all. He was conscious of a disquieting premonitory intuition that, in some way, which he could not explain, the honors were not entirely his. He was apparently, he apparently was a mental reservation, quite alone in the room. He got up from the couch and walked shakily across the floor to the desk. A revolver lay invitingly upon the blotting pad. It was his own, the one they had taken from him after the accident. Jimmy Dale picked it up, examined it, and smiled a little sarcastically at himself for the trouble. It was unloaded, of course. He was twirling it in his hand as a man, masked as everyone in the house was masked, and carried a neatly folded suit over his arm, entered from the corridor. The car is ready as soon as you are dressed, announced the other briefly. He laid the clothes upon the couch and settled himself significantly in a chair. Jimmy Dale hesitated, then with a shrug of his shoulders recrossed the room and began to remove his torn garments. What was the use? They would certainly have their own way in the end. It wasn't worth another fight, and there was nothing to be gained by a refusal except to offer a sop to his own exasperation. He dressed quickly in what proved to be an exceedingly well-fitting suit and finally turned tentatively to the man in the chair. The other stood up and produced a heavy black silk scarf. If you have no objections, he said curtly, I'll tie this over your eyes. 
Again, Jimmy Dale shrugged his shoulders. I am glad enough to get out on any conditions, he answered caustically. Fortunate would be a better word, rejoined the other meaningly, and deftly knotting the scarf, led Jimmy Dale blindfolded from the room. End of Part 2 Chapter 4 Recording by Jacob Cherry Part 2, Chapter 5 of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wyatt The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard Part 2, Chapter 5 Was he in the city? In a suburban town? On a country road? It seemed childishly absurd that he could not at least differentiate to that extent. And yet, from the moment he had been placed in the automobile in which he now found himself, he was forced to admit that he could not tell. He had started out with the belief that knowing New York and its surroundings as minutely as he knew them, it would be impossible, do what they would to prevent it, that in the end of his journey he should be without a clue, a very good clue at that, to the location of what he now called, appropriately enough it seemed, the crime club. But he had never ridden blindfolded in a car before. He could see absolutely nothing, and if that increased or accentuated his sense of hearing, it helped little. The roaring of the race car beat upon his eardrums the more heavily. That was all. He could tell, of course, the nature of the roadbed. They were running on an asphalt road, that was obvious enough. But city streets and suburban streets and hundreds of miles of country road around New York were of asphalt. Traffic. He was quite sure, for he had strained his ears in an effort to detect it, that there was little or no traffic, but then it must be one or two o'clock in the morning. And at that hour the city streets, certainly those that would be chosen by these men, would be quite as deserted as any country road. And as for a sense of direction, he had none whatever. Even if the car had not been persistently swerving and changing its course every little while, if he had been able to form even an approximate idea of the compass direction in which they had started, he might possibly have been able, in a general way, to counteract this further effort of theirs to confuse him. But without the initial direction, he was essentially befogged. With these conclusions finally thrust home upon him, Jimmy Dale philosophically subordinated the matter in his mind, and leaning back, composed himself as comfortably as he could upon his seat. There was a man beside him and he could feel the legs of two men on the seat facing him. These, with the driver, would make four. He was still well guarded. The car itself was a closed car, not hooded. The sense of touch told him. Therefore, a limousine of some description. These facts, in a sense inconsequential, were absorbed subconsciously. And then Jimmy Dale's brain, remorselessly active, in spite of the pain from his throbbing head, was at work again. It seemed as though a year had passed since. In the early evening, as Larry the Bat, he had burrowed so ironically for refuge in Chang Fu's den from her. It seemed like some mocking unreality, some visionary dream that, so short a while before, he had read those words of hers that had sent the blood coursing and leaping through his veins in mad exultation at the thought that the culmination of the year had come, that all he longed for, hoped for, all his soul cried out for was to be his in an hour. An hour! And he was to have seen her, the woman whose face he had never seen, the woman whom he loved. And the hour instead, the hours since then, had brought a nightmare of events so incredible as to seem but phantoms of the imagination. Phantoms! He sat up suddenly with a jerk. The face of the dead chauffeur, the limp form lashed in that chair, the horrible picture of its entirety, every detail standing out in ghastly relief, took form before him. God knew there was no phantom there. The man beside him, at the sudden start, lifted a hand and felt hurriedly over the bandage across Jimmy Dale's eyes. Jimmy Dale was scarcely conscious of the act. With that face before him, with the scene reenacting itself in his mind again, had come another thought, staggering him for a moment with the new menace that it brought. He had had neither time nor opportunity to think before. It had been all horror, all shock, when he had entered that room. But now, 
like an inspiration he saw it all from another angle there was a glaring fallacy in the game these men had played for his benefit tonight a fallacy which they had counted on glossing over as it had indeed been glossed over by the sudden shock with which they had forced this scene upon him or failing in that they had counted on the fact that his or any other man's nerve would have failed when it came to open defiance based on a supposition which might after all be wrong and being wrong meant death but it was not supposition either he was right now or these men were childish immature fools and whatever else they might be they were not that not a single drop of poison had passed the chauffeur's lips the man had not been murdered in that room he had not in a sense been murdered at all the man absolutely unquestionably without a loophole for doubt had either been killed outright in the automobile accident or had died immediately afterward probably without regaining consciousness certainly without supplying any of the information that was so determinedly sought yes he saw it now their backs were against the wall they were at their wits end these men the knowledge that the chauffeur possessed that they knew he possessed was evidently life and death to them to kill the man before they had wormed out of him what they wanted to know or at least until by holding him a prisoner they had exhausted every means at their command to make him speak was the last thing they would do jimmy dale sat for a long time quite motionless the car was speeding at a terrific rate along a straight stretch of road he could almost have sworn guided by some intuitive sense that they were in the country well even if it were so what did that prove they might have started from new york itself only to return to it when they had satisfied themselves that he was sufficiently duped or they might have started legitimately from outside new york and be going towards the city now since the ultimate destination was new york and they had made no attempt to hide that from him, it was useless to speculate for at best it could be only speculation he had decided that once before the man at his side felt again over the scarf to see that it was in place curiously jimmy dale recalled the inward monitor that had warned him the honors had not all been his in this first round with the crime club tonight. if they had deliberately murdered the chauffeur because of a refusal to answer they would have equally done the same to him fool that he had been not to have seen that before and yet would it have made any difference he shook his head he could not have acted any better advantage than he had done he could not his lips curled in grim derision, have been any more convincing. Convincing! It was all clear now. If a chauffeur had suffered death rather than talk, even admitting the fact that they had more grounds for suspecting the chauffeur's complicity, would his, Jimmy Dale's, mere denial, his choice, too, of death, have been any more convincing, or have saved his life where it had not saved the others? A certain added respect for these men, against whom, until the end now his victory or theirs he realized he was fighting for his life came over him as he recognized the touch of a master hand they did not know where to find the toxin the package that she had said was vital to them was still beyond their reach the chauffeur was dead and he jimmy dale alone remained a clue that they had still to prove valid or invalid it was true but the only clue in their possession and gaining nothing from him by a show of force to throw him off his guard they had let him go meaning him to believe they were convinced he knew nothing and that the episode the adventure of the night was as far as they were concerned ended finished and done with time passed a very long time as he sat there it might have been an hour he could only hazard a guess not one of the men in the car had spoken a word but to jimmy dale the car itself the ride its duration these three strange companions were for the time being extraneous even that sick giddiness in his head had at least temporarily gone from him and so all unsuspecting he was to lead them to the toxin and fall into the trap himself his hands thrust deep in his pockets were tightly clenched they were clever enough ingenious enough powerful enough to watch him henceforth at every turn and from now on day and night they were to be reckoned with suppose that in some way as it might well have happened for it was now vitally necessary that she should communicate with him and he with her he had played blindly into their hands and through him she should have fallen into their power 
It brought a sickening chill, a sort of hideous panic to Jimmy Dale, and then fury, anger, in a torrent, surged upon him. There came a merciless desire to crush, to strangle, to stamp out this inhuman band of criminals that, with intolerable effrontery to the laws of God and man, were so elaborately and scientifically equipped for their monstrous purposes. And then Jimmy Dale, in the darkness, smiled again grimly as the leader's reference to the gray seal recurred to him. Well, perhaps, who knew, they would have reason more than they dreamed of to wish the gray seal enrolled in their own ranks. It was strange, curious. He had thought all that was ended. Only a few short hours before, he had hidden away all. Everything that was incident to the life of the gray seal, the clothes of Larry the Bat, that little metal case with the gray-colored adhesive seals, a dozen other things, believing that it only remained for him to return and destroy them at his leisure as a finishing touch to the gray seal's career and now instead he was face to face with the gravest most dangerous problem that she had ever called upon him to undertake well at least the odds were not all in the crime club's favor where they now certainly believed him to be entirely off his guard he was thoroughly on his guard and where they might suspect him watch him they would suspect and watch only the character, the person of Jimmy Dale, and count not at all upon either Larry the Bat or the Gray Seal. A sort of savage elation fell upon Jimmy Dale. His brain, that had been stagnant, confused, physically sick with pain and suffering, was working now with its old-time vigor and ease, mapping, planning, scheming the way ahead. To strike, and strike quick, to strike first, it must be his move next, not theirs and he must act to-night at once the moment he was given this pretense of liberty that they had in store for him before they had an opportunity of closing down around him with a network of spies that he could not elude by morning jimmy dale would be larry the bat and inhabiting the sanctuary again and a tip to jason his old butler to the effect say that he had gone away for a trip would account for his disappearance satisfactorily enough it would not necessarily arouse their suspicions when they eventually discovered he was gone, for against that was always the possibility and the quite likely presumption. Where they had succeeded in nothing else, they had least succeeded in frightening him thoroughly and to the extent of imbuing him with a hasty desire to put a safe distance between himself and them. And now, with his mind made up to his course of action, an intense impatience to put his plan into effect, an irritation at the useless twistings and turnings of the car that had latterly become more frequent and took hold upon him. How much longer was this to last? They must have been fully an hour and a half on the road already, and ah, the car was stopping now. He straightened up in his seat as the machine came to a halt, but the man at his side laid a restraining hand upon him. The car door opened and one of the men got out. Jimmy Dale caught an indistinct murmur of voices from without, and then the man returned to his seat and the car went on again. Another half-hour passed. That, curbing his irritation and impatience, was filled with the conjectures and questions that anew came crowding in upon his mind. Why had the car made that stop? It was rather curious. It was certainly a prearranged meeting place. Why? And these clothes that he now wore. Why had they made him change? His own had not been very badly torn. The reason given him was, on the face of it now, in view of what he now knew, were mere pretense. What was the ulterior motive behind that pretense? What did this package, that had already cost a man his life tonight, contain? Who was the chauffeur? What was this death feud between the toxin and these men? Did she know where the crime club was? Who and where was John Johansson? What was this box that was number 428? Could she supply the links that would forge the chain into an unbroken hole? And then, for the second time, the car slowed down, and this time the man on the seat behind Jimmy Dale reached up and untied the scarf. You get out here, the man said tersely. End of Part 2 Chapter 5 Recording by Wyatt Part Two, Chapter Six of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wyatt. 
The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard. Part 2. Chapter 6. Had it not been for the stop the car had previously made, for the possibility that he might have obtained a glimpse outside when the door had been opened, the scarf over his eyes would have been superfluous, for now, with it removed, he could scarcely distinguish the forms of the three men around him, since the window curtains of the car were tightly drawn. Nor was he given the opportunity to do more, even if it had been possible. The car stopped, the door was open, he was pushed towards it, and even as he reached the ground the door was closed behind him and the car was speeding on again. Where he could not see before, he took now but a glance to obtain his bearings. He was standing on a corner on Riverside Drive, within a few doors of his own house. Jimmy Dale stood for a moment, watching the car as it disappeared rapidly up the drive. With a sort of grim fastidiousness, his brain began to correlate time and distance. Where had he come from? Where was this crime club? They had been, as nearly as he could estimate, two hours in making the journey, and as nearly as he could estimate, in their turnings and twistings had covered at least twice the distance that would be represented by a direct route. Granting then an average speed of forty miles an hour, which was over-generous to be on the safe side, and the fact that they certainly had not crossed the Hudson, which now lay before him, flanking the drive, the crime club was somewhere within the area of a semicircle, whose center was the corner on which he now stood, and whose radius was forty miles, or forty yards. He forced a laugh. It was just that, no more, no less. He was as likely to have started on his ride from within a biscuit throw of where he now stood, as to have started on it from miles away. But he aroused himself with a start. He was wasting time. It must be very late, near morning. He would have need for every moment that was left between now and daylight. He turned and walked quickly to his house, mounted the steps, and with his latch-key they had at least permitted him to retain the contents of his pockets when they had forced him to change his clothes, opened the front door softly, and stepped inside, closed the door as silently as he had opened it. He paused for an instant to listen. There was not a sound. The servants, naturally, would have been in bed hours ago. Even old Jason, Jimmy Dale smiled, half whimsically, half affectionately, whose paternal custom it was to sit up for his master Jim, who, as he was fond of saying, he had dandled as a baby on his knee, had evidently given it up as a bad job on this occasion, and had turned in himself. Jason, however, had left a light burning here in the big reception hall. Jimmy Dale stepped to the switch and turned off the light, then stood hesitant in the darkness. Was there anything to be gained by rousing Jason now and telling him what he intended to do? to instruct him to answer any inquiries by the statement that Mr. Dale had gone away for a trip. He could trust Jason. Jason already knew much. More than one of those mysterious letters of the toxins had passed through Jason's hands. Jimmy Dale shook his head. No, he could communicate with Jason from downtown in the morning. He had half expected to find Jason up, and in that case would have taken the other, as far as necessary, into his confidence. He could get in touch with Jason at any time readily enough. Was there anything else before he went? He would not be able to get back as easily as he got out. Money. He shook his head again, a little grimly this time. He had been caught once before as Larry the Bat without funds. There was plenty of money now hidden in the sanctuary, enough for any emergency, enough to last him indefinitely. He stepped forward along the hall, his tread noiseless on the rich, heavy rug, passed into the rear of the house, descended the back stairs, and reached the cellar. It was below the level of the ground, of course, but a narrow window here, though quite large enough to permit of egress, gave on the driveway at the side of the house that led to the garage in the rear. Cautiously now, for the cement floor was, in the stillness, little less than a sounding board, Jimmy Dale reached the wall and felt along it to the window, the lower edge of whose sill was just slightly below the level of his shoulder. It opened inward, if he remembered correctly. His fingers were feeling for the fasteners. It was too dark to see a thing. He muttered in annoyance. Where were the fastenings? At the sides or at the bottom? His hands began to make a circuit of the sill, and suddenly with a low, sharp cry he leaned forward. What did this mean? Wires. No wires had ever been there before. His fingers were working now with feverish haste, telegraphing their message to his brain. The wires ran through the sill close to the corner of the wall. Tiny fragments of wood, as from an auger, were still on the sill, and here was a small particle of wire insulation that, those sensitive fingertips proclaimed, was fresh. 
a cold thrill ran through jimmy dale and there came again that sickening sense of impotency that the face of the malignant devilish cunning arrayed against him that once before he had experienced that night he had thought to forestall them and he had been forestalled himself this could only have been done they had had no interest in him before then while they held him at the crime club while he was spending that two hours in the car was that why they had taken so long in coming was that why the car had stopped that time that those with him might be told that the work here had been completed and he need no longer be kept away he edged away from the window and as cautiously as he had come retraced his steps across the cellar and up the stairs and then the possibility of being heard from without gone he broke into a run there was no need to wonder long what those wires meant they could mean only one of two things that the crime club would have little concern in his electric light they had tapped his telephone the mains he knew ran into the cellar from the underground service in the street he was racing like a madman now how long ago how many hours ago had they done that great scott she was to have telephoned had she done so was the game all everything she herself at their mercy already if she had telephoned jason would have left the message on the desk he would look there first afterward he would waken jason he gained the door of his den on the first landing a room that ran the entire length of one side of the house from front to rear burst in switching on the light and stood stock still in amazement jason he cried out the old butler fully dressed rubbing and blinking his eyes in the light with a startled cry rose up from the depths of a lounging chair jason exclaimed jimmy dale i beg your pardon sir master jim stammered the man i must have fallen asleep sir jason what are you doing here jimmy dale demanded sharply well sir said jason still fumbling for his words uh it was the telephone sir the telephone yes sir a woman begging your pardon master jim a lady sir has been telephoning every hour or so and she yes jimmy dale had jumped across the room and had caught the other fiercely by the shoulder yes yes what did she say quick man good lord master jim faltered jason i she jason said jimmy dale suddenly as cold as ice what did she say think man every word she didn't say anything master jim nothing at all sir except to keep asking each time if she could speak to you nothing else jason no sir are you sure i'm sure master jim not another thing but sir just as i've told you thank god jimmy dale said in a low voice yes sir said jason mechanically how long ago was it since she telephoned last asked jimmy dale quickly well sir i couldn't rightly say you see as i said master jim i must have gone to sleep but they were staring tensely into each other's face the telephone on the desk was ringing vibrantly clamorously through the stillness of the room jason white frightened bewildered touched his lip with the tip of his tongue that'll be her again sir he said hoarsely wait said jimmy dale tersely he was trying to think to think faster than he had ever thought before he could not tell jason to say that he had not come in they knew he was in it would be but showing his hand to that someone who would be listening now on the wire he dared not speak to her, or, above all, allow her to express herself by a single inadvertent word. He dared not speak to her, and she was here now, calling him. He could not speak to her, and it was life and death almost that she should know what happened. Life and death almost for both of them that he should know all and everything she could tell him. True, it would take but a minute to run to the cellar and cut those wires. While Jason held her on the pretense of calling him, Jimmy Dale, to the phone, only a minute to cut those wires, and in doing so advertised to these friends the fact that he had discovered their trick. Admit, as though in so many words, that their suspicions of him were justified. Lay himself open to some new move that he could not hope to foresee, and, paramount to all else, rob her and himself of this master trump the crime club had placed in his hands, by means of which there was a chance that he could hoist them with their own petard. The telephone rang again imperatively persistently listen jason jimmy dale was speaking rapidly earnestly say i've come in and have gone to bed in a vile humor that you told me a lady had been calling 
but that I said if she called again I wasn't to be disturbed, if it was the Queen of Sheba herself, that I wouldn't answer any phone tonight for anybody. Do you understand? No argument with her. Just that. Now answer. Jason lifted the receiver from the hook. Yes, hello, he said. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Dale has come in, but he is retired. Yes, I told him, but, begging your pardon, ma'am, he was in what I might say was a bit of a temper, and said he wasn't to be disturbed by anyone. Jimmy Dale snatched the receiver from Jason and put it to his own ear. Kindly tell Mr. Dale that unless he comes to the phone now, a feminine voice, her voice, in well-simulated indignation was saying, it will be a very long day before I shall trouble myself to... Jimmy Dale clapped his hand firmly over the mouthpiece of the instrument. Thank God for that clever brain of hers. She understood. Repeat what you said before, he instructed hurriedly. Then say good night. He removed his hand from the mouthpiece. It's quite useless, ma'am, said Jason apologetically. In the rare temper he was in, he wouldn't come. To use his own words, ma'am, not for the Queen of Sheba herself, ma'am. Good night, ma'am. Jimmy Dale hung the receiver back on the hook, and with his hand flirted away a bead of moisture that had sprung to his forehead. Good Lord, Master Jim, what's wrong, sir? What happened, sir? And those clothes, Master Jim, sir, they aren't the ones you went out in, sir. They aren't yours at all, sir, Jason ventured anxiously. Jason, said Jimmy Dale, switch off the light and go to the front window and look out. Keep well behind the curtains. Don't show yourself. Tell me if you see anything. Yes, sir, said Jason obediently. The light went out. Jimmy Dale moved to the rear of the room, to the window overlooking the garage and yard. I don't see anything, sir, Jason called. Watch, Jimmy Dale answered. A minute passed, two, three. Jimmy Dale was staring down into the black of the yard. She understood. She knew. Of course. Before she phoned that something had gone wrong tonight, she knew that only peril of the gravest moment would have kept him from the phone and her. She knew now as a logical conclusion, that it was dangerous to attempt to communicate with him at his home. Those wires, where did they lead to? Not far away. That would be almost a mechanical impossibility. Was it into the crime club itself, near at hand, or the basement, say, of that apartment house across the driveway? Or where? And then Jimmy Dale spoke again. Do you see anything, Jason? I'm not sure, sir, Jason answered hesitantly. I thought I saw a man move behind a tree out there across the road a minute ago, sir. Yes, sir, there he is again. There was a thin, mirthless smile on Jimmy Dale's lips. Below, in the shadow of the garage, a dark form, like deeper shadow, stirred and was still again. What time is it, Jason? Jimmy Dale asked presently. It'll be about half past four, sir. Go to bed, Jason. Yes, sir, but... Jason's voice, low, troubled, came through the darkness from the upper end of the room. Master Jim, sir, I... Go to bed, Jason, and not a word of this. Yes, sir, good night, Master Jim. Good night, Jason. Jimmy Dale groped his way to the big lounging chair in which he had found Jason asleep and flung himself into it. They had struck quickly, these ingenious, dress-suited murderers of the crime club. The house was already watched, would be watched now untiringly, unceasingly not a movement of his henceforth but would be under their eyes his hands resting on the arms of the chair closed slowly until they became tight clenched knotted fists what was he to do it was not only the crime club it was not only the toxin and her peril there was the underworld snapping and snarling at his heels there was the police dogged and sullen over the trail of the gray seal his life even before this, in his fight against the underworld and the police, had depended upon his freedom of action, and now, at one and the same time, that freedom was cut away from beneath his feet, as it were, and a third foe, equally as deadly as the others, was added to the list. For months, to preserve and sustain the character of Larry the Bat, he had been forced to assume the role almost daily, for in that sordid empire below the deadline, whose one common bond and aim was the Grey Seal's death, where suspicion, one of the other, was rampant and extravagant, where each might be the one against whom all swore their vengeance, Larry the Bat could not mysteriously disappear from his accustomed haunts without inviting suspicion in an active and practical form. An inquisitorial visit to his squalid lodgings, the sanctuary, and the end of Larry the Bat. If, as he had thought only a few hours before, he was through forever with his dual life, 
that would not have mattered. The underworld would have been welcome to make what it chose of it. But now the preservation of the character of Larry the Bat was more vital and necessary to him than it had ever been before. It was a means of defense and offense against these men who lurked now outside his doors. It was the sole means now of communicating with her, for, warned by Jason's words, and what must be an obvious fact to her that their plans had miscarried, that it was dangerous to communicate with him as Jimmy Dale, she would expect him, count on him, to make that move there would be no longer either reason or attempt on her part to maintain the mystery which heretofore she had surrounded herself the crisis had come she would be watching waiting hoping seeking for him more anxiously and with far more at stake than he had ever sought for her until now he got up impulsively from his chair and in the blackness began to pace the room the next move was clear pitifully clear it had been clear from the first it had been clear even in that ride in the car it was so clear that it seemed veritably to mock him as he prodded his brain for some means of putting it into execution he must get to the sanctuary become larry the bat but how how the question seemed at last to become resonant to ring through the room with the weight of doom upon it schemes plans ideas came bringing a momentary uplift, only to be discarded the next instant with a sort of bitter, desperate regret. These men were not men of mere ordinary intelligence. Their cleverness, their power, the amazing scope of their organization, all bore grim witness to the fact that they would be blinded not at all by any paltry ruse. He could walk out of this house in the morning as Jimmy Dale without apparent hindrance. That was obvious enough. And so long as he pursued the usual evocations of Jimmy Dale, he would not be interfered with, only watched. It was useless to consider that plan for a moment. It would not help him to reach the sanctuary without leading them there behind him. True, but there was always the chance that he might shake them off his trail, but he could hardly hope to accomplish anything like that without their knowing that it was done deliberately, and that he dared not risk. The strongest weapon in his hands now was his secret knowledge that he was being watched. That telephone there, for instance, that most curiously kept on insisting in his mind that it, and it alone, was the way out, was the last thing he could put in jeopardy. Besides, there was another reason why such a plan would not do. For granting, even that he succeeded in eluding them on the way, and managed to reach the sanctuary, his freedom of action would be so restricted and limited as to be practically worthless. He would have to return to his home here again within a reasonable time as Jimmy Dale, within a few hours at most, or again they would be in possession of the fact that he had discovered their surveillance. That, it was true, and had been his original plan when he had entered the house half an hour previously. But it was an entirely different matter now. Then he had counted on getting away without their knowing it, before they, as he had fondly thought, would have had a chance to establish their espionage, and when they would have no reason to suspect, for a time at least, that he was not still within the house, when they would have been watching as it were an empty cage he stopped in his walk and after a moment dropped down into the lounging chair again that was it of course an empty cage if he could escape from the house not so much without them seeing that was more or less a mechanical detail but escape and leave them in possession of a sort of guarantee or assurance that he was still there that would give him the freedom of action that he must have he smiled with bitter irony that solved the problem that was all there was to it just that it was very simple exceedingly simple it was only impossible the smile left his lips and once more his hands clenched fiercely no it was not impossible it must be done if he was to win through if he was to even save himself it must be done or fail her it could be done there was a way if he could only see it end of part two chapter six Recording by Wyatt Part 2 Chapter 7 Of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard Reading by Lars Rolander Part 2 
the woman in the case chapter seven the hour as the minutes passed many of them jimmy dale sat there motionless staring before him at the desk that was faintly outlined in the unlighted room then somewhere in the house a clock struck the hour five o'clock he raised his head yes it could be done there was a way he had the germ of it now and now the plan began to grow to take form and shape in his mind to dovetail to knit the integral parts into a comprehensive whole there was a way but he must have assistance jason yes assuredly benson his chauffeur yes equally as trustworthy as jason benson was devoted to him and moreover benson was young alert daring cool he had had more than one occasion to test benson's resourcefulness and nerve jimmy dale rose abruptly went to the rear window and parting the curtains cautiously stood peering down into the courtyard yes it was feasible even a little more than feasible the garage fronted the driveway of course to give free entrance and egress to the cars but where the wall of the garage and the rear wall of the house overlapped as it were the space between them was not much more than ten yards and there the shadows of the two walls mingling lay like a black impenetrable pathway not like that other shadow he had seen moving at the side of the garage and that if not for the moment discernible was none the less surely still lurking there satisfied jimmy dale swung briskly from the window and going now to his bedroom across the hall undressed and went to bed but not to sleep there would be time enough to sleep all day if he wished now there were still the little details to be thought out that more than anything else could make or wreck his plans a point overdone the faintest suggestion of a false note by men of the caliber of those against whom he was now fighting for his life were concerned would not only make his scheme abortive but would place him utterly at their mercy it was nine o'clock when he rang for jason jason he said abruptly as the other entered i want you to telephone for dr merlin the doctor sir exclaimed the old man anxiously you're you're not ill master jim sir do i look ill jason inquired jimmy dale gravely well sir admitted jason in concern a bit done up sir perhaps a little pale sir though i am sure i'm glad to hear it said jimmy dale sitting up in bed the worse i look the better ah uh, i beg pardon sir stammered jason jason said jimmy dale gravely again you have had reason to know that on several occasions my life has been threatened it is threatened now you know from last night that this house is now watched you may or you may not have surmised that our telephone wires have been tapped tapped sir jason's face had gone a little gray yes a party line so to speak said jimmy dale grimly do you understand you must be careful to say no more no less than exactly what i tell you to say now go and telephone ask the doctor to come over and see me this morning simply say that i'm not feeling well but that apart from being apparently in a very nervous condition you don't know what is the matter yes sir good lord sir gasped jason and left the room to carry out his orders an hour later dr merlin had been and gone and had left two prescriptions one written the other verbal with the written one benson in his chauffeur's livery was dispatched to the drug store the verbal one was precisely what jimmy dale had expected from the fussy old family physician two or three days of quiet in the house james and if you need me again let me know now jason said jimmy dale when the old man had returned from ushering dr merlin from the house our friends out there will be anxious to learn the verdict 
I was to dine with the Ross Hendersons tomorrow night, was I not? Yes, sir, I think so, sir. Make sure, said Jimmie Dale. Look in my engagement book there on the table. Jason looked. Yes, sir, that's right, he announced. Very good, said Jimmie Dale softly. Now go and telephone again, Jason. Present my regrets and excuse to the Ross Hendersons, and say that under the doctor's orders I am confined to the house for the next few days. And Jason? Yes, sir. When Benson returns with the medicine, let him bring it here himself, and I shall want you as well. Jimmy Dale propped himself up a little wearily on the pillow as Jason went out of the room. After all, his condition was not entirely feigned. He was, as a matter of fact, pretty well played out, both mentally and physically. Certainly that he should require a doctor and be confined to the house could not arouse suspicion, even in the minds of those alert aristocratic thugs of the crime club, prone as they would be to suspect anything a man who had been knocked unconscious in an automobile smash the night before had been in a fight had been subjected to a terrific mental shock to say nothing of the infernal drug that had been administered to him might well be expected to be indisposed the next morning and for several mornings following that it might indeed even cause them to relax their vigilance for the time being though he dared build nothing on that well, he had only to coach Benson and Jason in the parts they were to play, and the balance of the morning and all the afternoon was his in which to rest. He reached over to the table, picked up a pencil and paper, and began to jot down memoranda. He had just tossed the pencil back on the table as the two men entered. Jason, at a sign, closed the door quietly. Jimmy Dale looked at Benson, half musingly, half whimsically, for a moment before he spoke. Benson, he said, the back seat of the large touring car is hinged and lifts up once the cushion is removed, doesn't it? Yes, sir, Benson answered promptly. And uh, there's space enough for, say, a man inside, isn't there? Why, yes, sir, I suppose so, at a squeeze. Benson stared blankly. "'Quite so,' said Jimmy Dale calmly. "'Now another matter, Benson. I believe some chauffeurs have a habit, when occasion lends itself, of taking, shall we say, their best girl out riding in their master's machines.' "'Some might,' Benson replied a little stiffly. "'I hope you don't think, sir, that—' "'One moment, Benson. The point is, it's done, quite generally.' I "'Yes, sir.' And you have a best girl, or at least could find one for such a purpose, if you were so inclined? Yes, sir, said Benson. But— Very good, Jimmy Dale interrupted. Then tonight, Benson, taking advantage of my illness, and tomorrow night and the nights after that until further notice, you will acquire and put into practice that reprehensible habit. I, I don't understand, Mr. Dale. No, I dare say not, said Jimmy Dale and then the whimsicality dropped from him. Benson, he said slowly, do you remember a night nearly four years ago, the first night you ever saw me? You had indiscreetly, I think, displayed more money than was wise in that east side neighborhood? I remember, said Benson with a sudden start, then simply, I wouldn't be here now, sir, if it hadn't been for you. Well, said Jimmy Dale quietly, the tables are turned today, Benson. As Jason already knows, this house is watched. For reasons that I cannot explain, I am in great danger. Bluntly, I am putting my life in your hands and Jason's. Benson looked for an instant from Jimmy Dale to Jason, caught the strained, troubled expression on the old man's face, then back again at Jimmy Dale. "'Do you mean that, sir?' he cried. "'Then you can count on me, Mr. Dale, to the last ditch.' "'I know that, Benson,' Jimmy Dale said softly. "'And now, both of you, listen. "'It is imperative that I should get away from the house, "'and equally imperative that those watching should believe that I am still here. "'Not even the servants are to be permitted a suspicion "'that I am not here in my bed ill. "'That, Jason, is your task.' 
You will allow no one to wait on me but yourself. You will bring the meal trays up regularly and eat the food yourself. You will answer all inquiries, telephone and otherwise, in person. I am not seeing anyone. You understand perfectly, Jason? I understand, Master Jim. You need have no fear, sir, on that score. Now you, Benson, Jimmy Dale went on. A few minutes ago I sent you out in your chauffeur's togs with that prescription. You were undoubtedly observed. I wanted you to be. It was quite necessary that they should know and be able to recognize you again, to disabuse their minds later on of the possibility that I might be masquerading in your clothes, and also, of course, that they should know who you were and what your position was in the household. Very well. Tonight at eight o'clock exactly, you are to go out from the back door of the house to the garage. On the way out, it will be quite dark then, I want you to drop something, say a bunch of keys that you had been jingling in your hand. You are to experience some difficulty in finding it again, move about a little to force anyone that may be lurking by the garage to retreat around the corner, grumble a bit and make a little noise. But you are not to overdo it. A couple of minutes at the outside is enough. By that time I shall be under the car seat. You will then run the machine out to the street and stop at the curb. Jump out, and as though you had forgotten something, hurry back to the garage. You must not be away long. Enough only to permit, say, a passer-by to glance into the car and satisfy himself that it is empty. You understand, of course, Benson, that the hood must be down, no closed car to invite even the suggestion of concealment. That would be a fatal blunder. Drive then to the young lady's home by as direct route as you can. Give no appearance of being aware that you are followed, as you will be, and much less the appearance of attempting to elude pursuit. Act naturally. Between here and your destination I will manage readily enough to leave the car. You will then take the young lady for her drive, that is what they will be interested in, your motive for going out tonight, and, as I said, take her driving again on each succeeding night, establish the habit to their satisfaction. Jimmy Dale paused, glanced at the paper which he still held in his hand, then handed it to Benson. Just one thing more, Benson, he said. Listed on that paper you will find a different rendezvous for each night for the next five nights, excluding tonight, which, after you have returned the young lady to her home, you are to pass by on your way back here. See that your drive is always over in time for you to pass each night's rendezvous at half-past eleven sharp. Don't stop unless I signal you. If I am not there, go right home and be at the next place on the following night. I am fairly well satisfied they will not bother about you after tonight, or tomorrow night at the most, but for all that you must take no chances. So, except in the route you take in going to the young ladies, always avoid covering the same ground twice, which might give the appearance of having some ulterior purpose in view. Even in your drives, vary your runs. Is this clear, Benson? "'Yes, sir,' said Benson earnestly. "'Very well, then,' said Jimmy Dale. Eight o'clock to the dot, Benson. Compare your time with Jason's. And now, Jason, see that I get a chance to sleep until dinner-time tonight.' The hours that followed were hours of sound and much-needed sleep for Jimmy Dale, and from which he awoke only to Jason's entrance that evening with a dinner-tray. "'I've slept like a log, Jason,' he cried briskly, as he leaped out of bed. "'Anything new? Anything happened?' "'No, sir, not a thing,' Jason answered. "'Only, Master Jim, sir,' the old man twisted his hands nervously, "'I—' "'You'll excuse my saying so, sir. I do hope you'll be careful tonight, sir. I can't help being afraid that something'll happen to you, Master Jim.' "'Nonsense, Jason,' Jimmy Day laughed cheerfully. "'There's nothing going to happen to me. "'You go ahead now and stay with the servants, "'and get them out of the road at the proper time.' He bathed, dressed, ate his dinner, and was slipping cartridges into the magazine of his automatic, when, within a minute 
or two of eight o'clock jason's whisper came from the doorway it's all clear now master jim sir right jimmie dale responded and followed jason down the stairway and to the head of the cellar stairs here jason halted god keep you master jim said the old man huskily good night jason jimmie dale answered softly and with a reassuring squeeze on the other's arm went on down to the cellar here he moved quickly noiselessly across to the window not the window of the night before but another of the same description almost directly beneath the one of his den above that faced the garage and lay in the line of that black shadow path between the two buildings deftly cautiously without sound a half inch an inch at a time he opened it he stood listening then a minute passed then he heard benson open and shut the back door then benson in the yard and then benson's voice in a muttered and irritable growl taking talking to himself as he stamped around on the ground with the lithe agile movement jimmie dale pulled himself up and through the window and began to creep rapidly on hands and knees towards the garage it was dark intensely dark he could barely distinguish benson's form though as he passed the other the slight sounds he made drowned out by the chauffeur's angry mumblings he could have reached out and touched benson easily he gained the interior of the garage and as benson came on again stepped lightly into the car lifted the seat and wriggled his way inside it was close stuffy abominable cramped but jimmie dale was smiling grimly now thanks to benson there wasn't a possibility that he had been seen he both felt and heard benson start the car then the car moved forward ran the length of the driveway bumped slightly as it made the street and stopped he heard benson jump out and run back and then he listened intently and the grim smile flickered on his lips again came the sound of a footstep on the sidewalk close beside the car then silence the car shook a little as though someone's weight was on the step then the footsteps receded benson returned on the run and the car started forward once more perhaps ten minutes passed three times the car had swerved sharply making a corner turn then jimmie dale pushed up the seat and protected from observation from behind by the back of the car itself crawled out and crouched down the floor of the tonneau don't look around benson he said calmly are we followed yes sir benson answered at least there's always been a car behind us though not the same one they're pretty clever there must be three or four each following the other every time i turn a corner it's a different car that turns it behind me how far behind jimmy adale asked half a block slow down a little instructed jimmie dale and don't turn another corner until they've had a chance to accommodate themselves to your new speed you are going too fast for me to jump and i don't want them to notice any change in speed except what is made in plain sight yes that's better where are we benson that's amsterdam avenue ahead replied benson all right said jimmie dale quietly turn into it the more people the better tell me just as you are about to turn yes sir said benson then almost on the instant all ready sir jimmie dale's hand reached out for the door catch edged the door ajar the car swerved took the corner and jimmie dale stepped out on the running board hung there negligently for a moment as though chatting with benson and then with an airy good night dropped nonchalantly to the ground and the next instant had mingled with the throng of pedestrians on the sidewalk a half minute later a large grey automobile turned the corner and followed benson and jimmie dale stepping out into the street again swung on a downtown car the road to the sanctuary was open in his impatience now the street car seemed to drag along every foot of the way but a glance at his watch as he finally reached the bowery and walking then rapidly approached the cross street a few steps ahead that led to the sanctuary told him that it was still but a quarter to nine 
but even at that he quickened his steps a little. He was free now. There was a sort of savage elemental uplift upon him. He was free. He could strike now in his own defense and hers. In a few moments he would be at the sanctuary. In a few more would be Larry the Bat. And by tomorrow at the latest he would see the Toxan. After all, that hour was not to be taken from him. It was not perhaps the hour that she had meant it should be, thought and prayed, perhaps, that it might be. It was not the hour of victory, but it was the hour that meant to him the realization of the years of longing, the hours when he should see her, see her for the first time, face to face, when there should be no more barriers between them, when— "'For your God's sake, mister, buy a pencil!' A hand was plucking at his sleeve. The thin voice was whining in his ear. He halted mechanically. A woman, old, bedraggled, ragged, was thrusting a bunch of cheap pencils imploringly toward him. And then, with a stifled cry, Jimmy Day leaned forward. The eyes that lifted to his for an instant were bright and clear with the vigor of youth. Great eyes of brown they were, and trouble, hope, fear, wistfulness, eh, and a glorious shyness were in their depth. And then the voice he knew so well, the Toxans, was whispering hurriedly, I will be waiting here, Jimmy, for Larry the Bat. End of Part 2 Chapter 7 The Hour from the Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard. Read by Lars Rolander. Part 2. Chapter 8. Of the Adventures of Jimmy Dale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard Reading by Lars Rolander Part 2 The Woman in the Case Chapter 8 The Toxan It was only a little way back along the street from the sanctuary to the corner on the Bowery, where, as Jimmy Dale, he had left her, where, as Larry the Bat, now he was going to meet her again. It would take only a moment or so, even at Larry the Bat's habitual, characteristic slouching gait. But it seemed that was all too slow, that he must throw discretion to the winds and run the distance. His blood was tingling. There was an elation upon him, coupled with an almost childlike dread that she might be gone. The Toxan! The Toxan! he kept saying to himself. Yes, she was still there, still whiningly imploring those who passed to buy her miserable pencils. And then, with a quick-flung whisper to him to follow, as he slouched up close to her, she had started slowly down the street. The Toxan, the Toxan, the Toxan! His brain seemed to be ringing with the words, ringing with them in a note clear as a silver bell. The Toxan, at last! The woman who so strangely, so wonderfully, so mysteriously had entered into his life and possessed it and filled it with a love and yearning that had come to mould and sway and actuate his very existence. The woman for whom he had fought, for whom he had risked and gladly risked, his wealth, his name, his honour, everything. The woman for whose sake he, the grey seal, was sought and hounded as the most notorious criminal of the age. She whose cleverness, whose resourcefulness, whose amazing intimacy with the hidden things of the underworld had seemed, indeed, to border on the supernatural. She, she, the Toxan, the woman whose face he had never seen before. 
the woman whose face he had never seen before and who was now that wretched hag that hobbled along the street before him begging whining and importuning the passers-by to purchase of her pitiful wares he laughed a little violently he had never pictured a first meeting such as this a hag yes and one as disreputable in appearance as he himself as larry the bat was disreputable but he had seen her eyes intimable as was her disguise she could not hide her eyes or hide the pledge they held of the beauty of form and feature beneath the tattered rags and the touch of a master in the make-up that brought haggard want and age into the face and dimly he began to divine the source the means by which she had acquired the information that for years had enabled her to plan their coups that had enabled him to execute them under the guise of crime that for years had seemed beyond all human reach where was she going where was she taking him but what did it matter the years of waiting were at an end the years of mystery in a few moments now would be a mystery no more ah she had turned from the bowery and was heading east he shuffled on after her guardedly a half block behind it was well that jimmy dale had disappeared that he was larry the bat again the neighborhood was growing more and more one that jimmy dale could not long linger in without attracting attention while on the other hand it was the natural environment of such as larry the bat and such as she was leading him now to the supreme moment of his life yes it was that the fulfillment of the years the thought of it alone filled his mind his soul it brushed aside it blotted out for the time being the danger the peril the deadly menace that hung over them both it was only that she the tocsin was here only that at last they would be together on she went traversing street after street the direction always trending toward the river until finally she halted before what appeared to be as nearly as he could make out in the almost total darkness of the ill-lighted street a small and tumble-down self-contained dwelling that bordered on what seemed to be an unfenced store-yard of some description he drew his breath in sharply she had halted waiting for him to come up with her she was waiting for him waiting for him it seemed as though he drank of some strange exhilarating elixir he reached aside eagerly and then and then her hand had caught his and she was leading him into the house into a black passage where he could see nothing into a room equally black over whose threshold he stumbled and her voice in a low conscious way with a little tremor a half sob in it that thrilled him with its promise was in his ears we are safe here jimmy for a little while but oh jimmy what have i done what have i done to bring you into this only only i was so sure so sure jimmy that there was nothing more to fear the blood was beating in hammer blows at his temples it seemed all unreal untrue that this moment could be his that it was not a dream a dream which was presently to be snatched from him in a bitter awakening and then he laughed out wildly passionately no it was true it was real her breath was on his cheek it was a living pulsing hand that was still in his and then soul and mind and body seemed engulfed and lost in a mad ecstasy and she was in his arms crushed to him and he was raining kisses upon her face i love you i love you he was crying hoarsely and over and over again i love you i love you she did not struggle the warm rich lips were yielding to his he could feel the throb the life in the young lithe form against his own she was his his the years the past all were swept away and she was his at last 
his for always and there came a mighty sense of kingship upon him as though all the world were at his feet and virility and a great glad strength above all other men's and a song was in his soul a song triumphant for she was his you he cried out and strained her to him you he cried again and kissed her lips and her eyelids and her lips again and then her head was buried on his shoulder and she was crying softly but after a moment she raised her hands and laid them upon his face and held them there and because it was dark dared to raise her head as well and her eyes to look into his then for a long time they stood there so and for a long time neither spoke and then with a little startled broken cry as though the peril and the menace hanging over them forgotten for the moment were thrust like a knife stab suddenly upon her she drew herself away and ran from him and went and got a lamp and lighted it and set it upon the table and jimmy dale still standing there watched her how gloriously her eyes shone dimmed and misty with the tears that filled them though they were and there was nothing incongruous in the rags that closed her in the squalor and poverty of the bare room in the white furrows that the tears had ploughed through the grime and make-up of her cheeks you wonderful wonderful woman jimmy dale whispered she shook her head as though almost in self-reproach i am not wonderful jimmy she said in a low voice i and then she caught his arm and her voice broke a little i brought you into this probably to your death jimmy tell me what happened last night and since then i i've thought at times today i should go mad oh jimmy there is so much to say to-night so much to do if if we are ever to be together for for always last night jimmy the telephone i knew there was danger that all had gone wrong what was it his arms were around her shoulders drawing her close to him again i found the wires tapped he said slowly yes and and the man you met the chauffeur he's dead jimmy dale answered gently he felt her hand close with a quick spasmodic clutch upon his arm her face grew white and for a moment she turned away her head and and the package she asked presently i do not know replied jimmy dale he did not have it with him he wait she interrupted quickly we are only wasting time like this tell me everything everything just as it happened everything from the moment you received my letter and holding her there in his arms softening as best as he could the more brutal details he told her and at the end for a little while she was silent then in a strained impulsive way she asked again the chauffeur you are sure you're positive that he's dead yes said jimmy dale grimly i'm sure and then the pent-up flood of questions burst from his lips who was that chauffeur the package the box numbered four two eight and john johansson and the crime club and the issue at stake the danger the peril that surrounded her and she above all more than anything else about herself her strange life its mystery she checked him with a strangely wistful touch of her finger upon his lips with a queer pathetic shake of her head no jimmy not that way you would never understand i cannot but i am to know now surely i am to know now he cried a sudden sense of dismay upon him three years three years and always the next time i must know now if i am to help you she smiled a little vanly at him as she drew herself away and dropping into a chair placed her elbows on the rickety table cupping her chin in her hands yes you are to know 
she said almost as though she were talking to herself. Then, with a swift intake of her breath, impulsively, Jimmy, Jimmy, I had thought that it would be all so different when, when you came. That, that I would have nothing to fear for you, for me, because it would be all over. And now you're here, Jimmy, and, oh, thank God for you. But I feel tonight almost, almost as though it were hopeless, that, that we were beaten. Beaten, he laughed out defiantly, then, playfully, soothingly, to reassure her. Jimmy Dale and Larry the Bat and the Grey Seal and the Toxan, beaten. And after we have just scored the last trick... "'But we do not hold many trumps, Jimmy,' she answered gravely. "'You have seen something of this crime club's power, "'its methods, its merciless, cruel, inhuman cunning, "'and you, perhaps, think that you understand. "'But you have not begun to grasp the extent "'of either that power or cunning. "'This horrible organization has been in existence for many years. "'I do not know how many.' I only know that the men of whom it is composed are not ordinary criminals, that they do not work in the ordinary way today. They set the machinery of fraud, deception, robbery, and murder in motion that ten years from now, and perhaps only then, will culminate in the final success of their schemes, and they play only for enormous stakes. But, her lips grew set, you will see for yourself. I must not talk any longer than is necessary. We must not take too much time. You count on three days before they begin to suspect that all is not right with Jimmy Dale? I know them better than you, and I give you two days, forty-eight hours at the outside, and possibly far less. Jimmy, abruptly, did you ever hear of Peter LaSalle? The capitalist? Yes, said Jimmy Dale. He died a few years ago. I know his brother Henry well, at the club and all that. Do you? she said evenly. Well, the man you know is not Peter LaSalle's brother. He is an impostor and one of the crime club. Not Peter LaSalle's brother? Jimmy Dale repeated the words mechanically, and suddenly his brain was whirling, vaguely, dimly in little memory snatches events not pertinent then vitally significant now came crowding upon him peter lasalle had come from somewhere in the west to live in new york and very shortly afterward had died the estate had been worth something over eleven millions and there had been he leaned quickly tensely forwards of the table staring at her my god he whispered hoarsely you are not you cannot be the the daughter peter lasalle's daughter who disappeared strangely yes she said quietly i am marie lasalle end of part two chapter eight the tocsin from the adventures of jimmy dale by frank l packard read by Lars Rolander Part 2, Chapter 9 of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard Reading by Mary Rohde Part Two: The Woman in the Case, Chapter Nine: The Toxin Story. La Salle, the old French name, that old French inscription on the ring, Sonne le Toxin. Yes, he began to understand now. She was Marie La Salle. He began to remember more clearly. Marie La Salle. They had said she was one of the most beautiful girls who had ever made her entree into New York society. But he had never met her as Marie LaSalle, never met her until now as the Toxin in this bare, destitute, squalid hovel 
here at bay both of them for their lives. He had been away when she had come with her father to New York, and on his return there had only been the father's brother in the father's place, and she was gone. He remembered the furor her disappearance had caused, the enormous rewards her uncle had offered in an effort to trace her, the thousand and one speculations as to what had become of her, and that then, gradually, as even the most startling and mystifying of events and happenings always do, the affair had dropped into oblivion, and had been forgotten by the public, at least. He began to count back. Yes, it must have been nearly five years ago, two years before she, as the toxin, and he, as the gray seal, had formed their amazing and singular partnership, that he started suddenly as she spoke, "'I want to tell you in as few words as I can,' she said abruptly, breaking the silence. "'Listen, then, Jimmy. My mother died ten years ago. I was little more than a child then. Shortly after her death, father made a business trip to New York, and on the advice of some supposed friends, he had a new will drawn up by a lawyer whom they recommended, and to whom they introduced him. I do not know who those men were.' The lawyer's name was Travers, Hilton Travers. She glanced curiously at Jimmy Dale and added quickly, He was the chauffeur, the man who was killed last night. You mean, Jimmy Dale burst out, you mean that he was... But first, the will. What was in the will? It was a very simple will, she answered and from the nature of it, it was not at all strange that my father should have been willing to have it drawn up by a comparative stranger, if that's what you are thinking. Summarized in a few words, the will left everything to me, and appointed my uncle Henry as my guardian, and the sole executor of the estate, until I should have reached my twenty-fifth birthday. It provided for a certain sum each year to be paid to my uncle for his services as executor, and at the expiration of the trust period, that is, when I was twenty-five, bequeathed to him the sum of one hundred thousand dollars. Jimmy Dale nodded. Go on, he prompted. It is hard to tell it in logical sequence, she said, hesitating a moment. So many things seem to overlap each other. You must understand a little more about Hilton Travers. During the five years following the signing of the will, father came frequently to New York, and became not only intimate with Travers, but so much impressed with the other's cleverness and ability, that he kept putting more and more of his business into Travers' hands. At the end of that five years, we moved to New York, and father, who was then quite an old man, retired from all active business, and turned over a great many of his personal affairs to Travers to look after for him, giving Travers power of attorney in a number of instances. So much for Travers. Now, about my uncle. He was my father's only brother. In fact, they were the only surviving members of their family, apart from very distant connections in France, from where generations back the family originally came. Her hand touched Jimmy Dale's for an instant. That ring, Jimmy, with its crest and inscription, is the old family coat of arms. Yes, he said briefly, I surmised as much. Strange as it may seem, in view of the fact that they had not seen each other for twenty years, she went on hurriedly, my father and my uncle were more than ordinarily attached to each other. Letters passed regularly between them, and there was constant talk of one paying the other a visit. But the visit never materialized. My uncle was somewhere in Australia, my father was here, and consequently I never saw my uncle. He was quite a different type of man from father, more restless, less settled, more rough and ready, preferring the outdoor life of the Australian bush, to the restrictions of any so-called civilization, I imagine. Financially, I do not think he ever succeeded very well, for twice, in one way or another, he lost every sheep on his ranch and father set him up again. 
and I do not think he could ever have had much of a ranch, for I remember once in one of the letters he wrote that he said he had not seen a white man in weeks, so he must have lived a very lonely life. Indeed, at about the time father drew the new will, my uncle wrote saying that he had decided to give up sheep running on his own account, as it did not pay, and to accept a very favorable offer that had been made to him to manage a ranch in New Zealand and his next letter was from the latter country, stating that he had carried out his intentions and was well satisfied with the change he had made. The long-proposed visit still continued to occupy my father's thoughts, and on his retirement from business he definitely made up his mind to go out to New Zealand, taking me with him. In fact, the plans were all arranged, my uncle expressed unbounded delight in his letters, and we were practically on the eve of sailing when a cable came from my uncle telling us to postpone the visit for a few months, as he was obliged to make a buying trip for his new employer that would keep him away that length of time. And then, her fingers that had been abstractedly picking out the lines formed by the grain of the wood in the tabletop, closed suddenly into tight clenched fists, and then my father died. Jimmy Dale turned away his head. There were tears in her eyes. The old sense of unreality was strong upon him again. He was listening to the toxin story. It was strange that he should be doing that, that it could be really so. It seemed as though, magically, he had been transported out of the world where, for years past, he had lived, with danger lurking at every turn, where men set watch about his house to trap him, where the denizens of the underworld yowled like starving beasts to sink their fangs in him, where the police were ceaselessly upon his trail to wreak an insentiate vengeance upon him. It seemed as though he had been transported away from all that to something that he had dreamed might perhaps sometime happen, and that he had hoped might happen, that he had longed for always, but now that it was his, that it also was full of the sense of the unreal. And yet, as his mind followed the thread of her story, and leaped ahead and vaguely glimpsed what was to come, he was conscious in a sort of premonitory way of a vaster peril than any he had ever known, as though forces, for the moment masked, were arrayed against him whose strength and whose malignity were beyond human parallel. In what a strange, almost incoherent way his brain was working! He roused himself a little and looked around him, and, with a shock, the starkness of the room the abject, pitiful air of destitution brought home to him with terrific, startling force the significance of the scene in which he was playing a part. His face set suddenly in hard lines. That she should have been brought to assume such a life as this, forced out of her environment a wealth and refinement, forced in her purity to rub shoulders with the vile, the dissolute, forced to exist as such a creature amid the crime and vice, the wretched horror of the underworld that swirled around her. There was anger now upon him, burning hot, a merciless craving that was a savage, hungry lust for vengeance. And then she was speaking again. Father's death occurred very shortly after my uncle's message advising us to postpone our trip was received. On his death, Travers, very naturally as father's lawyer, cabled my uncle to come to New York at once, and my uncle replied, saying that he was coming by the first steamer. She paused again, but only for an instant, as though to frame her thoughts in words. I have told you that I had never seen my uncle, that even my father had not seen him for twenty years, and I have told you that the man you know as Henry LaSalle is an impostor. I am using the word uncle now when I refer to him simply to avoid confusion. You are perhaps expecting me to say that I took a distinctive dislike to him from the moment he arrived. On the contrary, 
I had every reason to be predisposed toward him, and indeed was rather agreeably surprised than otherwise. He was not nearly so uncouth and unpolished as somehow I had pictured his life would have made him. Do you understand, Jimmy? He was kind, sympathetic, and in an apathetic way I liked him. I say apathetic because I think that best describes my own attitude toward everyone and everything following father's death until that night. She rose abruptly from her chair as though a passive position of any kind had suddenly become intolerable. Why tell you what my father and I were to each other? She cried out in a low, passionate voice. It seemed as though everything that meant anything had gone out of my life. I became worn out, nervous, and though the days were bad enough, the nights were a source of dread. I began to suffer from insomnia. I could not sleep. This was even before my supposed uncle came. I used to read for hours and hours in my room after I had gone to bed, but— she flung out her hand with an impatient gesture. There is no need to dwell on that. One night, about a week after that man had arrived, and a little over a month after father had died, I was in my room and had finished a book I was reading. I remember that it was well after midnight. I had not the slightest inclination to sleep. I picked up another book, and after that another. There were plenty in my room— but irrationally, of course, none pleased me. I decided to go down to the library, not that I think I really expected to find anything that I actually wanted, but more because it was an impulse, and furnished me for the moment with some definite objective, something to do. I got up, slipped on a dressing gown, and went downstairs. The lights were all out. I was just on the point of switching on those in the reception hall, when suddenly it seemed as though I had not strength to lift my hand, and I remembered that for an instant I grew terribly cold with dread and fear. From the room on my right a voice had reached me. The door was closed, but the voice was raised in an outburst of profanity. I, I could hear every word. "'If she's out of the way, there's no comeback,' the voice snarled. "'I won't listen to anything else, do you hear? "'Why, you fool, what are you trying to do? "'Hand me one? "'Turn everything into cash and divvy and beat it, eh? "'And I'm the goat, and I get caught and get twenty years for stealing trust funds, "'and the rest of you get the coin?' "'He swore terribly again.' "'Who's taken the risk in this for the last five years? "'There'll be no smart-aleck lawyer tricks. "'There'll be no halfway measures. "'And who are you to dictate? "'She goes out. That's safe. "'I inherit as next of kin with no one to dispute it, "'and that's all there is to it.' "'I stood there and could not move. "'It was the voice of the man I knew as my uncle.' My heart seemed to have stopped beating. I tried to tell myself that I was dreaming, that it was too horrible, too incredible to be real, that they could not really mean to, to murder me. And then I recognized Hilton Travers' voice. I am not dictating, and you are not serious, of course, he said with what seemed an uneasy laugh. I am only warning you that you are forgetting to take the real Henry LaSalle into account. He is bound to hear of this eventually, and then another voice broke in, one I did not recognize. You're talking too loud, both of you. Travers doesn't understand, but he's to be wised up tonight, according to orders, and the voice became inaudible, muffled. I could not hear any more. I suppose I remained there another three or four minutes, too stunned to know what to do. And then I ran softly along the hall to the library door. The library, you understand, was at the rear of the room they were in, and the two rooms were really one. That is, there was only an archway between them. I cannot tell you what my emotions were. I do not know. 
I only know that I kept repeating to myself, They are going to kill me, they are going to kill me, and that it seemed I must try and find out everything, everything I could. She turned away from the table and began to pace nervously up and down the miserable room. Jimmy Dale rose impulsively from his chair, but she waved him back again. "'No, wait,' she said. "'Let me finish. I crept into the library. It took me a long time because I had to be so careful not to make the slightest noise. I suppose it was fully six or seven minutes from the time I had first heard my supposed uncle's voice until I had crept far enough forward to be able to see into the room beyond. There were three men there. The man I knew as my uncle was sitting at one end of the table. Another had his back toward me, and Travers was facing in my direction. And I think I never saw so ghastly a face as was Hilton Travers then. He was standing up, sort of swaying, as he leaned with both hands on the table. "'Now then, Travers,' the man whose back was turned to me was saying threateningly, "'you've got the story now. Sign those papers.' It seemed as though Travers could not speak for a moment. He kept looking wildly from one to the other. He was white to the lips. "'You've let me in for this?' he said hoarsely at last. "'You devils! You devils! You devils! You've let me in for murder! Both of them, both Peter and his brother, murdered!' She stopped abruptly before Jimmy Dale and clutched his arm tightly. "'Jimmy, I don't know why I did not scream out. Everything went black for a moment before my eyes. It was the first suspicion I had had that my father had met with foul play, and I—' But now Jimmy Dale swayed up from his chair. "'Murdered!' he exclaimed tensely. "'Your father! But—' But I remember perfectly there was no hint of any such thing at the time, and never has been since. He died from quite natural causes. She looked at him strangely. He died from inoculation, she said. Did, did you not see something of that laboratory in the crime club yourself the night before last? Enough to understand? Good God, muttered Jimmy Dale in a startled way then. "'Go on, go on. What happened then?' She passed her hand a little wearily across her eyes and sank down into her chair again. "'Travers,' she continued, picking up the thread of her story, "'had raised his voice, and the third man at the table leaned suddenly, aggressively toward him. "'Hold your tongue,' he growled furiously. "'All you're asked to do is sign the papers, not talk.' Travers shook his head. "'I won't!' he cried out. "'I won't have any hand in another murder. In hers! My God, I won't! I won't, I tell you! It's horrible!' "'Look here, you fool!' the man who was posing as my uncle broke in then. "'You're in this too deep to get out now. If you know what's good for you, you'll do as you're told.' "'Jimmy, I shall never forget Travers' face. "'It seemed to have changed from white to gray, "'and there was horror in his eyes. "'And then he seemed to lose all control of himself, "'shaking his fists in their faces, "'cursing them in utter abandon. "'I'm bad,' he cried. "'I've gone everything, everything but the limit, "'everything but murder. "'I stop there. "'I'll have no more to do with this.' I'm through. You you pulled me into this, and, and I didn't know. Well, you know now, the third man sneered. What are you going to do about it? I'm going to see that no harm comes to Marie LaSalle, Travers answered in a dull way. The other man now was on his feet, and I do not know quite how to express it, Jimmy. He seemed ominously quiet in both his voice and his movements. "'You'd better think that over again, Travers,' he said. "'Do you mean it?' "'I mean it,' Travers said. "'I mean it. God help me.' 
"'You may well let that,' returned the other with an ugly laugh. He reached out his hand toward the telephone on the table. "'Do you know what will happen to you if I telephone a certain number and say that you have turned traitor?' "'I'll have to take my chances,' Travers replied doggedly. "'I'm through.' "'Take them, then,' flung out the other. "'You'll have little time given you to do us any harm.' Travers did not answer. I think he almost expected an attack upon him then from the two men. He hesitated a moment, then backed slowly toward the door. What happened in the next few moments in that room I do not know. I stole out of the library. I was obsessed with the thought that I must see Travers, see him at all costs before he got away from the house. I reached the end of the hall as the room door opened and he came out. It was dark, as I said, and I could not see distinctly, but I could make out his form. He closed the door behind him, and then I called his name in a whisper. He took a quick step toward me, then turned and hurried toward the front door, and I thought he was going away. But the next instant I understood his ruse. He opened the front door, shut it again quite loudly, and crept back to me. "'Take me somewhere where we will be safe, quick,' he whispered. There was only one place where I was sure we would be safe. I led him to the rear of the house and up the servants' stairs and to my boudoir. She broke off abruptly and once more rose from her chair and once more began to pace the room. Back in his chair, Jimmy Dale, tense and motionless now, watched her without a word. It would take too long to tell you all that passed between us, she went on hurriedly. The man was frankly a criminal, but not to the extent of murder, and in that respect at least he was honest with himself. Almost the first words he said to me were, Miss LaSalle, I am as good as a dead man if I am caught by the devils behind those two men downstairs. And then he began to plead with me to make my own escape. He did not know who the man was that was posing as my uncle, had never seen him before until he presented himself as Henry LaSalle. The other man he knew as Clark, but knew also that Clark was merely an assumed name. He had fallen in with Clark almost from the time that he had begun to practice his profession, and at Clark's instigation had gone from one crooked deal to another, and had made a great deal of money. He knew that behind Clark was a powerful, daring, and unscrupulous band of criminals, organized on a gigantic scale, of which he himself was, in a sense, a probationary sense, as he put it, a member. But he had never come into direct contact with them. He had received all his orders and instructions through Clark. He had been told by Clark that he was to cultivate father following the introduction, to win father's confidence, to get as many of father's affairs into his hands as possible, to reach the position, in fact, of becoming father's recognized attorney, and all this with the object, as he supposed, of embezzling from father on a large scale. Then father died, and Travers was instructed to cable my uncle. He knew that the man who answered that summons was an impostor, but he did not know until he had admitted it to him that night that both my father and my uncle had been murdered, and that I, too, was to be made away with. She looked at Jimmy Dale and suddenly laughed out bitterly. No, you don't understand even yet the patient, ingenious deviltry of those fiends. It was they, at the time the new will was drawn, who offered to buy out my real uncle's sheep ranch in that lonely, unsettled district in Australia, and offered him that new position in New Zealand. My uncle never reached New Zealand. He was murdered on his way there, and in his place, assuming his name, appeared the man who has been posing as my uncle ever since. Do you begin to see? For five years they were patiently working out their plans. For five years before my father's death that man lived and became known and accepted and established himself as Henry LaSalle. 
Do you see now why he cabled us to postpone our visit? He ran very little risk. The chances were one in a thousand that any of his few acquaintances in Australia would ever run across him in New Zealand. And besides, he was chosen because it seems there was a slight resemblance between him and the real Henry LaSalle. Enough, with his changed mode of living and more elaborate and pretentious surroundings, to have enabled him to carry through a bluff had it become necessary. He had all of my uncle's papers, and the crime club furnished him with every detail of our lives here. I forgot to say, too, that from the moment my uncle was supposed to have reached New Zealand, all his letters were typewritten, and evidence in father's eyes that his brother had secured a position of some importance. As, indeed, from apparently unprejudiced sources, they took pains to assure father was a fact. This left them with only my uncle's signature to forge to the letters, not a difficult matter for them. Believing that they had Travers so deeply implicated that he could do nothing, even if he had the inclination which they had not for a moment imagined, and arrogant in the belief in their own power to put him out of the way in any case if he proved refractory, they admitted all this to him that night when he brought up the issue of the real Henry LaSalle, putting in an appearance sooner or later, and when they wanted him to smooth their path by releasing all documents where his power of attorney was involved. Do you see now the part they gave Travers to play? It was to put the stamp of genuineness upon the false Henry LaSalle. Not but that they were prepared with what would appear to be overwhelmingly convincing evidence to prove it if it were necessary. But if the man were accepted by the estate's lawyer, there was little chance of anyone else questioning his identity. She halted again by the table, and forced a smile as her eyes met Jimmy Dale's. I'm almost through, Jimmy. That night was a terrible one for both of us. Travers' life was not worth a moment's purchase once they found him, and mine was only under reprieve until sufficient time to obviate suspicion should have elapsed after father's death. We had no proof that would stand in any court, even if we should have been given the chance to adopt that course. And without absolute irrefutable proof, it was all so cleverly woven, stretched over so many years, that our charge must have been held to be too visionary and fantastic to have any basis in fact. All Travers would have been able to advance was the statement that the supposed Henry LaSalle had admitted being an impostor and a murderer to him. Who would believe it? On the face of it, it appeared to be an absurdity, and even granted that we were given an opportunity to bring the charge, they would be able to prove by a hundred influential and well-known men in New Zealand that the impostor was really Henry LaSalle, and were we able to find any of my uncle's old acquaintances in Australia, it would be necessary to get them here, and not one of them would have reached America alive. But there was not a chance, not a chance, Jimmy, of doing that. They would have killed Travers the moment he showed himself in the open. The only thing we could do that night was to try and save our own lives. The only thing we could look forward to was acquiring, in some way, unknown to them, the proof, fully established, with which we could crush them in a single stroke, and before they would have time to strike back. The vital thing was proof of my uncle's death. That, if it could be obtained at all, could only be obtained in Australia. Travers was obliged to go somewhere, to disappear from that moment, if he wanted to save his life, and he volunteered to go out there. He left the house that night by the back entrance in an old servant's suit, which I found for him, and I never heard from him again until a month ago in the personal column of the Morning News Argus, through which we had agreed to communicate. As for myself, I left the house the next morning, telling my pseudo-uncle that I was going to spend a few days with a friend, and this I actually did, 
but in those few days I managed to turn all my own securities that had been left me by my mother, and which amounted to a considerable sum, into cash. And then, Jimmy, I came to this. I have lived like this, and in different disguises, as a settlement worker, as a widow of means in a fashionable uptown apartment, but mostly, as you see me now, for five years. For five years I have watched my supposed uncle, hoping, praying, that through him I could get to know the others associated with him, hoping, praying, that Travers would succeed, hoping, praying, that we would get them all, and watching day after day and year after year the personal column of the paper, until at last I began to be afraid that it was all useless. And there was nothing, Jimmy, nothing anywhere, and I had no success. Her voice was choked a little. Nothing. Even Clark never went again to the house. You can understand now how I came to know the strange things that I wrote to the Gray Seal, how the life that I have led, how this life here in the underworld, how the constant search for some clue on my own account brought them to my knowledge. And you can understand now, too, why I never dared to let you meet me, for I knew well enough that while I worked to undermine my father's and my uncle's murderers, they were moving heaven and earth to find me. That is all, Jimmy. The day before yesterday, a month after Travers' first message to let me know that he was coming, there was another personal, giving me an hour and a telephone number. He was back. He had everything, everything. We dared not meet. He was afraid, suspicious that they had got track of him again. You know the rest. That package contained the proof that with Travers' death can probably never be obtained again. Do you understand why they want it? Why it is life and death to me? Do you understand why my supposed uncle offered huge rewards for me? Why secretly every resource of that hideous organization has been employed to find me, that it is only by my death the estate can pass into their hands. And now... She flung out her hand suddenly toward Jimmy Dale. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy, I've, I've fought so long, alone. Jimmy, what are we to do? He came slowly to his feet. She had fought so long, alone. But now, now it was his turn to fight, for her. But how? She had not told him all. Surely she had not told him all, for everything depended upon that package. There had been so much to tell that she had not thought of all, and she had not told him the details about that. That box, number 428, he cried quickly. What is that? What does it mean? She shook her head. I do not know, she answered. Then who is this John Johansson? I do not know, she said again. Know where the crime club is? No, dully. He stared at her for a moment in a dazed way. My God, Jimmy Dale murmured. And then she turned away her head. It's, it's pretty bad, isn't it, Jimmy? I... I told you that we did not hold many trumps. End of Part 2 Chapter 9、two, Chapter 10 of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard Reading by Mary Rohde Part 2. The Woman in the Case Chapter 10. Silver Mag There was silence between them. Minute after minute passed. Neither spoke. Jimmy Dale dropped back into his chair again, and stared abstractedly before him. "'We do not hold many trumps, Jimmy. We do not hold many trumps.' Her words were repeating themselves over and over in his mind. 
they seemed to challenge him mockingly to deny what was so obviously a fact, and because he could not deny it to taunt, to jeer at him, when all that was held at stake hung literally upon his next move. He looked up mechanically, as the tocsin walked to a broken mirror at the rear of the miserable room nodded mechanically in approval as she began deftly to retouch the makeup on her face where the tears had left their traces, and resumed his abstracted gaze before him. Box number 428, John Johansson, The Crime Club, The Identity of the Man Who Was Posing as Henry LaSalle. If only he could hit upon a clue to the solution of a single one of those things— or a single phase of one of them, if only he could glimpse a ray of light that would at least prompt action when every moment of inaction was multiplying the odds against them. There were the men who were watching his house at that moment on Riverside Drive. He, as Larry the Bat, might in turn keep watch on them. He had thought of that. In time, perhaps, he might, by so doing, discover the whereabouts of the crime club. In time, it was just that he had no time. Forty-eight hours, the toxin insisted, was all the time that he could count upon before they would become suspicious of Jimmy Dale's illness, before they would discover that they were watching an empty house. He might, though this was even more hazardous, make an attempt to trace the wires that tapped those of his telephone through the basement window that gave on the garage driveway. And what then? True, they could not lead very far away, but even if successful, what then? They would not lead him to the crime club, but simply to some confederate, to some man or woman playing the part of a servant, perhaps, in the house next door, who, in turn, would have to be shadowed and watched. Jimmy Dale shook his head. Better, of the two, to start in at once and shadow those who were shadowing his house. But that was not the way. He knew that intuitively. He hated to eliminate it from consideration, for he had no other move to take its place. But such a move was almost suicide in itself. Time, and time alone, was the vital factor. They, the toxin and he, must act quickly and strike that night if they were to win. His fingers, the grimy fingers, dirty nailed, of Larry the Bat, that none now would recognize as the slim, tapering, wonderfully sensitive fingers of Jimmy Dale, the fingers that had made the name of the Gray Seal famous, whose tips mocked at bars and safes and locks, and seemed to embody in themselves all the human senses tightened spasmodically on the edge of the table. Time, time, time! It seemed to din in his ears, and while he sat there powerless, impotent, the crime club was moving heaven and earth to find what he must find, that package, if he was to save this woman here, the woman whom he loved, she who had been forced, through the machinations of these hell fiends, to adopt the life of a wretched hag, to exist among the dregs of the underworld, whose squalor and vice and wantonness none knew better than he. Jimmy Dale's face set grimly. Somewhere, somewhere in the past five years of this life of hers, in which she had been fighting the crime club, pitting that clever brain of hers against it, must lie a clue. She had told him her story only in baldest outline, with scarcely a reference to her own personal acts, with barely a single detail. There must be something, something that perhaps she had overlooked, something, just the merest hint of something that would supply a starting point, give him a glimmer of light. She came back from across the room and sank down in her chair again. She did not speak. The question that meant life and death to them both was in her eyes. Jimmy answered the mute interrogation tersely. Not yet, he said. Then, almost curtly, in a quick, incisive way, as the keen, alert brain began to delve and probe, you say this man Clark never returned to the house after that night? She nodded her head quietly. 
"'You are sure of that?' he insisted. "'Yes,' she said. "'I am sure.' "'And you say that all these years you have kept a watch on the man who is posing as your uncle, "'and that he never went anywhere or associated with anyone that would afford you a clue to this crime club?' Yes, she said again. It was a moment before Jimmy Dale spoke. It's very strange, he said musingly at last. So strange, in fact, that it's impossible. He must have communicated with the others, and communicated with them often. The game they were playing was too big, too full of details, to admit of any other possibility. And the telephone, as an explanation, isn't good enough. And yet, she said earnestly, possible or impossible, it is nevertheless true. That he might have succeeded in eluding me on occasions was perhaps to be expected, but that in all those years I should not catch him once, in what, if you are correct, must have been many and repeated conferences with the same men, is too improbable to be thought of seriously. Jimmy Dale shook his head again. If you had been able to watch him night and day, that might be so, he said crisply, but at best you could only watch him a very small portion of the time. She smiled at him a little wanly. Do you think, Jimmy, from what you as the gray seal know of me, that I would have watched in any haphazard way like that? He glanced at her with a sudden start. What do you mean? he asked quickly. Look at me, she said quietly. Have you ever seen me before? I mean, as I am now? No, he answered after an instant. Not that I know of. And yet, she smiled wanly again, you have not lived or made the place you hold in the underworld without having heard of Silver Mag. You, exclaimed Jimmy Dale, you, Silver Mag? He stared at her wonderingly, as crouch-shouldered now, the hair gray-threaded, straggling out from under the hood of a faded, dark-blue, seam-worn cloak, she sat before him, a typical creature of the underworld, her role an art in its conception, perfect in its execution. Silver Mag. Yes, he had heard of Silver Mag, as everyone in the Badlands had heard of her. Silver Mag and her pocket full of coin, always a pocket full of silver, so they said, that was dispensed prodigally to the wives and children, temporarily deprived of support by husbands and fathers, unfortunate enough in their clashes with the law, to be doing spaces up the river. And therefore the underworld swore by Silver Mag, always silver, never a bill. Silver Mag had never been seen with a banknote. That was her eccentricity. Much or little, she gave or paid out of her pocket full of jangling silver. She was credited with being a sworn enemy of the police, and, yes, he remembered, too, with having done time herself. I don't quite understand, he said, in a puzzled way. I haven't run across you personally, because you probably took care to see that I shouldn't. But it's no secret. Everyone says you've served a jail sentence yourself. That is simply enough explained, she answered gravely. The story is of my own making. When I decided to adopt this life, both for my own safety and as the best means of keeping a watch on that man, I knew that I must win the confidence of the underworld, that I must have help, and that in order to obtain that help, I must have some excuse for my enmity against a man known as Henry LaSalle. To be widely known in the underworld was of inestimable value. Nothing, I knew, could accomplish that as quickly as eccentricity. You see now how and why I became known as Silver Mag. I gained the confidence of every crook in New York through their wives and children. I told them the story of my jail sentence, while I swore vengeance on Henry LaSalle. I told them that he had had me arrested for something I never stole, while I was working for him as a charwoman, and that he had me railroaded to jail. There wasn't one but gave me credit for the theft, perhaps, 
but equally there wasn't one but understood, and my eccentricity helped us out, my wanting to get Henry LaSalle. Well, do you see now, Jimmy? I had money, I had the confidence of the underworld, I had an excuse for my hatred for Henry LaSalle, and so I had all the help I wanted. Day and night that man has been watched. He receives no visitors. What social life he has is, as you know, at the club. There is not a house that he has ever entered that sooner or later I have not entered after him in the hope of finding the headquarters of the clique. Even the men and women, as far as human possibility could accomplish it, that he has talked to on the streets have been shadowed and their identity satisfactorily established, and the net result has been failure, utter, absolute, complete failure. Jimmy Dale's eyes, that had held steadily on her face, shifted, troubled and perplexed, to the tabletop. "'You are wonderful,' he said under his breath. "'Wonderful! And, and that makes it all the more amazing, all the more incomprehensible. It is still impossible that he has not been in close and constant touch with his accomplices. He must have been. We would be blind fools to argue against it. It could not, on the face of it, have been otherwise.' "'Then how, when, where has he done it?' she asked wearily. "'God knows,' he said bitterly. "'And if they have been clever enough to escape you all these years, "'I am almost inclined to say what you said a little while ago, "'that we're beaten.' "'She watched him miserably as he pushed back his chair impulsively "'and standing up stared down at her. "'We're against it hard,' he said with a mirthless laugh. Then, his lips tightening, but we'll try another tack, the chauffeur, Travers. Though even here the crime club has a day's start of us, even if last night they knew no more about the whereabouts of that package than we know now. I'm afraid of it. The chances are more than even that they've already got it. If they were able to catch Travers as the chauffeur, they would have had something tangible to work back from. Jimmy Dale was talking more to himself than to the toxin now, as though he were muttering his thoughts aloud. How did they get track of him? When? Where? What has it led to? And what in heaven's name, he burst out suddenly, is this box number 428? A safety deposit vault, perhaps, that he has taken somewhere, she hazarded. Jimmy Dale laughed mirthlessly again. That is the one definite thing I do know, that it isn't, he said positively. It is nothing of that kind. It was half past ten o'clock at night when I met him, and he said he had intended going back for the package if it had been safe to do so. Deposit vaults are not open at that hour. The package is, or was, if they have not already got it, readily accessible, and at any hour. Now go over everything again, every detail that passed between you and Travers. He let you know that he was back in New York by means of a personal, you said. What else was in that personal besides the telephone number and the hour you were to call him? Anything? Nothing that will help us any, she replied colorlessly. There were simply the words... Northeast corner of Sixth Avenue and Waverly Place, and the signature that we had agreed upon, the two first and two last letters of the alphabet transposed. B A Z Y. I see, said Jimmy Dale quickly, and over the phone he completed his message. Clever enough. Yes, she said. In that way, if anyone were listening or overheard the plan, there could be little harm come of it, for the essential feature of all, the place of rendezvous, was not mentioned. It has not been Travers' fault that this happened, and in spite of every precaution it has cost him his life. He wanted nothing to give them a clue to my whereabouts. He was trying to guard against the slightest evidence that would associate us one with the other. He even warned me over the phone not to tell him how, where, or the mode of life I was living, 
and naturally he dared give me no particulars about himself. I was simply to select a third party whom I could trust, and to follow out his instructions, which were those that I sent to you in my letter. Jimmy Dale began to pace nervously up and down the room. "'Nothing else?' he queried a little blankly. "'Nothing else,' she said monotonously. "'But since last night, since you knew that things had gone wrong,' he persisted, "'surely you traced that telephone number, the one you called up.' "'Yes,' she said, and shrugged her shoulders in a tired way. "'Naturally I did that, but, like everything else, it amounted to nothing.' He telephoned from Makoff's pawn shop on that alley off Thompson Street, and... Where? Jimmy Dale suddenly stock still almost shouted the word. He telephoned from where? Say that again. She looked at him in amazement, half rising from her chair. Jimmy, what is it? she cried. You don't mean that... He was beside her now. His hands pressed upon her shoulders, his face flushed. Box number 428... He laughed out hysterically in his excitement. John Johansson, box number 428. And like a fool, I never thought of it. Don't you see? Don't you know now yourself? The underground post office. She stood up, clinging to him. A wild relief that was based on her confidence in him, in her eyes and face, even while she shook her head. No, she said frantically. No, I do not know. Tell me, Jimmy, tell me quickly. You mean the Makoffs? No, not Makoffs. At Spider Jack's, on Thompson Street. He was clipping off his words, still holding her tightly by the shoulders, still staring into her eyes. You know Spider Jack? Jack's little novelty store? Ah, you have not learned all of the underworld yet. Spider Jack is the craftiest fence in the Badlands, and Makoff is his partner. Spider buys the crook stuff, and Makoff disposes of it through the pawn shop. It's only a step through the connecting backyard from one to the other, and— Yes, but, she interrupted feverishly, the package, you said— Wait, Jimmy Dale cried, I'm coming to that. If Travers stood in with Makoff, he stood in with Spider Jack. For years Spider has been a sort of clearing house for the underworld. For years he has conducted— and profitably, too, his underground post office. Crooks from all over the country, let alone those in New York, communicate with each other through Spider Jack. These, for a fee, are registered at Spider's, and given a number, a box number, he calls it, though, of course, there are no actual boxes. Letters come by mail addressed to him, the sealed envelope within containing the actually intended recipient's name, these spider either forwards or delivers in person when they are called for. Dozens of crooks, too, unwilling perhaps to dispose of small ill-gotten articles at ruinous fence prices, and finding it unhealthy for the moment to keep them in their possession, use this means of depositing them temporarily for safe keeping. You see now, don't you? It's certain that's where Travers left the package. He used the name of John Johansson, not to hoodwink Spider Jack, I should say, but as an added safeguard against the crime club. Travers must have known both Makoff and Spider Jack in the old days, and probably had reason, and good reason, to trust them both. Possibly a crook then himself, as he confessed, he may have acted in a legal capacity for them in their frequent tangles with the police. Then, she said, and there was a glad new note in her voice, then, Jimmy, Jimmy, we are safe. You can get it, Jimmy. It is only a little thing for the gray seal to do, to get it now that we know where it is. Yes, he said tersely. Yes, if it is still there. Still there, she repeated the words quickly, nervously. Still there, what do you mean? I mean, if they too have not discovered that he was at Makoff's, if they have not got there first he said grimly. There seems to be no limit to their cleverness or their power. They penetrated his disguise as a chauffeur, and who knows what more they have learned since last night. We are fighting them in the dark, and— What's that? he whispered tensely, suddenly. 
and leaning forward like a flash as he whipped his automatic from his pocket, he blew out the lamp. The room was in darkness. They stood there rigid, silent, listening. Her hand found and caught his arm. And then it came again, a low sound, the sound of a stealthy footstep just outside the window that faced on the storage yard. End of Part 2, Chapter 10「Part Two, Chapter Eleven, of the Adventures of Jimmy Dale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard. Reading by Lars Rolander. Part Two. THE WOMAN IN THE CASE CHAPTER Eleven, THE MAGPIE A minute passed, another, the automatic at Jimmie Dale's hip, the muscle just peeping over the tabletop, held a steady bead on the window. Came the footstep again, and then, suddenly, a series of low, quick tappings upon the window pane. The tocsin's hand slipped away from his arm. Jimmy Dale's set face relaxed as he read the underground morse, and he replaced his revolver slowly in his pocket. "'The magpie,' said Jimmy Dale in an undertone. "'What's he want?' "'I don't know,' she answered in a whisper. "'He never came here before. There's a back way out, Jimmy, if you—' "'No,' he said quickly. "'We've enemies enough without making one of the magpie. He knows someone is here with you. Our shadows were on the blind.' Don't queer yourself. Let him in. I light the lamp. He struck a match as she ran from the room, and, lifting the hot lamp chimney with the edge of his ragged coat, lighted the lamp. He turned the wick down a little, shading and dimming the room, and then, as he flirted a bead of moisture from his forehead, whimsically stretched out his hand to watch it in the lamplight. That's bad, Jimmy he muttered gravely to himself, as he noted an almost imperceptible tremor. "'Got a start, didn't you? Under a bit of strain, eh?' "'Well,' grimly, "'never mind. It looks as though the luck had turned Mac off and spidered Jack.' His hand reached up to his hat, jerked the brim at a rakish angle over his eyes, and he sprawled himself out on a chair. He heard the tocsin's voice at the front door and a man's voice, low and guarded, answer her. Then the door closed, and their steps approached the room. It was rather curious that a visit from the magpie. What could the magpie want? What could there be in common between the magpie and silver mag? The magpie, alias Slimmy Joe, was counted the cleverest safe worker in the United States, bearing only and always one. A smile flickered across the lips of Larry the Bat, one whose preeminence the magpie, much to his own chagrin, admitted himself the grey seal. He looked up, twisting the stub of a cigarette between his grimy fingers and fumbling for a match, as the tocsin and behind her the magpie, short, slim and wiry, shrewd-faced, with sharp, quick-glancing little black eyes, entered the room. "'Hello, Larry,' grinned the magpie. "'Got your breath back yet? "'I felt it through the window-pane when yours let go at the lamp.' "'Hello, Slimy,' returned Jimmy Dale ungraciously, speaking through the corner of his mouth. "'Forget it.' "'Sure,' said the magpie unconcernedly. He stared about him, and finally, drawing a chair up to the table, sat down, motioned the tocsin to do the same, and leaned forward amiably. "'I didn't mean to throw no scare into you,' he said in a conciliating tone. "'But I had a little business with Mag, and I was kind of interested in whether she was entertaining company or not, see. I didn't know you and Mag was working together.' "'Mabby,' observed Jimmy Dale as ungraciously as before, "'mabby there's some more things you don't know.' "'Ow, oh, cough up the grouch, advised the magpie, with a hint of impatience creeping into his voice. "'You don't need to be sore all night. 
I told youse I wasn't tryin' to hand youse one, didn't I?" "Never mind, Larry Slimmy," put in the Tocsin petulantly. "He's down on his luck, dat's all! He ain't had de price of a pinch of coke fer two days!" "Oho!" exclaimed the Magpie, grinning again. "So dat's wot's givin' youse de pip, eh, Larry? Well, den, say, youse can take it from me dat mabbe youse'll be glad I blew around. I was lookin' fer a guy about yer size fer a little job to night, an' I wasn't thinkin' of lettin' young Dutch see in on it. But seem youse are here and in wid Mag, and dat I got to get Mag in, too. Youse are on, if you say de word." "'What's the lay?' inquired Larry the Bat, unbending a little. The magpie cocked his eye and stuck his tongue in his cheek. "'Good night!' he said tersely. Nothing like that. Are yous on or ain't yous? Well, then, what's in it for me? persisted Larry the Bat. More'n the price of a coke sneeze, returned the magpie pertinently. There's a century note for yous, and maybe two or three of them for Mag. Larry the Bat's eyes gleamed avariciously. Oh, Quit your kiddin', he said gruffly. A century note for me? That's what I said. You's heard me, rejoined the magpie shortly. Only if it listens good to yous now. I don't want to squeal in after the divvy. I'm taking the chances. Yous has the soft end of it. One century note for yous, and the rest is none of your business. That's putting it straight, ain't it? Well, what you say, Anne, say it quick, cause if yous ain't comin' in, yous can beat it out of here so's I can talk to Mag. There ain't nothing I would take a chance on for a hundred plunks, declared Larry the Bat with sudden fervency, and stared anxiously expectant at the magpie. Sure I'm on, Slimmy, sure I am. Cut it loose, spill the story. Well then, said the magpie, I want... You ain't through yet, interrupted the tocsin tartly. I ain't heard you asking me nothing. I ain't on me uppers like Larry, and maybe the price don't cut so much ease. See? Oh, said the magpie with a smirk, I don't have to ask you on this lay. This is where you's come in on it for marbles. Say, this is where we gets the hook into a guy by the name of Henry LaSalle. Get me? Henry LaSalle? Under the table, Jimmy Dale's hand clenched suddenly, but not a muscle of his face moved, save as with the tip of his tongue he shifted the butt of the cigarette that was hanging royally from his lower lip to the other corner of his mouth. "'Sure, she's got you, Slimmy,' he flung out with a grin as the tocsin wrinkled up her face menacingly and began to mumble to herself. "'He's the guy that handed her one when she was young, and she's been lying for him ever since.' sure i know ain't i worked him for her till i wears me shoes out trying to get something on him sure she's in on it go on slimmy what's the lay what do i do for that century the magpie hitched his chair closer to the table and as his sharp little ferret eyes glanced around the room motioned the two to bring their heads nearer one of me influential broker friends down on Wall Street put me wise, he said with a wink. That's good enough for use, too, as far as that goes. But take it from me. I got it dead straight. He lowered his voice. Say, he's one of the richest mugs in New York, ain't he? Well, he's been selling stocks and bonds all day, thousands and thousands of dollars worth for cash. All them things is always sold for cash, remarked Larry the Bat fatuously. Oh, forget it, said the magpie earnestly. For cash, I said. De coin, de long green, understand? He wasn't showing no checks for what he sold into the bank except to get them cashed. That's what he's been doing all day, getting the checks cashed and getting the money in big bills, see? I know of one bunch of eighty thousand, and that's only one. What fair? inquired Larry the Bat. 
It was the question that was pounding at his brain as he stared innocently at the magpie. What did it mean? Why was Henry LaSalle turning and, if the magpie was right, feverishly turning every security he could lay his hands on into cash? And then, in a flash, the answer came. They had not found the package. Equally to them as to the toxin, sitting there before him, it meant life and death. If the package were found by the toxin instead of themselves, the game was up. They were preparing for eventualities. If they were forced to run at a moment's notice, they at least were not going to run empty-handed. Far from empty-handed, it seemed. It would not be difficult for the state executor to realize a vast sum in short order on instantly marketable, gilt-edged securities, say half a million dollars, not very bulky either, in large bills. Five thousand hundred dollar bills would make half a million. It was astonishing how small a handbag, say, might hold a fortune. What first lay me? he inquired again, wiggling his cigarette butt on his tongue tip. What he do that fer? How the hell do you suppose I knows? demanded the magpie, politely scornful. That's his business. That ain't what's worrying me. No, sure it ain't, admitted Larry the Bat ingratingly. But go on, keep moving, Slimmy. What's he done with the stuff? Done with it? echoed the magpie with a short laugh. What do you think? He been lugging it home to his swell joint up there on the avenue and cramming his safe full of it. Larry the Bat sucked in his breath. Gee, that's soft, he muttered, and then suddenly, as though with painful inspiration, Say, Slimmy, say, are you sure you ain't been handed a steer? The magpie grinned wickedly. I ain't falling for steers, he said shortly. This is on the level. Jimmy Day lurched up from his chair, and, leaning over the lamp chimney, drew wheezily on his cigarette to get a light. His eyes sought the toxin's face. To all intents and purposes she was entirely absorbed in the magpie. He sat down again to gape with a well-stimulated dog-like admiration at Slimmy Joe. Was this, too, a plant? Why had the magpie come to them with the story of Henry LaSalle? And then, the next instant, as the magpie spoke, his suspicions were allayed. Let's get down to cases, the magpie invited crisply. I didn't blow in here just by luck. This Henry LaSalle is the guy you's worked for once, ain't he, Mag? That's the spiel, ain't it? He sent you up for pinching the tax out of his carpets. I never pinched nothing, snarled Silver Mag truculently. He's a dirty liar. I never did. Cut it out. Cut it out. Can that? complained the magpie patiently. The point is, you worked in his house, didn't you? Sure I did, snapped the toxin, sullenly aggressive. But, well, then that's what I want. That's what I come for. Mag, a plan of the house, say. Jimmy Dale could feel the toxin's eyes upon him, questioning, searching, seeking a cue. A plan of the house? Yes or no? And a decision on the instant. "'Sure,' said Larry the Bat brightly. "'That's what I was thinking you were after all the time. "'Say, you are all right, Slimmy. "'You are the kind to work with. "'Go on, Mag, draw the dope for Slimmy. "'That's better than trying to put one over on the swell guy. "'This'll make him squeal fair fair.' "'The magpie produced a pencil and a piece of paper from his pocket "'and laid them on the table in front of the toxin. "'There you are,' he announced. Help yourself, and go to it, Mag. The toxin, evidently not quite certain of her part, wet the pencil doubtfully on the end of her tongue. I ain't never drawed plans, she said anxiously. Maybe, she glanced at Jimmy Dale, maybe I don't know how to do it right. Ah, go ahead, nodded Larry the Bat. Yous can do it right, Mag. Yous don't have to make no oil painting. All the magpie wants is the doors and windows, eh, Slimmy? Sure, agreed the magpie encouragingly. That's all, Mag. 
Just mark the rooms out on the first floor and the basement. Yous can explain what yous are doin' as yous go along. I'll get yous. The tocsin cackled maliciously in assent, and then, while the magpie got up from his chair and stood peering over her shoulder, she began to draw laboriously, her brows knitted, the pencil hooked awkwardly between cramped-up forefinger and thumb. Larry the Bat slouched forward over the table, his chin in his hands, appeared to watch the proceedings with mild interest, but his eyes, like a hawk's, were following every line on the paper, transferring them to his brain, photographing every detail of the plan in his mind. And as he watched, there seemed something that was near to ASM of all that was ironical with the magpie standing there, his sharp little black eyes drinking in greedily the tocsin's work, in the tocsin herself aiding and abetting in the projected theft of her own money. How far would he let the magpie go? He did not know. Perhaps, who would could tell, all the way, between now and then there lay that package. If it were at Makoff's, at Spider Jack's, if he could find it, get it, the magpie, as a temporary custodian of the estate's money, would at least preclude its loss by flight if the crime club took alarm too quickly. Larry the Bat's eyes, under half-closed lids, rested musingly on the magpie's face. The magpie would not get very far away with it. On the other hand, if he failed at Spider Jack's, if, after all, he was wrong, and the package had never been there, or if they had forestalled him, turned the trick upon him, already secured it, then Larry the Bat's lips, working on his cigarette, formed in a twisted smile, then, well then, that was quite another matter. Perhaps he and the magpie might not agree so far. A half million dollars was perhaps not much out of eleven millions, but it was a salvage not to be despised. Why did he say half a million? Well, why not? If the magpie knew of a single transaction of eighty thousand, and there had been many transactions during the day, a half million was little likely to prove an exaggeration, and the less likely in view of the fact that, if those in the crime club were preparing for an emergency, they would not stint themselves in the disposal of securities. The magpie was keeping up a running fire of questions, as the tocsin toiled on with her pencil. Where did the hall lead to? How many windows in the library? Did she remember the kind of fastenings? Did the servant sleep in the basement or above? And finally, twice over, as she finished the clumsy drawing and pushed it toward him, he demanded minute details of the position of the safe. Ow, oh, that's all right, Slimmy, Larry the Bat cut in airily. If yous forget anything when yous get in there, yous can ask me. I got it kinched. The magpie folded the paper and stowed it carefully away in his pocket. "'Ask you, say,' eh? he grunted sarcastically. "'And where do you think you'll be about that time?' "'In there with you, of course,' replied Larry the Bat promptly. "'That's what you said.' "'Yes, you will not,' announced the magpie with cold finality. "'Do you think I want to queer myself?' A hot one used be on the inside job. Yous'll be outside, with your people skinned for the bulls. Yous and Mag here too. See? Get that straight. While I'm on the job, yous two plays the game. Now yous listen to me, both of yous. Don't start nothing, unless yous has to. If it's a kinch, I got to make a getaway. Yous two start a drunk fight. Get me? Yous no delay. Throw the talk loud and I'll fade. That's all. We'll crack the crib early. It'll be quiet enough up there by one o'clock. One o'clock? Larry the Bat shook his head. What time was it now? It was about nine when he had first met the tocsin. Then the sanctuary. Then the long walk as he had followed her. Say, a quarter of ten for that. And he had certainly been here with her not less than an hour and a half. It must be after eleven, then. One o'clock. And before that must come Makoff and Spider Jack. 
the night that half an hour ago had seemed so sterile was crowding a program of events upon him now too fast nothing doing he said thoughtfully you are in wrong dear slimmy one o'clock don't go say take it from me i watched that guy too many nights for mag tain't often he leaves the club before one o'clock and he ain't never in bed before two all right agreed the magpie after a moment's reflection you ought to know make it three o'clock he pulled a cigar from his pocket lighted it and leaning back in his chair stuck his feet up on the table if you don't mind mag i'll stick around a while he decided calmly maybe the less i'm seen to-night the better and i guess there won't be nobody looking for me here larry the bat coughed suddenly and rose up a little heavily from his chair he had not counted on that if the magpie was settling down for a prolonged stay it devolved upon him jimmy dale to get away and at once and without exciting the magpie's suspicions he coughed again looked nervously from the tocsin to the magpie stammered swallowed hard and coughed once more well what's bitten yours inquired the magpie ironically nothing said larry the bat and hesitated nothing only he hesitated again and then the words in a rush say slimmy couldn't you come across with a piece of that century now what fair demanded the magpie a little aggressively larry the bat cleared his throat with a desperate effort you snows he admitted sheepishly just scream me the price of one slimmy just one coke exploded the magpie and get soaked to the eyes not by a damn sight no honest to god no slimmy just one pleaded larry the bat nix said the magpie shortly larry the bat thrust out a hand before the magpie's eyes that shook tremulously i've got to have it he declared with sudden fierceness i got to see look at me i ain't going to be no good to-night if i don't i tell yous i got to i ain't going to row yous down slimmy honest i ain't just one and it'll set me up if i don't get none i'll be on the rocks before morning that's straight slimmy ask mag she knows oh let him go get it broke in the tocsin wearily that's the best thing yous can do slimmy dear all like when they gets in his class yous cocaine sniffers gives me dead peep snorted the magpie in disgust he dug down into his pocket produced a bill and flung it across the table to larry the bat well there yous are but yous can take it from me larry that if yous get whiffed he swore threateningly i'll crack every bone in your face get me slimmy said larry the bat fervently grabbing at the bill with a hungry hand yous can count on me i'll be up there on the job before yous are three o'clock eh oh, well so long slimmy he slouched eagerly to the door so long mag he paused on the threshold for a single quick-flung significant glance say yous on the avenue mag i'll be up there before you sir so long oh so long said the tocsin contemptuously and an instant later jimmy dale closed the outer door behind him end of part two chapter eleven the magpie from the adventures of jimmy dale by frank l packard read by lars rolander part two chapter twelve of the adventures of jimmy dale this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the adventures of jimmy dale by frank l packard reading by lars rolander part two the woman in the case chapter twelve john johansson four to eight nearly midnight already 
It was even later than he had thought. Larry the Bat pressed his face against the shop's window pane on the Bowery for a glance at a clock that had caught his eyes on the wall within. Nearly midnight. He slouched on again hurriedly, still debating in his mind, as he had been debating it all the way from the Toxans, the question of returning again to the sanctuary. So far the way both to Spider Jack's and the sanctuary had been in the same direction. But the sanctuary was on the next street. Jimmie Dale reached the corner and hesitated. It was strange how strong was the intuition upon him tonight that bade him go on and make all speed to Spider Jack's, while equally strong was the cold, stubborn logic that bade him go first to the sanctuary. There were things that he needed there that would probably be absolutely essential to him before the night was out, things without which he might be so badly handicapped as to invite failure from the start. And yet it was already midnight. Ostensibly both Makoff and Spider Jack closed their places at eleven. But that might mean anything, depending upon their own respective inclinations or on what of their own peculiar brand of deviltry might be afoot. If they were still about, still in evidence, he was still too early. Midnight though it was, though, on the other hand, if the coast was clear, he could ill afford to lose a moment of the time between now and the hour that the magpie had planned for the robbery of Henry LaSalle. For it would not be an easy matter even once inside Spider Jack's, to find that package, since it was Spider's open boast that things committed to his care were where the police or anyone else might as well whistle and suck their thumbs as try to find them. And then, with sudden decision, taking his hesitation as it were by the throat, Jimmie Dale hurried on again to the sanctuary. At most it could delay him but another fifteen minutes, and by half-past twelve, or a quarter to one at the latest, he would be at Spider Jack's. Disdaining the secrecy of the side door on the alley, for who had a better right, or was better known there than Larry the Bat, a tenant of years, he entered the tenement by the front door, scuffled up the stairs to the first landing, and let himself into his disreputable room. He locked the door behind him, lighted the choked and wheezy gas jet, in a single, sharp-flung glance assured himself that the blinds were tightly shut, and, kneeling in the far corner, threw back the oilcloth and lifted up the low section of the flooring beneath. He reached inside, fumbling under the neatly folded cloth of Jimmy Dale, and, in a moment, laid his leather girdle with his kit of burglar's tools on the floor beside him and beside that again an electric flashlight, a black silk mask, and what he had never expected to use again when, early the night before, he had, as he had believed, put it away forever, the thin metal insignia case of the grey seal. Another moment, and, with the flooring replaced, the oilcloth rolled back into position, he had stripped off his coat, and was pulling his spotted greasy shirt off over his head, then, stooping quickly, he picked up the girdle, put it on, put on his shirt again over it, put on his coat, put the metal case, the flashlight, and the mask in his pockets. And once more, the sanctuary was in darkness. It was perhaps fifteen minutes later that Jimmy Dale turned into the upper section of Thompson Street. Here he slowed his pace, that had been almost a run since he had left the sanctuary and began to shuffle leisurely along, for the street that a few hours before would have been choked with its push-carts and vendors, its half-necked children playing where they could find room in the gutters, its sidewalks thronged with shawled women and picturesquely dressed earring dark-visaged men, a scene, as it were, transported from some foreign land, was still far from deserted. The quiet, if quiet it could be called, was but comparative. There were many yet about, and he had no desire to attract attention by any evidence of undue haste, and besides, 
Spider Jacks was just ahead, making the corner of the alleyway a few hundred feet farther on, and he had very good reasons for desiring to approach Spider's little novelty store at a pace that would afford him every opportunity for observation. On he shuffled along the street until, reaching Spider Jacks, a little two-storied tumble-down brick structure, a muttered exclamation of satisfaction escaped him. The shop was closed and dark, and, though Spider Jack lived above the store, there were no lights even in the upper windows. Spider Jack, presumably, was either out or in bed. So far, then, he could have asked for nothing more. Jimmy Dale edged in close to the building as he slouched by, so close that his hat brim seemed to touch the window pane. It was possible that from a room at the rear of the store there might be a light with a tell-tale ray perhaps filtering through, say, a door crack, but there was nothing, only blackness within. He paused at the corner of the building by the alleyway. Down here, Adjoining the high board fence of Spider Jack's backyard, Makoff made pretense as pawnbrokering in a small and dingy wooden building that was little more pretentious than a shed, and in Makoff's place, so far as he could see, there was no light either. Jimmy Dale's fingers were industriously rolling a cigarette as, under the brim of his slouch hat, his eyes were noting every detail around him. A yard in, against the wall of Spider Jack's, the wall cutting of the rays of the street lamp at a sharp angle, it was shadowy and black. And beyond that, farther in, the alleyway was like a pit. It would take less, far less than the fraction of a second to gain that yard. But someone was approaching behind him, and a little group of people loitered, with annoying persistency, directly across the way on the other side of the street. Jimmy Dale stuck the cigarette between his lips, fumbled in his pockets, and finally produced a box of matches. The group opposite was moving on now. The footsteps he had heard behind him, those of a man, drew nearer, the man passed by, and the box of matches in Jimmy Dale's hand dropped to the ground. He reached to pick them up, and in his stooping posture, without seeming to turn his head, flung a quick glance behind him up the street. No one, for that fraction of a second that he needed, was near enough to see, and, in that fraction of a second, Jimmy Dale disappeared. A dozen yards down the lane he sprang for the top of the high fence, gripped it, and, lithe and active as a cat, swung himself up and over and dropped noiselessly to the ground on the other side. Here he stood motionless for a moment, close against the fence to get his bearings. The rear of Spider Jack's building loomed up before him, the back windows as unlighted as those in front. Luck so far, at least, was with him. He turned and looked about him, and his eyes growing accustomed to the darkness, he could just make out Mako's place, bordering the end of the yard, nor from this new vantage point could he discover any more than before, a single sign of life about the pawnbroker's establishment. Jimmy Dale stole forward across the yard, mounted the three steps of the low stoop at Spider Jack's back door, and tried the door cautiously. It was locked. From his pocket came the small steel instrument that had stood Larry the Bat in good steed a hundred times before in similar circumstances. He inserted it in the keyhole, worked deftly with it for an instant, and tried the door again. It was still locked. And then Jimmy Dale smiled, almost apologetically. Spider Jack did not use ordinary locks on his back door. The discountenanced instrument went back into his pocket, and now Jimmy Dale's hand slipped inside his shirt, and from one of the little upright pockets of the leather belt, and from still another, and from after that a third, came the vicious little blued steel tools. The sensitive fingers travelled slowly up and down the side of the door, and then he was at work in earnest. A minute passed, another. There was a dull, low, grating sound, a snick as of metal yielding suddenly, and Jimmy Dale was coolly stowing away his tools again, inside his shirt. He pushed the door open an inch, listened, 
then swung it wide, stepped inside, and closed it behind him. A round white beam of light flashed in a quick circle and went out. It was a sort of storeroom, innocent enough and orderly enough in appearance, bare-floored with boxes and packing cases piled neatly against the walls. In one corner a staircase led to the story above, and from above, quite audibly, he caught the sound of snoring. Spider Jack was in bed then. Directly facing him was the open door of another room, and Jimmy Dale, moving softly forward, entered it. He had never been in Spider Jack's before, and his first concern was to form an intimate acquaintanceship with his surroundings. Again the flashlight circled and again went out. No windows, muttered Jimmy Dale under his breath. Nothing very fancy about the architecture. Three rooms in a row. Store in front of this room, through that door, of course. Wonder if the door's locked, though it's a foregone conclusion the package wouldn't be in there. Not a sound, his tread silent. He crossed to the closed door that he had noticed. It was unlocked, and he opened it tentatively a little way. A faint glow of light diffused itself through the opening. Jimmy Dale nodded his head and closed the door again. The street lamp shining through the shop windows accounted for the light. And now the flashlight played with steady inquisitiveness about him. The room in which he stood seemed to combine a sort of office with a lounging room in which Spider Jack no doubt entertained his particular cronies. There was table in the centre, cards still upon it, chairs about it. Against the wall farthest away from the shop stood a huge old-fashioned cabinet, and a little farther along, angle-wise, partitioning off the corner, as it were, hung for some purpose or other a cretonne curtain. Also, against the wall next to the lane, bringing a commiserating smile to Jimmy Dale's lips as his eyes fell upon it, was a clumsy, lumbering, antique safe. Jimmy Dale's eyes returned to the curtain. What was it doing there? What was it for? Instinctively he stepped over to examine it. A single glance, however, as he lifted it aside sufficed. It was nothing but a makeshift cloth closet. He turned from it, switched off the flashlight, and stood staring meditatively into the darkness. In a strange house, with the knowledge to begin with that what he sought was carefully hidden, it was no sinecure to find that package. He had never for a moment imagined that it would be. But of one thing, however, there was no uncertainty in his mind. He would get the package, by search if possible, by other means if search failed. It was now close to one o'clock. If by two o'clock his efforts had been fruitless, Spider Jack would hand over the package at the revolver point. It was quite simple. Meanwhile, Jimmy Dale shrugged his shoulders and, going over to safe, knelt down in front of it. Meanwhile, as well begin here as anywhere else. The trained fingers closed on the handle, and on the instant, as though in startled amazement, shifted to the dial. They came back to the handle, a wrench, then a low, amused chuckle, and the door swung open. The great unwieldy thing was only a monumental bluff. It not only had not been locked, but it could not be locked. The mechanism was out of order. The bolts could not be moved by so much as a hair's breadth. Still chuckling, Jimmy Dale shot the flashlight stray into the interior of the safe, and the chuckle died on his lips, and into his face came a look of strange bewilderment. Inside everything was in chaos books, papers, a miscellany of articles, as though they had been ruthlessly pulled out on the floor, then gathered up in an armful and crammed back inside again. For an instant he did not move, and then a queer, hard, mirthless smile drew down the corners of his mouth. With a sort of bitter, expectant nod of his head, he turned the light upon the door of the safe. Yes, there were the scratches that the tools had left, and, as though in sardonic jest, the holes where the steel bit had bored 
were plugged with putty and rubbed over with some black substance that was still wet and came off, smearing his finger as he touched it. It could not have been done long ago, then. How long? A half hour? An hour? Not more than that. Mechanically he closed the door of the safe, rose to his feet, and almost heedless of noise now, the flashlight ray dancing before him, he jumped across to the old-fashioned cabinet and pulled the door open. Here, as within the safe, all inside, plain evidence of thorough, if hasty search, was scattered and tossed about in hopeless confusion. He shut the cabinet door. The flashlight went out, and he stood like a man stunned, the sense of some abysmal disaster upon him. He was too late. The game was up. If it had ever been here, the package was gone now. Gone. The crime club had been here before him. The game was up. The game was up. His mind seemed to keep on repeating that. The crime club had beaten him by an hour, at most, and had been here, and had searched. It was strange, though, that they should have been at such curious pains to cover their tracks by leaving the room in order, by such paltry efforts to make the safe appear untouched, when the first glance that was at all critical would disclose immediately what had been done. Why should they need to cover their tracks at all? Or, if it was necessary, why, above all, in such a pitiful, inadequate way? His mind barked back to the same ghastly refrain. The game was up. No, not yet. There was still a chance. There was still Spider Jack. Suppose, in spite of their search, they had failed to find the package. Jimmy Dale's lips set in a thin line as he stared abruptly toward the door. There was still that chance, and one thing was grimly certain. Spider Jack would at least show him where the package had been. And then, halfway to the door, he halted suddenly and stood still, listening. An electric bell was ringing loudly, imperiously somewhere upstairs, followed almost immediately the sound of someone, Spider Jack presumably, moving hurriedly about overhead, and then, a moment later, steps coming down the staircase in the adjoining room. Jimmy Dale drew back, flattening himself against the wall. Spider Jack entered the room, stumbled across it in the darkness, fumbled for the door that led into his little shop, opened it, passed through, fumbled around in there again, for matches evidently, then lighted a gas jet in the store, and going to the street door, opened it. Jimmy Dale had edged along the wall a little to a position where he had an unobstructed view through the open doorway, connecting the shop and the room in which he stood. Spider Jack in trousers and shirt, hastily donned, no doubt, as he had got out of bed, was standing in the street doorway, and beyond him loomed the forms of several men. Spider Jack stepped aside to allow his visitors to enter, and suddenly a cry barely suppressed upon his lips. Jimmy Dale involuntarily strained forward. Three men had entered, but his eyes were fixed, fascinated, upon only one, the first of the three. Was it an hallucination? Was he mad? Dreaming? It was Hilton Travers, the chauffeur, the man whom he could have sworn he had last seen dead, lashed in that chair, in that ghastly death's chamber of the crime club. Rather rough on you, Spider, to pull you out of bed at this hour, the chauffeur was saying apologetically. Oh, that's all right, seeing it's you, Travers, Spider Jack answered, gruffly amiable. Only, I was kind of looking for you last night. I know, the chauffeur replied, but I couldn't connect with my friends here. Shake hands with them, Spider. Bob Marvin, Harry Steed. Glad to know you, gents, said Spider Jack, with a hand grip apiece. The chauffeur lowered his voice a little. I suppose we are alone here, eh, Spider? Yes. Well, then, you know what I've come for? That package. Marvin and Steed here are the ones that are in on it with me. Get it for me, will you, Spider? Sure, Mr. Johansen, Spider grinned. Sure, come on into the back room and make yourselves comfortable. I'll be maybe five minutes or so. 
Jimmie Dale's brain was whirling. What did it mean? He could not seem to understand. His mind seemed to refuse its functions. Travers, the chauffeur, alive. He drew in his breath sharply. That curtain in the corner? He must see this out now. They were coming. Quick, noiseless, he stole along the side of the wall, reached the corner, and slipped in behind the curtain as Spider Jack, striking a match, entered the room. Spider Jack lighted the gas, and, as the others followed behind him, waved them towards the chairs around the table. "'I'll just ask you gents not to leave the room,' he said meaningly over his shoulder as he stepped toward the rear door. "'It's kind of a fad of mine to keep some things even from my wife.' "'All right, Spider. I understand,' the chauffeur returned readily. Jimmy Dale's knife cut a tiny slit in the cretonne on a level with his eyes. The three men had seated themselves at the table and appeared to be listening intently. Spider Jack's footsteps echoed back as he crossed the rear room, sounded dull and muffled descending the stoop outside, and died away. "'I told you it wasn't in the house,' the man who'd been introduced as Steed laughed shortly. "'We wasted the hour we had here.' The third man spoke crisply, incisively to the chauffeur. "'Turn down that gas jet a little. You've got across with it so far, but you can't stand a searchlight, Clark.' And at the words, in a flash, the meaning of it, all of it, to the last detail that was spelling death, ruin, and disaster for her, the tocsin, for himself as well, burst upon Jimmy Dale. That voice! He would have known it, recognized it among a thousand. It was the masked man of the night before, the leader, the head of the crime club, and it was not Travers there at all. He remembered now too well that second room they had showed him in the crime club, its multitude of disguises, though in this case they had the dead man's clothes ready to their hands. The leaders boast that impersonation was but child's play to them, and now he understood why they had covered up the traces of their search in only so curiously inadequate a manner. They had failed to find the package, and, as a last resort, had adopted the ruse of impersonating Hilton Travers, the chauffeur, which made it necessary that when they called Spider Jack from his bed, as they had just done, that Spider Jack, at a casual glance, should notice nothing amiss. But it would be no more than a casual glance, for who should know better than they he would not have to go far for the package to any place that they had disturbed. And he, Jimmy Dale, could only stand here and watch them helpless, powerless to move. Three of them. A step out into the room was to invite certain death. It would not matter his death if he could gain anything for her, for the tocsin, by it. But what could he gain by dying? He clenched his hands until the nails bit into the flesh. Spider Jack re-entered the room, carrying what looked like a large bulky manila envelope, heavily sealed in his hand. He tossed it on the table. "'There you are, Travers,' he said. "'I wonder,' suggested the leader pleasantly, "'if, now that we're here, Travers, "'your friend would mind letting us have this room "'for a few minutes to ourselves to clean up the business?' "'Sure,' agreed Spider Jack cordially. "'You're welcome to it. "'I'll wait out here in the store until you say the word.' "'He went out, closing the door after him. "'The leader picked up the package. "'We'll take no chances with this,' he said grimly. It's been too close a call. After we've had a look at it, we'll put it out of harm's way on the spot, here while we've got it, before we leave. He ripped the package open, and disclosed perhaps a dozen official-looking documents, beside a miscellaneous number of others. He took up the first of the papers, glanced through it hurriedly, then tossed it to the pseudo chauffeur. Tear it up, and tear it up small, he ordered tersely. The next, after examining it, as he had the first, he tossed to the other man. Go ahead, curtly. Work fast. From the look of these, Travers had us cold. There's proof enough here of LaSalle's murder to send us all to the chair. He went on glancing through the documents, and then suddenly, joining the others in their work, began to rip and tear at the papers himself. A sort of cold horror had settled upon Jimmy Dale, and his forehead was clammy wet. 
the inhuman irony of it that he should stand there and watch impotent to prevent it the destruction of what he would have given his life to secure and then slowly a grim hard merciless smile came upon his lips he had recognized the leader's voice now he would recognize the leader's face at least that was left to him perhaps the master trump of all it would not be very hard to find the crime club now with that man to lead the way the scraps of paper tiny shreds mounted into a heap on the table and with the last of the contents of the package destroyed the leader stood up put these pieces in your pockets we don't want to leave them here he directed quietly and then let's get out in scarcely a moment the last scrap of paper had vanished the three men walked to the door passed through it and joined spider jack in the store and jimmie dale slipping out from behind the curtain gained the door of the rear room crept through it reached the stoop and then darting like the wind across the yard was over the fence in a second and in another was out of the alleyway and on the street he was in time in plenty of time they had just left spider jacks and were perhaps fifty yards or so ahead of him he slouched on behind them the cold grim smile on his lips once more it was the crime club now that hell's cradle where the devil's schemes were hatched that was the one thing left to him they would lead him to that and then and then it would be his turn to strike they turned the first corner and suddenly as the racing engine of an automobile caught his ear he broke into a run and dashed around the corner after them in time to see them jump into a car and the car speed off along the street he halted as though he were suddenly dazed started involuntarily to run forward stopped with a hollow laugh at the futility of it and stood still and motionless on the sidewalk and then he swayed a little and his face grew gray failure defeat ruin in that moment he knew them all to their bitterest dregs how could he go to her how could he face her and tell her that they were beaten that the last hope was gone that he had failed god he cried aloud and clenched his hands then deep in his consciousness a thought stirred and he swept a shaking hand across his eyes why had it come again that thought did it mean that he must play the last card there was a way there had always been a way the way the crime club took murder it was their own weapon if the man who posed as henry lasalle were killed if that man were killed the magpie was to be there at three he muttered and started mechanically back along the street end of part two chapter twelve from the adventures of jimmy dale by frank l packard read by lars rolander Part Two, Chapter Thirteen of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard. Reading by Roger Moline. Part Two The Woman in the Case. CHAPTER Thirteen, THE ONLY WAY It was a horrible thing, and it grew upon him. In a blind, mechanical way, his brain receptive to nothing else, Jimmy Dale walked on along the street. To kill a man. Death he had faced himself a hundred times, witnessed it a hundred times in its most violent forms, had seen murder done before his eyes, had been in straits where, to save his own life, it had seemed the one last desperate chance, and yet his hands were still clean. To kill a man in fair fight, in struggle, 
when the blood was hot, was terrible enough, a possibility that was always before him, the one thing from which he shrank, the one thing that, as the gray seal, he had always feared. But to kill a man deliberately, to creep upon his victim with hideous, cold-blooded premeditation, he shivered a little, and his hand shook as he drew it nervously across his eyes. But there was no other way. Again and again, insidiously grappling with his revulsion, with the horror that the impulse to murder inspired, came that other thought. There was no other way. If the man who posed as Henry LaSalle were dead, if he were dead, if he were dead, see now what would happen if that man were dead. How clear his brain was on that point. The whole plot would tumble like a house of cards about the heads of the crime club. The courts would require an auditing of the estate by a trustee of the court's own appointing, who would continue to administer it until the toxin's twenty-fifth birthday, or until there was tangible evidence of her death. But the toxin, automatically with her pseudo-uncle's death, could publicly appear again. Her death could no longer benefit the crime club, since it, the crime club, with the supposed uncle dead, could not profit through the false Henry LaSalle inheriting as next of kin. It was the weak link, the vulnerable point in the stupendous scheme of murder and crime with which these hell fiends had played for and won, so far, the stake of eleven millions. Not that they had overlooked or been blind to this. They were too clever, too cunning for that. It was only that they had planned to accomplish the toxin's death as they had her father's and uncle's, and establish the false Henry LaSalle in undisputed possession and ownership of the estate, and had failed in that up to the present. But the material results remained the same, so long as the toxin, to save her life, was forced to remain in hiding, so long as proof that would convict the crime club was not forthcoming, so long as that man lived. Time passed to which Jimmy Dale was oblivious. At times he walked slowly, scarcely moving. At times his pace was a nervous, hurried stride that was almost a run. And as he was oblivious to time, so was he oblivious to his surroundings, to the direction which he took. At times his forehead was damp with moisture that was not there from physical exertion. At times his face, deathly white, was full as of the vision of some shuddering, abhorrent sight. At times his lips were thinned into a straight line, and there was a glitter in the dark eyes that was not good to see, while his hands at his sides clenched until the skin, tight over the knuckles, was an ivory white. To kill a man. What other way was there? The proof that it had taken Hilton Travers years to obtain the proof on which the toxin's life depended, was destroyed utterly, irreparably. It could never be duplicated. Hilton Travers was dead. Murdered. Murder. That thought again. It was their own weapon. Murder. Would one kill a venomous reptile in whose fangs was death? What right had this man to life? whose life was forfeit even under the law, for murder. Was she to drag on an intolerable existence among the dregs and the scum of the underworld, she, in her refinement and her purity, to exist among the vile and dissolute, in daily, hourly peril of her life, because the weapons that these inhuman vultures had used to rob her, to destroy those she loved, to make of her life a hideous, joyless thing, should not be used against them? But to kill a man, to steal upon a man with cold intent in the blackness of the night and take his life, to be a murderer, to know the horror of blood forever upon one's hands, to rise cold-sweated in the night, fearful of the very shadows around one, to live with every detail of that fearsome act sweeping like some dread specter at unexpected moments upon the consciousness. He put up his hands before his face, as though to blot out the thought from him. 
Mind and soul recoiled before it. To kill a man. He walked on and on, until at last, conscious of a sense of fatigue, he stopped. He must have come a long way, been walking a long time. Where was he? He looked about him for a moment in a dazed way, and suddenly, with a low cry, shrank back. As though he had been drawn to it by some ghastly magnet, he found himself standing in front of the LaSalle mansion on Fifth Avenue. No, no, it was not for that he had come. To kill a man. It was only, only to get that money. Yes, he remembered now, that money from the safe, before the magpie got it. The magpie was to be there at three o'clock, and the toxin was to be there too. The toxin! That package! He had failed. It had been her one hope, and... and it was gone. What could he say to her? How could he tell her the miserable truth? But... but he had not come there in the dead of night to kill a man. These other things were what had... Jimmy! It was a quick-breathed whisper. A hand was on his arm. He turned, startled. It was the toxin, silver mag. Jimmy, in alarm, why are you standing here like this? You may be seen. Seen. Suppose he were seen. He shuddered a little. Yes, that's so, he said hoarsely. He glanced numbly up and down the wide, deserted, but well-lighted avenue. It was no place, that most aristocratic section of the city, for such as Silver Mag and Larry the Bat to be seen at that hour of night, or, rather, morning. And if anything happened inside that house... I... I didn't think of that, he said mechanically. Come across the street, under the stoop of that house there. She had his arm, and was half dragging him as she spoke. The alarm in her voice intensified. And then, a moment later, safe from observation... Jimmy, Jimmy, what is the matter? What has happened? What makes you act so strangely? Nothing, he said. I... Tell me, she insisted wildly. And then, with a violent effort, Jimmy Dale forced his mind back to the immediate present. He was only inspiring her with terror. And there was the magpie, and that money in the safe. Where is the magpie? he asked with quick apprehension. Am I late? Is he in there already? No, she said. He hasn't come yet. What time is it? he demanded anxiously. About half past two, she replied. But Jimmy... Wait, he broke in. Where is he now? You were both together. And you were both to be here at three. What are you doing here alone at half past two? A strange little exclamation, one almost of dismay, it seemed, escaped her. The magpie left my place an hour ago, to get his kit, I think, and I came here at once because that was what you and I understood I was to do, wasn't it? Jimmy, you frightened me. You are not yourself. Don't you remember the last word you said, as you nodded to me behind the magpie's back, that you would be here before us? There was no mistaking your meaning. If I could get away from him, I was to come here and meet you. Jimmy Dale passed his hand nervously across his eyes. Of course, he remembered now. What a frightful turmoil his brain had been in. Yes, of course, he tried to speak nonchalantly. I had forgotten for the moment. She caught his arm in a quick, tight hold shaking him in a terrified way. You forget a thing like that? Jimmy, something terrible has happened. Can't you see that I am nearly mad with anxiety? What is it? What is it? That package, Jimmy, is it the package? He did not answer. What could he say? It meant life, hope, joy, everything that the world held for her, and it was gone. Yes, it is the package, she whispered frantically. Quick, Jimmy, tell me, 
It, it was not there? You, you could not find it? It was there, he said, as though the words were literally forced from him. Then? Then what, Jimmy? The clutch on his arm was like a vice. They got it, he said. It was like a death sentence that he pronounced. It is destroyed. She did not speak or move save that her hands, as though nerveless and without strength, fell away from his arms and dropped to her sides. It was dark there under the stoop, though not so dark but that he could see her face. It was gray, gray as death, and there was misery and fear and a pitiful helplessness in it, and then she swayed a little, and he caught her in his arms. "'Gone!' she murmured in a dead, colorless way, and suddenly laughed out sharply, hysterically. "'Don't! For God's sake, don't do that!' he pleaded wildly. She looked at him then for a moment, in strange quiet, and lifted her hand and stroked his face in a numbed way. "'It, it would have been better, Jimmy, wouldn't it?' she said in the same monotonous voice. It would have been better if, if I had never found out anything, and they, they had done the same to me that they did to, to father. Marie, Marie. It was the first time he had ever spoken her name, and it was on his lips now in an agony of tenderness and appeal. Don't. You mustn't speak like that. I'm tired, she said. I... I can't fight any more. She did not cry. She lay there in his arms quite still, like a weary child. The minutes passed. When Jimmy Dale spoke again, it was irrelevantly, and his face was very white. Marie, describe the upper floor of that house over there for me. She roused herself with a start. The upper floor, she repeated slowly. Why, why do you ask that? Have you forgotten in turn, he said with a steady smile. That money in the safe, it's yours. We can at least save that out of the wreck. You only drew the basement plan and the first floor for the magpie. The more I know about the house, the better, of course, in case anything goes wrong. Now, see... Try and be brave, and tell me quickly, for I must get through before the magpie comes, and I have barely half an hour. No, Jimmy, no, she slipped out of his arms. Let it alone. I am afraid. Something, I, I have a feeling that something will happen. It is the only way, he said it involuntarily, more to himself than to her. Jimmy, let it alone, she said again. No, he said. I am going, so tell me quickly. Every minute that we wait is one that counts against us. She hesitated an instant, and then, speaking rapidly, made a verbal sketch of the upper portion of the house for him. It's a very large house, isn't it? He commented innocently, to pave the way for the question, above all others, that he had to ask. Which is your uncle's? I mean, that man's room. The first on the right, at the head of the landing, she answered. Only, Jimmy, don't, don't go. He drew her close to him again. Now, listen, he said quietly. When the magpie comes and finds I am not here, lead him to think that the money he gave me was too much for me, that I am probably in some den doped with drug, and hold him as long as you can on the pretext that there is always the possibility I may, after all, show up before he goes in there. You understand? And now about yourself. You must do exactly as I say. On no account allow yourself to be seen by anyone except the magpie. I would tell you to go now, only, unless it is vitally necessary, we cannot afford to arouse the magpie's suspicions. He'd have every crook in the underworld snarling at our heels. But you are not to wait, even for him, if you detect the slightest disturbance in that house before he comes. 
and equally, after he has gone in, whether I have come out or not, at the first indication of anything unusual, you are to get away at once. You understand, Marie? Yes, she said, but, but, Jimmy, you... Just one thing more, he smiled at her reassuringly. Did the magpie say anything about how he intended to get in? Yes, by the side away from the corner of the street, she said tremulously. You see, there's quite a space between the house and the one next door, and besides, the house next door is closed up. There's nobody there. The family has gone away for the summer. The library window there is low enough to reach from the ground. For a moment longer he held her close to him, as though he could not let her go, then bent and kissed her passionately. And in that moment all the emotions he had known as he had walked blindly from Spider Jack's that night surged again upon him, and that voice was whispering, 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 It is the only way. It is the only way. And then, not daring to trust his voice, he released her suddenly and stepped back out from under the stoop, and the next instant he was across the deserted avenue. Another, and he had slipped through the iron gates that opened on the street driveway, and in yet another he was crouched close up against the front door of the LaSalle mansion. It was a large house, a very large house, one of the few that, even amid the wealth and luxury of that quarter, boasted its own grounds, and those so restricted as scarcely to deserve the name. But it was set far enough back from the street to escape the radius of the street lamps, and so guarantee in its shadows security from observation. It was not the magpie's way, the front door. The obvious to the magpie and his ilk was a thing always to be shunned. Jimmy Dale's lips were set in a grim smile, as his fingers worked with lightning speed, now taking this instrument, and now that, from the leather pockets in the girdle beneath his shirt. The penitentiaries were full of magpies who shunned the obvious. Very slowly, very cautiously, the door opened. He listened breathlessly, tensely. The door closed again, behind him. He was inside now. Stillness. Blackness. Not a sound. A minute went by. Another. And then, as he stood there, strained, listening, the silence itself began. It seemed to palpitate and pound, 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 and be full of strange noises. It was a horrible thing to kill a man. End of Part 2, Chapter 13 Recording by Roger Moline Part 2, Chapter 14 of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard Reading by Roger Moline Part 2, The Woman in the Case Chapter 14, Out of the Darkness A moment later, Jimmy Dale stepped forward through the vestibule. He was quite calm now, a sort of cold, merciless precision in every movement succeeding the riot of turbulent emotions that had possessed him as he had entered the house. The half hour, the maximum length of time before the magpie would appear, as he had estimated it when out there under the stoop with the toxin, had dwindled now to perhaps twenty minutes, twenty-five at the outside. Twenty-five minutes! Twenty-five minutes was so little that for an instant, the temptation was strong upon him to sacrifice, rather than any of those precious minutes, the magpie instead. And then, in the darkness, as he stole noiselessly across the hall, he shook his head. It would be a cowardly, brutal thing to do. What chance would a man with a record like the magpie's stand if caught there? 
How easy it would be to shift the murder of the supposed Henry LaSalle to the magpie's shoulders. Jimmy Dale's lips closed firmly. Self-preservation was, perhaps, the first law, but he would save the magpie if he could. The magpie should have his chance. The man might be a criminal, might deserve punishment at the hands of the law, his liberty might be a menace to the community, but he was not a murderer, his life forfeit for a crime he had never committed. If he, Jimmy Dale, could only in some way have arranged with the toxin out there to keep the magpie away altogether. But it could not be done without arousing the magpie's suspicions, and as a corollary to that, afterward, with the subsequent events, would come the deluge. The law of the underworld was clear, concise, and admitting of no appeal on that point. To double-cross a pal meant sooner or later a knife thrust, a blackjack, or... But what difference did it make what form the execution of the sentence took? And, since then, that was out of the question. Since he could not keep the magpie away without practically risking his own life, the magpie at least must have his chance. Jimmy Dale was at the library door now, that, according to the plan, the toxin had drawn up for the magpie, and, as he had remembered her description when she had told him her story earlier in the evening, was just at the foot of the staircase. How dark it was! Though the stairs could be only a few feet away, he could not see them. And how intense the silence was again! Here, where he stood, the slightest stir from above must have reached him, but there was not a sound. His hand felt out for the doorknob, found it, turned it, and pushed the door open. He stepped inside the room and closed the door behind him. The safe, according to the toxin's plan again, was in that sort of alcove at the lower end of the library. Jimmy Dale's flashlight played inquisitively about the room. There was the window, the only one in the room, the window through which the magpie proposed to enter. There was the archway of the alcove, with its... No, there were no longer any portieres. And there was the safe. He could see it quite plainly from where he stood at the upper end of the room. The flashlight went out for the space of perhaps thirty seconds. Thirty seconds of absolute silence, absolute stillness. Then the round white ray of the light again, but glistening now on the nickel knobs and dial of the safe. And Jimmy Dale was on his knees before it. A low, scarcely breathed exclamation that seemed to mingle anxiety and hesitation escaped him. He, who knew the make of every safe in the country, knew this one for its true worth. Twenty-five minutes. Could he open it in that time, let alone with any time to spare? It was not like the one in Spider Jack's. It was the kind that the magpie, however clever he might be in his own way, would be forced to negotiate with soup, and with the attendant noise, double his chance of discovery and capture, and the responsibility for what might have happened upstairs. No, the magpie must have his chance. And besides, the money in the safe apart, why should not he, Jimmy Dale, have his own chance as well? All this would help. The motive, robbery, the perpetrator, there was grim mockery on his lips now as the light went out and the sensitive fingers closed on the knob of the dial, the perpetrator, the gray seal. It would afford excellent food for the violent editorial diatribes under which the police again would writhe in frenzy. Stillness again. Silence. Only a low, tense breathing. Only so faint that it could not be heard a foot away a curious scratching, as from time to time the supersensitive fingers fell away from the dial to rub upon the carpet, to increase even their sensitiveness by setting the nerves to throbbing through the skin surface at the tips. And then Jimmy Dale's head, ear pressed close against the safe to catch the tumbler's fall, was lifted, and the flashlight played again on the dial. Twenty-eight and a quarter left. How fast the time went, and how slowly. 
Still the black shape crouched there in the darkness against the safe. At times, in strange, ghostly flashes, the nickel dial with the ray upon it seemed to leap out and glisten through the surrounding blackness. At times, the quick intake of breath, as from great exertion. At times, faint, musical little clicks, as from abortive effort, the dial whirled, preparatory to a fresh attempt. And then, at last, a gasp of relief. Ah! Came the sound, barely audible, as of steel sliding in well-oiled grooves, the muffled thud of metal meeting metal, as the bolts shot back and the heavy door swung outward. Jimmy Dale stretched his cramped limbs and wiped the moisture from his face, then set to work again upon the inner door. This was an easier matter, far easier. Five minutes, perhaps a little more, went by, and then the inner door was open, and the flashlight's ray was flooding the interior of the safe. A queer little sound, half of astonishment, half of disappointment, issued from Jimmy Dale's lips. There was money here, a great deal of money, undoubtedly, but there was no such sum as he had somehow fantastically imagined from the magpie's evidently overcolored story that there would be. There was money, ten packages of banknotes neatly piled in the bottom compartment, but there was no half million of dollars. He picked up one of the packages hurriedly and drew in his breath. After all, there was a great deal. The notes were of hundred-dollar denomination, and on the bottom were two one-thousand-dollar bills. Calculated roughly, if each of the other nine packages contained a like amount, the total must exceed a hundred thousand. And now Jimmy Dale began to work with feverish haste. From the leather girdle inside his shirt came the thin metal insignia case, and a gray seal was stuck firmly on the dial knob of the safe. This done, he tucked away the packages of banknotes, some into his pockets and some inside his shirt, and then quickly ransacked the interior of the safe, flauntingly spilling the contents of drawers and pigeonholes out upon the floor. He stood up, and, leaving the safe door wide open, walked back across the room to the window, unfastened the catch, and opened the window an inch or two. The way was open now for the magpie. The magpie would have no need to make any noise in forcing an entrance. He would be able to see almost at a glance that he had been forestalled by the gray seal, and that as far as he was concerned, the game was up. The magpie had his chance. If the magpie did not take the hint and make his escape as noiselessly as he had entered, it was his own fault. He, Jimmy Dale, had given the magpie his chance. Jimmy Dale turned from the window and made his way out of the library to the foot of the stairs, leaving the library door open behind him. How long had he been? Was it more or less than the twenty-five minutes? He did not know. Only, as yet, the magpie had not come, and now, perhaps, it did not make so much difference. Where was he going now? His foot was on the first stair, and suddenly he drew it back the cold sweat bursting out on his forehead. Where was he going now? The first room on the right at the head of the landing. From his inner consciousness, as it were, the answer, in all the bald, naked horror that it implied, flashed upon him. The first room on the right. That man's room. God, how the darkness and the stillness began to palpitate again and suddenly seemed to shriek out at him over and over the one single, ghastly word, MURDER. It had been with him, that thought, all the time he had been working at the safe. But it had been there then only subconsciously, like some heavy, nameless dread, subjugated for the moment by the work he had had to do, which had demanded the centered attention of every faculty he possessed. But now the moment had come when there was only that before him. Only that, nothing else. Only that, 
the man upstairs in the first room to the right of the landing. Why did he hesitate? Why did he stand there while the priceless moments before daylight came were passing? The man was a murderer, a blotch on society, and his life already forfeited, he was living now only because the law had not found him out. The man was a criminal, blood-stained, and his life, because he had taken her father's life and had tried to take the toxin's own life, stood between her and every hope of happiness, robbing her, even literally, in a material sense, of everything that the world could hold for her. Why did he hesitate? It was that man's life or hers. It was the only way. He put his foot upon the bottom step again, paused still another instant, and then began stealthily to mount the stairs. The darkness! There had never been, it seemed, such darkness before. The stillness! He had never known silence so heavy, so full of strange premonitory pulsings. A silence that seemed so incongruously full of clamoring whispers in his ears. It must be those imagined whispers that were affecting his nerve, for now, as he gained the landing and slipped his automatic from his pocket, his hand was shaking with a queer, twitching motion. For an instant, fighting off his self-composure, he stood, striving to locate his surroundings through the darkness. The staircase was a circular one, making the landing nearly at the front of the house, and rearward from this, the toxin had said, a hallway ran down the center, with rooms on either side. The first room to the right, therefore, should be just at his hand. He reached out, feeling cautiously. There was nothing. He edged to the right. Still nothing. Edged a little farther, a sense of bewilderment growing upon him, and finally his fingers touched the wall. It was very strange. The hallway must be much wider than he had understood it to be from what she had said. He moved along now, straight ahead of him, his hand on the wall, feeling for the door, and with every step his bewilderment increased. Surely there must be some mistake. Perhaps he had misunderstood. He had come fully twice the distance that one would expect, and yet there was no door. Ah, what was that? His fingers closed on soft, heavy velvet hangings. These could hardly be in front of a door, and yet what else could it be? He drew the hangings warily apart and felt behind them. It was a window. But it was shuttered in some way, evidently, for he could not see out. Jimmy Dale stood motionless there for fully a minute. It seemed absurd, preposterous, the conviction that was being forced home upon him, that there were no rooms on the right-hand side of the corridor at all. But that was not like the toxin, accurate always in the most minute details. The room must be still farther along. He was tempted to use his flashlight, but that, as long as he could feel his way, was an unnecessary risk. A flashlight upstairs, where a sleeping room door might be ajar, or even wide open, where someone wakeful, that man himself perhaps, might see it, was quite another matter than a flashlight in the closed and deserted library below. He went on once more, still guiding himself by a light finger touch upon the wall, passed another portier similar to the first, and after that another, and finally stopped by bringing up abruptly against the end wall of the house. It was certainly very strange. There were no rooms on the right-hand side of the corridor. And here, hanging across the end wall, was another of those ubiquitous velvet portieres. He parted it, and, a little to his surprise, found a window that was not shuttered, but that instead was heavily barred by an ornamental grill work. He could see out, however, and found that he was looking directly out from the rear of the house. A lamp from the side street threw what was undoubtedly the garage into shadowy outline, 
and he made out below him a short stretch of yard between the garage and the house. He remembered that now. She had described all that to the magpie. There was no driveway between the front and the rear. The house being on the corner, the entrance to the garage was directly from the side street. Yes, she had described all that exactly as it was, but he dropped the portiere and faced around, carrying his hand in a nonplussed way to his eyes. But here, upstairs, within the house, it was not as she had said it was at all. What did it mean? She could not have blundered so egregiously as that, unless he caught his breath suddenly, unless she had done so intentionally. Was that it? Had she surmised, formed a suspicion of what was in his mind, of what he meant to do, and taken this means of defeating it? If so, well, it was too late for that now. There was one way, only one way. Whatever the cost, whatever it might mean for him, there was only one way out for her. His flashlight was in his hand now, and the round, white ray shot down the corridor, seemed suddenly to falter unsteadily, swept in through an open door that was almost beside him, and then, as though a nerveless hand held it, the ray dropped and played shakily in the toe of his boot before it went out. A stifled cry rose to his lips. Something cold, like a hand of ice, seemed to clutch at his heart. Those portieres, the wide, richly carpeted corridor. It was the corridor of the night before. That room at his side was the room where he had seen Hilton Travers, the chauffeur, dead, lashed in a chair. He felt the sweat beads burst out anew upon his forehead. It was the crime club. End of Part 2, Chapter 14 Reading by Roger Moline